at cspan.org. Next meeting of the House Rules Committee. They'll consider rules for debate on an intelligence reorganization bill scheduled for House floor consideration tomorrow. Committee, uh, may I bring the committee to order? Uh, the uh, Rules Committee will come to order. We're here for consideration of H.R. 10, the 9-11 Recommendations Implementation Act. And uh, we um, have 12 committees uh, from which we are scheduled to hear. And uh, I think Mr. McGovern would like to be recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to be recognized for a brief opening statement. Please uh, proceed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm disappointed with the way um, the House Republican leadership has handled this legislation. The Republican leadership has continually dragged its feet on necessary intelligence reforms. And now the Republican leadership is making the enactment of the 9-11 Commission's recommendations a partisan and closed process. The September 11th Commission worked diligently to produce a nonpartisan assessment of the problems and challenges facing this country before and after the September 11th attacks. The Commission published a report detailing their findings and making recommendations that the Congress should take to make this country safer from future terrorist attacks. Instead of embracing the creation of this commission, instead of working to make the commission's job easier, instead of immediately convening the House back into session to consider the commission's recommendation, the Republican leadership did the opposite and worked against the commission every step of the way. Now we are considering a 600-plus page bill that pretends to enact the Commission's recommendations into law. This bill was drafted in the back rooms of the Capitol by a small group of Republicans without the input of Democrats and in the face of opposition by the 9-11 Commission. This bill was uploaded on the Rules Committee website last night, and here we are holding a so-called emergency meeting less than 24 hours later. We haven't ha even had the time to digest the specifics of this bill. The American people haven't had time to learn what is and what is not included in this bill. Mr. Chairman, this is a, a lousy process. I believe we should take the necessary time to read this bill. Um, I think staff should have the time to go, uh, go through it all and thoughtfully consider it under a truly open rule. Uh, prepare to stay through this weekend, um, if that's what it takes, to consider the recommendations made by the 9-11 Commission and whether those recommendations are genuinely reflected in this bill or undermined by this bill. To act in any other way, in my opinion, is a disservice to, the, to this country and is detrimental to the future security of this nation. Mr. Chairman, I think the American people deserve better than this. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. McGovern. Let me just say that uh, by virtue of having the Rules Committee meet at this time, we are considering, as I said at the outset, uh, proposals that are being submitted from 12 different committees to this process. It's interesting that we had this continued call from members of the minority for us to proceed as expeditiously as possible. And uh, I believe that it did take literally uh, weeks and now months for people to digest the recommendations uh, that have come from the 9-11 Commission. I think that we would be doing a major disservice if somehow we just, without taking on our constitutional responsibility, made a determination that we were without any um, opportunity to look at it to um, all of a sudden accept on block the entire package that came forth from the 9-11 Commission. We're all very pleased with the hard work that emerged from, uh, that, that, that was shown by the members of the Commission and the work product that came forward. And uh, I think that the fact that last week uh, there were numerous committees which had an opportunity to hold markups with input from both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, in those uh, committees, and we're going to have a chance to hear now from the committee chairman, as well as an opportunity for any member of the House who chooses to offer an amendment to H.R. Uh, 10 to uh, offer that before the Rules Committee. And so let me uh, just say that we're looking forward to that. We're very happy to have the chairman of the um, International Relations Committee with us, Mr. Hyde, and I know that, uh, that we have uh, obviously a lot of people who with very busy schedules. Mr. Hyde was the first person in the room first member in the room, and uh, I'd like to uh, call on him to uh, proceed with his uh, 
testimony. Mr. Frost, yeah, you'd like to be recognized yes, for an opening statement. Well. Brief, brief opening statement. Good. Please uh, come forward, Mr. Hyde, and we'll uh, hear uh, Mr. Frost's opening statement, and then we'll look forward to your testimony. Mr. Frost. Mr. Chairman, let me state at the outset that I support the recommendations of the Bipartisan 9-11 Commission. I think the Commission brought forward some very intelligent, common-sense reforms to restructure our intelligence community, protect our homeland, and prevent another terrorist attack on America. And I think that many members on both sides of the aisle agree that the Commission's recommendation should be enacted, or if not enacted, at least very seriously considered by this House on the floor later this week. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, the bipartisan spirit of the Commission has not been reflected in this House this past week. The bill before the Committee today was crafted entirely by Republicans last month and revised entirely by Republicans over the weekend. Democrats did not even get a chance to read the final 600-page plus page bill until last night at 6 p.m. I have to say such a procedure is utterly wrong and quite contrary to the idea that every member of this body has taken an oath to protect and defend this country against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. One party does not have a lock on national security. If anything ever deserved to be considered an open, deliberative, and bipartisan matter, it is this issue. Now, the bill before us today only contains 11 of the reforms recommended by the 9-11 Commission. Shouldn't this House have the opportunity to debate the rest of the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission on the floor? The Senate has been considering the, those reforms in the Col <coughs> Collins-Lieberman bill for over a week now. They have considered hundreds of amendments and truly held an honest debate. We owe it to the victims and families of 9-11 and all those who work every day to keep America safe to hold a similarly honest debate in the House. I hope that the Rules Committee can repair this process now so that we can move forward in an open, deliberative, and bipartisan manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Frost. Let me just say that uh, our colleagues in the other body had a grand total of one committee that uh, emerged with a markup. And yes, they did have, uh, they've been in the midst of full consideration on the Senate floor. We had numerous committees that uh, did, in fact, uh, hold markups in this legislation. And that's what we're uh, looking forward to uh, hearing about from our colleagues who uh, lead those committees as well as other members on their committees. Are there any other members who'd like to offer opening statements before we hear from Chairman Hyde? Yes, I would, Mr. Oh, Chair. Mrs. Slaughter, happy to have you join us. Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to express my strong opposition to the way that H.R. 10, the so-called 9-11 Recommendations Implement Implementation Act, is being rammed through the House of Representatives. The 9-11 Commission, charged with investigating the tragic events of September 11, released a unanimous report in July that laid out 41 recommendations to make America safer. Today, the House Republican leadership, the same leadership who earlier fought against the creation of the Commission, the same leadership that tried to prematurely end the Commission's work, has presented us with a bill that is poorly sewn together that it claims will enact the Commission's recommendations. We've not been given adequate time to review this 600-plus page document. The analysis here at my hand has been prepared by the minority staff of the Select Committee on Homeland Security indicates that only 11 of the recommendations are acted upon in this bill. And I would like to submit this report for the record. Mr. Chairman, as we rush to get a rule for this bill, I would urge this committee to approve a rule that gives the House the opportunity to consider H.R. 5150 legislation that truly reflects the Commission's recommendations. The 9-11 Commission and the 9-11 families have endorsed H.R. 5150, the bipartisan Chase Maloney bill. Indeed, Lee Hamilton, the Vice Chairman of the 9-11 Commission, recently voiced his support for this measure, calling it the right vehicle for this legislation. And I am proud to be a co-sponsor of H.R. 5150 and strongly urge this committee to allow the full House the opportunity to consider this important bipartisan measure. While H.R. 10 seeks to enact 11 recommendations of the 9-11 recommendations, it completely ignores 16 of its recommendations and provides inadequate coverage for 14. I certainly hope the House leadership does not think the American people will be satisfied with this bill alone. It cannot be the last word on the 9-11 Commission recommendations. There are far too many glaring omissions. Among the most glaring exclusion is the Commission's recommendation that we prioritize efforts in Afghanistan. In three short days, the Afghan people will have their first election since the fall of the Taliban. Afghanistan is far from being out of the woods. The remnants of the Taliban, the uh, powerful regional warlords, and others are doing their best to destabilize this fragile new democracy. 
We're not finished there. We must not abandon Afghanistan. If we do so, we do it at our peril. Another glaring omission is the bill's failure to ensure adequate radio spectrum, something that my first responders tell me is essential for their preparedness response. Mr. Chairman, the process that the majority undertook to cobble together H.R. 10 is terribly flawed. As a senior member of the Select Committee on Homeland Security, I am appalled that our committee did not even hold a single hearing on this measure. I'm also appalled at the highly restrictive referral process that tied the hands of the committees of jurisdiction. 8R10, written in the Speaker's office without any real input from the House Democrats, and it fails to fully implement the 9-11 Commission's reforms. Even more absurd is that H.R. 10 adds extraneous provisions that are politically motivated, and instead of seeking a bipartisan approach to enhancing Homeland Security, the House leadership would prefer to force Democrats to cast politically vulnerable votes on issues such as denying immigrants certain court appeals and block a real debate on the Patriot Act. This is an election year sham that should embarrass us all. I received a phone call yesterday from a constituent who lost his brother-in-law in the 9-11 attacks. They couldn't understand why H.R. 10 was being considered, and I didn't have an answer for her. Mr. Chairman, the American people want and expect Congress to enact institutional reforms that will help to keep them safe. H.R. 10 is most definitely not that bill. Moreover, the inclusion of extraneous immigration and alien-related provisions dooms H.R. 10 to a Senate House conference. We can still act swiftly and decisively, making H.R. 5150 in order under the rule would almost certainly help us to avoid a conference and would bring about the reforms that the 9-11 Commission outlined again this week. The American people want action, not partisan bickering, and soon, Mr. Chairman, the American people will want answers from the Congress on why they supported such a defective piece of legislation. Mr. Chairman, I urge this committee to send a message to the House leadership. Stop playing election year politics. Listen to the 9-11 Commission and the families of the 9-11 victims. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Slaughter. I guess we'll put you in the undecided column uh, again uh, on this issue. Let me say that uh, the Rules Committee is meeting with the uh, very important goal of addressing a number of the concerns that you uh, raised and that uh, others have raised in their opening statements. Uh, we're all looking forward to the election uh, this Saturday in Afghanistan. It's going to be the first time ever that we've seen this kind of election take place in that country, and I believe that that's come about in large part because of the way we've successfully prosecuted the global war on terror. I believe that we uh, have much work ahead, and I don't believe that there's anyone that uh, has come to the conclusion that once we have uh, worked on the recommendation of the 9-11 Commission that we've completed uh, our effort here. This is going to be an ongoing struggle, and uh, the challenges that we face in this committee are to determine exactly what uh, proposal um, alternatives will be considered on the floor. That's the responsibility of this committee, and uh, we're going to do that. We're going to begin with testimony from the very distinguished chairman of the Committee on International Relations, our friend Mr. Hyde, and we're very happy to have you here, uh, Henry. You might want to turn your microphone on there so that the audience will be able to uh, enjoy your eloquence. I do much eloquence. better with the microphone on. Yeah, well, depends on your perspective. We think it's very important to have it on, and let me say that without objection, any prepared statement that you have will appear in the record in its entirety, and we uh, welcome your summary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just parenthetically, I would like to say on the subject of bipartisanship that the International Relations Committee worked very closely with the Democratic minority on our section of, of this bill. And I think I can say it's truly bipartisan. Uh, input was received and incorporated into the text uh, from the minority. Uh, so. We think it was valuable to have it in a bipartisan manner, and it is. I'd like to make several comments on the bill and urge the committee to make an order certain amendments which I think will make the bill a better product. In developing uh, our proposals included in the Title III and Title IV of the bill, we suggested certain provisions be included curb the growing fraud in bogus U.S. visas and passports, tighten U.S. law to pre prevent proliferation of weapons technologies worldwide, identify and halt the growth of terrorist sanctuaries, and reinvigorate U.S. diplomacy, particularly ongoing efforts 
to reach out to a broader worldwide population to explain and defend our foreign policy. That is to say, vastly improve public diplomacy. I've got two amendments that I would request the committee to make an order during floor consideration of H.R. 10. The first is a series of amendments that I would like considered and block. These contain language dealing with substantive provisions and a series of technical and conforming amendments that assist in integrating the language that was initially proposed in the base text. These amendments would have been included in the International Relations Committee's reported version of the bill had the committee conducted a markup. These amendments are supported by the ranking Democrat, Mr. Lantos. The second amendment, which I request the Rules Committee make an order, contains two amendments to be considered and blocked that will strike sections 307 and 3032 from the bill. These two provisions would, if enacted, violate United States obligations under two international agreements. I'm deeply concerned about the ramifications for our national security of enactment of these provisions. The credibility of the United States would be undermined in future negotiations with other nations concerning international agreements if these provisions become law. It would also undermine our strong position against the practice of torture, which among other things could put our men and women in uniform at risk. I leave it to the wisdom of the Rules Committee to craft a fair and equitable rule for the consideration of this important bill, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Should Thank you very much, Mr. Hyde. We appreciate the uh, hard work and, again, the bipartisan approach that you were able to pursue in the International Relations Committee. And uh, I, uh, I have no questions other than to extend congratulations. I'm very happy that a provision that I'd worked closely with Mr. Lantos on dealing with the uh, Department of State and the United Nations is uh, included in um, the measure itself. And I think it's going to be very positive as we look towards uh, challenges in the future. And again, that's a bipartisan amendment that I've been working on in legislation that Mr. Lantos and I had crafted, uh, emerging from a, a, a commission that I actually uh, co-chaired along with our former colleague Lee Hamilton on enhancing the U.S. leadership role in the United Nations. And uh, to have those provisions that Mr. Lantos and I offered included uh, in the measure, again, in a bipartisan way, I think uh, was very important. And I congratulate you for that. And, uh, appreciate the fact that in spite of the fact that my name was on it, you were able to continue to uh, include it in the uh, legislation itself. And uh, I have no uh, questions of you, Mr. Linder. No questions. Thank you. Mr. Frost. Um, there is one provision, and I'm not sure, Henry, you may have already talked about this, and this is uh, in a summary uh, that, that I've been given, and I assume the summary is accurate. Um, expedites removal of aliens. The bill directs immigration officers to order aliens removed from the U.S. without further hearing or review under some circumstances. Now, are these, uh, could this apply to legal residents, or are these only people who are in the country illegally? Well, let me say this, Mr. Frost, that provision is questionable in several people's minds, and it is being discussed as to whether or not an effort will be made to uh, remove that. Uh, that's very uh, controversial. And well, as I, written, does it only apply to people who are in the country illegally, or could it apply to some people who are in the country legally but are not yet citizens? Uh, I would. I, I don't know the answer to the that. The gentleman yield. Uh, it's my understanding that it applies only to people who are here in this country illegally. I would, thank th my I would think so. Uh, the reason that I ask that is that uh, some years ago, there was some legislation that uh, came out of the Judiciary Committee before you were chair, uh, which uh, provided for the uh, removal from the United States of people who had legal status uh, here, but who had committed uh, a relatively minor felony. And I want to make sure it wasn't that uh, we weren't going down that same path again. Oh, no, I, I'm sure not. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. diaz Villar. I uh, want to thank uh, Chairman Hyde for his hard work. And we are discussing, uh, have been, continued to, uh, some of these issues that are obviously uh, uh, very important. With a view to making certain that the bill uh, is improved, 
um, uh, and is um, one that we can all support. And so I, uh, uh, hopefully, and so I, I uh, thank uh, Chairman Hyde for his hard work. Uh, as always, he is a, a symbol of the best, not only in this Congress, but uh, of what a uh, statesman with a vocation of service uh, can accomplish and does on a constant basis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hyde, I tried very hard to get your amendment on the bill we had this morning on federal judiciary uh, put in order, but I couldn't make it. So I wanted to thank you for that amendment. And uh, a couple things I want to talk about that I, I think are pretty much omissions uh, on this 9-11 report. One is the prioritizing the efforts in Afghanistan. Uh, which we don't do much about in contrast to the McCain-Lieberman bill, uh, which authorizes an additional $2.8 billion for AFY 2005 uh, for specific security and development programs. Uh, also, the Defending America's Ideas Abroad, which we thought was pretty important uh, since we are trying to change hearts and minds. McCain-Lieberman authorizes $728 million for international broadcasting operations in the Islamic world and broadcasting capital improvements and expands existing and creates new scholarly and cultural exchange programs, scholarly programs, and things which were omitted from this bill. Uh, we to bolster the economic development in Arab and Muslim countries. Uh, GOP, this GOP bill has nothing really in there. McCain Lieberman authorizes $200 million for the Middle East Partnership Initiative to encourage development, lower trade barriers, and promote the rule of law in Arab and Muslim countries. Ensuring the humane treatment of captured terrorists. Uh, we have a sense of the Congress provision. The McCain-Lieberman bill requires the government to treat captured terrorists in the same manner that the U.S. would demand its personnel be treated if captured by the enemy in the war on terrorism. It also prohibits treating any prisoner inhumanely or in a manner inconsistent with the Constitution or other laws and treaties of the United States. It seems to me we could have gone at least that far. I, I don't know of anything in there that anyone could have found offensive. Uh, another very important one protecting individual privacy in the information sharing systems. We thought this was really critical. Surprised that uh, you have some privacy officers and some law enforcement, but you don't have a single entity in the federal government to coordinate all that. McCain Lieberman GOP bill makes little effort to protect the privacy of information on individuals. We think it's a, that's a key aspect of the 9 11 recommendation failed to be acted upon, creating a civil liberties board. You don't call for that. In contrast, McCain-Lieberman creates privacy and civil liberties oversight board to analyze and review actions of the executive branch to ensure that liberty concerns are considered when our country develops laws, regulations, and policies related to efforts to protect the nation against terrorism. An additional measure would include the creation of a commission on homeland security and privacy that can provide independent assessments on the performance of our government protecting the most critical parts of our homeland, our civil liberties, and our democracies, and that is a critical omission as far as I'm concerned and something that I think most Americans find very egregious. Radio spectrum for public safety, as I pointed out, you did almost nothing on that, uh, and also the ANSI standard for private sector preparedness. Um, that's, I think, really a serious omission. Uh, and uh, there are even more. There's most is at the access plans for critical infrastructure. Very little is done about that. Uh, and the, Cong the Senate is really just doing so much better on that. The Defense Department should have control over paramilitary operations. We failed to do that in this bill. Declassify the intelligence budget that's left out. Providing incentives for information sharing, which we have found, if we found out anything, from the 9-11 Commission, and even from that article, if you saw it, I'm sure you did Sunday in the New York Times, about the aluminum tubes, about the difference in intelligence at the CIA and the Energy Department, about which almost no one knew anything, uh, and the reform of the intelligence committees. There's nothing in there that, uh, that says we really have to, to do that. Um, this is less than even half a bill, Mr. Hyde, and I don't think up to your standards. I've known you for a long time, and you're a very thorough man, I know who cares very deeply about what you're doing here. And I hope that in a rush to get this done, you, you've really left out some critically important things here that I think American people expect us to do. And I don't really feel right about rushing this through here today. Well, in all seriousness, I'm delighted that you were able to go through 
the bill so comprehensively because uh, earlier I heard that uh, you didn't have time. That seems to me you've done a meticulous job. No, I, well, this is the report that uh, from the Democrat staff of the Homeland Security Committee, which I said I would like to put into the record, oh, and yeah. which recommends that we use the other bill uh, instead of this one uh, as a substitute for it, or at least to make that in order so that we can at least try to impro improve on it and broaden it. Um, because let me, let me make this again. Of the 41 recommendations that the 9-11 Commission gave us, 16 are not implemented at all. 14 are incomplete, and only 11 of 41 are implemented. Well, I repeat again that you have had a comprehensive review of the bill, obviously. And uh, on our side, we divided up the uh, <clears throat> burden of drafting this bill among the committees, and each committee has certain jurisdiction. Our committee, International Relations, was assigned to our jurisdiction, and that's what we are familiar with. I, I can't really cope with all of the litany of other um, uh, malfunctions that you have said, but each committee chairman will have an opportunity mm -hmm. to do that. However, I am extremely confident that when this bill reaches conference, the very best of the mccain uh, Lieberman bill will be extracted and incorporated uh, into the yeah. final product. I'm not sure I can share that conference. Well, I, I know you said that, that your committee acted in a bipartisan manner. Yes, uh, But I'm, I'm not hearing that that's the general rule, so I'm anxious to hear from other chairs and ranking members. But thank you, Mr. Hyatt. Thank, thank you. you. Very much. Uh, Mrs. Myrick. Uh, Mr. McGovern. Thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hyde, I, the acoustics were, were are not too good in this room, so I, I just want to make sure I was clear about your, your, your Second Amendment, because one of the things that I've been concerned about is uh, this issue of outsourcing torture, if you will. And the Republican bill, as it is now written, authorizes the outsourcing of torture to uh, such brutal dictatorships as Syria or Saudi Arabia or China. And it would make it official U.S. policy to send or return individuals to countries where they would be a grave risk of torture. And the provision in the bill now uh, violates U.S. law and policy. It is completely inconsistent with decades of efforts by Republican and Democratic administrations alike uh, to make America a world leader in the fight against torture and human rights. And so f far from implementing the 9-11 Commission's recommendations, it directly contradicts the Commission's <coughs> counsel that the United States should offer an example of moral leadership in the world committed to treat people humanely and abide by the rule of law. And does the amendment that, uh, that you mentioned, um, does it seek to, to adjust that and change that? Yes, there will be a, a major effort to uh, eliminate that aspect of the bill because the views that you have just expressed are shared by many uh, and on a bi in a bipartisan way. Uh, it, this will be one of the most controversial debates on the floor because I can assure you a good case can be made both ways. Uh, but I support the point of view you just articulated well, that I, we should not be directing well, people into situations well, I, where I, I, I agree and I, and I concur with um, your effort to try to change that. And, and Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, ask unanimous consent to insert in the record the American Bar Association statement on this. Uh, the October. October 1st, 2004, New York Times editorial uh, entitled not, not in America, and um, 11 human rights organizations, including Freedom House, Amnesty International, and Human Rights Watch have, uh, have weighed in on this, and I, I thank the gentleman. That will be a bipartisan effort, too, I might. Thank you. thank you very much for being here, Mr. Hyde. We appreciate uh, your hard work and uh, the effort that you put into this, again, pursuing a, in a bipartisan way, dealing with what is clearly one of the greatest challenges that we face in this Congress. Thank you, Henry. Next, we are uh, happy to welcome the distinguished chairman and the ranking minority member of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, our friend from Michigan, Mr. Hoekstra, and uh, my California colleague, Ms. Harmon. And uh, let me say I uh, believe this is the first time that uh, Mr. Hoekstra is as uh, chairman of the uh, Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, testified before the Rules Committee. Well, you've been here many times on uh, other matters. Uh, congratulations officially on uh, assuming the chairmanship of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. And we appreciate the uh, time and effort you put into this very important issue. And uh, 
You're a very lucky guy to be working with my California colleague, Ms. Harmon. She's very capable, and we're happy to welcome you here as well. Please proceed as you fee see fit, and of course, uh, without objection, any uh, prepared statement that you have will appear in the record in its entirety, and we'd welcome your summary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for those kind words, and I couldn't agree with you more that uh, it has been a, a real pleasure to work with Ms. Harmon over the last uh, six weeks as uh, we've tried to bring a spirit of bipartisanship to the, uh, the work of the committee uh, and to this bill. Uh, while we do not agree on all the aspects of H.R. 10 or the direction uh, where we need to go, it's been done with uh, a great deal of civility and uh, cooperation to get to the point that we are at today. Uh, last week, uh, in the, with the intent of moving the bill forward, uh, we had a bipartisan vote to, uh, to move the process forward and to, to get to the point that we are at today. Uh, you know, this is historic legislation. It's not only built on the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission, it is built on uh, the recommendations that uh, were made by the Joint uh, House-Senate joint, uh, joint Inquiry uh, that was completed about a year and a half ago. Uh, much of this H.R. Uh, 10, or, or Title I, uh, comes from uh, a bill that my uh, colleague introduced uh, last year uh, talking about intelligence community reform. Uh, so it really has been a good and solid effort. Let me just highlight uh, the parts of this bill that I think fall well within the framework that the 9-11 Commission uh, believed was essential. Uh, first and foremost, this legislation creates an empowered national intelligence director. This person is the head of the intelligence community, and he or, he or she is the principal advisor to the president on all intelligence matters. Second, H.R. 10 gives the, the NID enhanced management authorities to coordinate and manage all aspects of intelligence operations and improves the, uh, their authorities over and control of intelligence budgets. These new authorities are unprecedented and strike a careful balance between the equities of the NID and the heads of the departments that contain the elements of the intelligence community. Third, it, vis it vests in the NID the responsibility and authority to dramatically improve information sharing of intelligence across the government. This includes the ability to implement an integrated information technology network and establish uniform security standards that can break down stovepipes and promote the fullest information sharing where possible. Fourth, it makes the NID responsible for strengthening intelligence analysis across the community and for insurance, ensuring the sufficiency and quality of human intelligence and other intelligence capabilities and finally, it creates a National Counterterrorism Center in the Office of the National Intelligence Director. This center will be responsible for analyzing and integrating all intelligence pertaining to terrorism and counterterrorism. It will also be responsible for strategic planning and integration of all instruments of national power to, de to detect, deter, and disrupt terrorist activities. H.R. 10 is real reform of the intelligence community. It makes major changes that will improve the intelligence efforts and information sharing of the United States government. It's a good piece of legislation. Uh, we're disappointed that the, uh, the, the version that was put up uh, or that is now being presented by the Rules Committee uh, did not embrace uh, necessarily all of the, uh, the amendments that we uh, passed in our committee. Uh, we are currently working uh, with the minority, uh, with the leadership, uh, to see if perhaps those amendments uh, can be uh, redrafted in a way that will allow them to be considered either as part of a manager's amendment uh, or considered for, uh, for floor debate uh, uh, under the rule that, uh, that you will propose. But uh, we've, done, uh, we've done a lot of work in, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, this is a good piece of legislation, and I thank the... Um, it's possible. Uh, again, like I said, we are working through uh, uh, with the leadership, with the minority, uh, and some other committee chairmen, uh, whether there's a, we can find a common ground for the amendments uh, that were passed in our committee but are not part of the final product. Uh, if we can find a common ground and agreement, we would hope that they could be part of a manager's amendment, yes. Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you to the Rules Committee for uh, holding this hearing. Uh, I appear here with a heavy heart. Uh, this subject is one I have been passionate about for uh, most of my uh, almost uh, decade, most of my decade plus in Congress. Uh, it is one that I have written about, spoken about, served on the Bremer Commission on Terrorism, uh, been ranking member on this uh, committee for two years, but ranking on the Terrorism Subcommittee for two years previous to that. 
uh, uh, I and some others have put our hearts and souls into this issue, and here we are uh, with, a bipart with a totally partisan bill uh, before us that doesn't even reflect the effort that we made on a bipartisan basis in the uh, House Intelligence Committee markup last week. I, I appreciate the uh, comments of uh, Chairman Hoekstra. Uh, the winds of bipartisanship are beginning to blow again in the House Intelligence Committee, a committee that should be above partisanship. And I appreciate his personal efforts to keep the minority informed in our committee. But the truth is that last week, we marked up portions of H.R. 10. We agreed on three amendments uh, with, on, a, on a bipartisan basis, and all three of our ads are missing from the bill you are considering today. Not one word of the value we added is in this bill. And my conclusion from that experience is that bipartisanship doesn't matter uh, in the House's effort at this point uh, to move uh, intelligence reform. Uh, many of us on the committee prepared uh, a whole basket full of amendments that we think would make this bill a stronger product. We're not presenting them today. The reason we're not presenting them today is we feel that they will be treated just as we were treated in the end uh, after our bipartisan effort in committee last week. They will be ignored. So why bother? And that is something that is very hard for me to say. Why bother trying bipartisanship in this body? Let me just underscore what those three amendments were, because I think the Rules Committee needs to understand, and the public needs to understand what happened last week. Um, Chairman Huckstra uh, encouraged me to offer an amendment to add an independent civil liberties board uh, to H.R. 10. Uh, that is in the House version of the legislation. It has always been in the House version of the legislation, and it has been overwhelmingly approved on a bipartisan basis in the, in the Senate version. Uh, at any rate, he encouraged me to draft something that would fit within our jurisdiction. I did. He accepted it, and an independent Civil Liberties Board placeholder was added to our bill by a bipartisan vote of 16 to 3. There is no Civil Liberties Board in this H.R. 10 that this Rules Committee is, consider is considering. A second issue had to do with a provision that is not in the Senate version that would permit the President to uh, take the reorganization we carefully do to the Intelligence Committee, change it totally, and then just put it up for an up or down vote in the Congress. Uh, we thought that that would undermine totally our uh, uh, oversight and legislative capability in the Intelligence Committee. I, I think that's fairly obvious. And we struck that provision on a bipartisan vote. It's back. Uh, and then uh, a third provision had to do with strengthening the budgetary authorities of the National Intelligence Director. They need to be stronger. The Senate bill is stronger. Uh, that provision, again, was adopted on a strong bipartisan vote, and it's gone. So you get the drift. Uh, across the board, efforts to make this a stronger bill, to align it more closely with the Senate bill, came to absolutely zip. Uh, the task before us is urgent. The terrorists are plotting against us now. Uh, I believe that. I have always believed that. Uh, I don't think I should take a back seat to anybody in terms of believing how real the threat is. Uh, but I am dismayed that rather than deal with that, threat, rather than structure something that we have good experience to structure, we are playing partisan games yet again. Uh, and so my sad conclusion, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, I don't think it is uh, productive to offer these good amendments. I think what we should do is argue for abandoning this effort uh, of, of H.R. 10 and for making a much better product a battle-tested Senate product, the product that we deal with on the House floor, or at least a product that can, by this rule, be uh, an amendment in the nature of a substitute and then can be amended on the House floor. The Senate figured out from day one that being bipartisan was the way to go, and that is what they've done, both with respect to their legislation and with respect to their recommendations for reorganizing the Senate. The House Republican leadership, sadly, from day one, went the other way. And good bipartisan chairmen like uh, Mr. Huckstra, who really tried to start a different, on a different road in the House Intelligence Committee, 
uh, is in a position now where all of his work product that most of us uh, endorsed, at least as a way to move the process forward, has come to naught. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both. Um, Mr. diaz Bart. Chairman, no questions. I thank both of these leaders for their hard work on this critical issue. Mr. Frost. Uh, Ms. Harmon, uh, I appreciate your statement. Uh, do I understand uh, that you would support uh, a substitute that incorporates all the things that you're interested in? I think it, at this late date, Mr. Frost, our best bet would be to embrace the Senate bill, the Collins-Lieberman-McCain bill that is still pending on the Senate floor. I'm not exactly certain which, at which point we, 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 we make our cut and say this is the bill that, that works on the House floor, but uh, thinking about it uh, uh, practically, uh, if the, sen the Senate, which has invoked cloture, is able to pass a bill in the next couple of days, and if the House could consider a vehicle very close to that, and in the end, the vehicles could be aligned, we could avoid a conference and have a bill on the President's desk uh, when we recess uh, on Friday or Saturday. As a practical matter, the only way that could be considered would be if it were that piece of legislation were to be made in order by this committee as a substitute to the pending bill. That is what I'm suggesting. I think that will be formally recommended later. I'm not in a position to offer that, but, it's, but I am not offering amendments that uh, we have carefully developed over a long period of time because I think it's a pointless exercise and the right way to go is the way that several of you have suggested, which is to make the Senate vehicle in order uh, in, under this rule. Well, Ms. Harmon, what, would, what will happen if for some reason that substitute is not made in order or if it's made in order and it is rejected on the House floor and you have two different bills emerge from the House and the Senate? Uh, should we come back next week and try and reconcile those? What, what should we do? Well, it, I uh, align myself uh, with the comments of the 9-11 Commission, the 9-11 families, uh, uh, Senator Collins and I think Senator Lieberman, who think that we have to get this done before the election. As I said, the terrorists are plotting against us now. Uh, the election is not the timetable. The risk to America is the timetable. Uh, this isn't a Democratic or a Republican issue. It's an American issue, and we have the experience in this Congress to act. That's what's so infuriating. So my view would be, you bet. Uh, let's see what we can get on the House floor. Hopefully, uh, this Rules Committee, which puts America first, will put a good bill on the House floor or the opportunity to consider a good bill on the House floor as a substitute. We'll, we'll pass what we can pass. We should go to conference right away uh, and work hard to get the best bill we possibly can as a as a as a conference product, uh, you know, my my idea of aligning us with the Senate now would be a faster, I think, surer way to go. But I'm certainly prepared to do the hard work in conference. I'm prepared to do whatever it takes to pass a strong bill to implement the recommendations of the 9/11 Commission. And I think the best vehicle to start with is Collins uh, Lieberman, the Senate product. Well, I agree with you on that. Have you been given any indication that if the Senate and the House wind up passing different bills, that in fact we will go to conference and try and pass something prior to the election? Well, that would be my hope. Uh, I, I, the Republican leadership hasn't consulted me on, on their strategy. Well, I would ask Mr. Hoekstra uh, if he has Mr. any Hoekstra idea knows. if that would happen. Well, the, uh, the real intent, uh, because there are significant differences between uh, the Collins-Lieberman approach uh, as to how we create the NID, uh, how we create the NID and how they create the NID. And the intent would be to make a very, very serious effort to go to conference and resolve those differences and get the, get the bill done as quickly as possible and, if necessary, bring the members back here for a vote uh, sometime in October. So, yes, the intent is to, uh, which is a process we use on a pretty regular basis. Yeah, well, we're, we're in October now, of course, yeah. so sometime uh, but, later but, this month. But, you know, to, to, and the 9-11 the uh, Commission fully expected to take the recommendations that were made by them, mm -hmm. that the Senate would put their imprint on them, because they didn't give us legislation. They gave us direction, that the mm -hmm. Senate would put their imprint on it, the House would put our imprint on it, uh, and then as normally happens, we will go to conference and resolve the differences. Mm -hmm. Well, I would hope that you're both right that if, in fact, uh, we have different bills emerge from the two chambers, that there will be a serious effort to reach a conference agreement prior to the election. Yep. Yes. Mr. Frost, if I could just add one thing. Um, there is reason to be cynical, uh, sadly. Uh, mm -hmm. Being cynical is not my, my nature. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but uh, some have speculated that from the very beginning, uh, the leadership on, in this body didn't want a bill, and this is a strategy for a train wreck. And we may end up with a train wreck, notwithstanding enormous work on a bipartisan basis and an incredible, urgent need uh, for strong legislation. Okay. I thank both of you. Thank you. No, I don't have any questions, but I thank both of you for your commitment and your hard work and what you do every day. Ms. Slaughter? Yes, thank you. I, I do. Um, I, I have the strong sense that from Mr. Hyde's testimony as well as yours that the intentions are to try to write something in conference, that, uh, that these bills are uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure what he's doing. I'm perplexed that you left out all those things that I had mentioned a while ago that were so critically important to us, but managed to put in the thing that the individual serving as the director of CIA will become the national intelligence director. Uh, we had time for that, but we didn't have time for uh, all the other things that we really needed to follow the committee recommendations, I mean the 9-11 committee. Um, I would like to put on the record uh, something that's just brought to my attention from publication the Almanac of American Politics um, that the title Intel Panel Republicans Balk at Leadership's Heavy Hand. And I'd like to quote from uh, Congressman Ray LaHood and Randy Cunningham of California expressing outrage at the way the House measure was drafted in a rush and in secret. This is not a good bill, said LaHood. It is a cobbled together bill. This is not the right way to create public policy. Cunningham added, I think it is foolish to get it done. I believe that it is wrong. And then uh, Mr. Gibbons um, said that the hastily drafted leadership bill falls far short of creating real reform. This Congress appears to be uh, racing to make these reforms on an election year timetable. Mr. Hoekstra, when the people on your own side are complaining about the process by which this is done, I think it certainly adds weight to the Democrats' concern that this was not done very well. Uh, I, I understand the Senate bill has not yet been passed, so we can't obviously take it until that's, that's done. But this is far too critical. I mean, we've waited all this time to do something, three years. I mean, we, said, we point out all the time in the Homeland Security Committee, we don't yet have a threat assessment. I don't know what in the world Americans think we're doing here. But this is the last thing that we ought to be doing here. Can because I with there, yes, you may. But I just let me just make my point that I, I cannot tell you again. It's Ms. Harmon as I've spent a good deal of time on this in the Homeland Security Committee, share the concerns that all Americans have, and we're just we're just simply handing them a hoax. And I, I just I find it most objectionable. And you may certainly respond. Well, thank you very much. I think if you take a look at the um, at the recommendations that came out of the 9/11 Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, those recommendations that fall directly under the jurisdiction uh, of the Intelligence Committee uh, and the way that we have d decided to address that. There is a significant amount of common ground uh, between how we have addressed those issues and how the Collins-Lieberman uh, legislation has addressed it. But, Mr. Hoekstra, your committee people don't agree with you on that. that. You seem to be sort of in a minority there, believing that. Well, actually, it's not a minority. When we, when we had a vote as to whether we were going to move this process forward, mm -hmm. uh, it was a 17 to 2 vote. The other thing I would point out... But here are three more that, people who said that it was a bad but, piece but of work we also, on your side. The also, if you take a look again at the legislation that we proposed, it contains a significant amount of... It addresses the issues that were raised by the 9-11 Commission. It takes much of the legislative language uh, that was developed by Ms. Harmon in her bill that she introduced earlier this year. And I don't believe that it's fair to characterize the legislation that we developed where we, we plagiarized some of Ms. Harmon's language as saying it was hastily done in its poor language. Uh, directionally, we are going very much in a consistent way. And the, and the only significant thing that we did not address of the 9-11 Commission uh, was the recommendation to make the, the top-line budget number public. At a time when we are at war, uh, the, the leadership and the members of the committee decided that there, there is no interest at all uh, in giving terrorists and those who we are at war with any information about what we're doing or where we're going. Ms. Harmon, would yeah. you care to comment? Uh, yes, I, I, I would care to comment. Uh, as I mentioned earlier and as I said on the record, in committee, when I voted to report the bill as amended with the three amendments I described that are no longer in this base bill. 
I said that mine was a vote to move the process forward, but that the vehicle we were considering uh, had maybe the right topic heads, but was much too weak. Uh, I said that on the record in committee. I'll say it again. Uh, I believe the right product to be marking up on the House floor is the Senate product, which mm -hmm. closely aligns itself with the 9-11 Commission recommendations and does not contain the extraneous material that are in a variety of parts of uh, H.R. 10. In the conversation that Mr. McGovern just had with Mr. Hyde, he talked about one of those uh, uh, extraneous amendments, the deportation amendment, which uh, I agree with him, <coughs> violates the Commission on Torture and U.S. law, and I was pleased to hear that Mr. Hyde wants to get that out of the bill. But provisions like that were not in the 9-11 Commission recommendations, uh, and they are not in the Senate bill, and they should not be in the, the law that we pass. And just one further comment. I, again, I appreciate the comments about H.R. Uh, 4104. It did, it did set up the structure for a national intelligence director. But even 4104 is a lot stronger, a lot stronger than the House product. Uh -huh. You didn't specify who that was going to be either, did you? No, mm -hmm. and let me say that we did make an effort in committee to strike that provision. We uh -huh. feel it's not personal to Porter Goss. Not I said, at all. Porter I said Goss I would hope he would offer that amendment this committee if I were, yes. if I were the CIA director. Exactly. Uh, but the, N the National Intelligence Director do job is a different job a totally different job, and the Senate has a constitutional requirement to advise and consent, mm -hmm. and we should not be waiving that exactly. for anybody. Exactly. Well, unfortunately, when, when you vote to move the process on, it's very difficult for us to tell the difference in that or approval of the product. So that, uh, I think that's a little hard to, to deal with. But uh, I, I can't, uh, I can understand how you feel, but this is two committee chairs we've had who said it wasn't their fault, that it was really great in their committees. But I'm, I'm, I'm very anxious to hear who it was at fault here that uh, paid no attention to it. Um, and I, uh, I'm really sorry to see this happen here. It should not be happening. It should be a much, much stronger bill. And I agree with you that the Senate bill is, is the way we, we should be going, because I don't think we can do better over here. Thank you. The Senate bill has a significant number of extraneous issues that have been recently passed on the floor of the Senate as amendments, as, of, as we speak. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I would uh, just perhaps echo what you've already heard in this uh, room, and it's hard for me to know whether we're supposed to start or stop or keep go going forward or what we're supposed to do, but I think we ought to get the bill right when we do get it right. And I, that is no, that is no, uh, uh, opinion about what we've done, whether it's right or wrong, but I think that, that certainly having each one of the committees come through and give their testimony it will then offer not only members of this committee, but all of us an opportunity to make sure that we can then gather that evaluation. And I, I think doing it right the first time, whether it's the Senate bill or whether it's our House bill, is the most important thing. And so whether we get it done today or tomorrow, or next week, I think we ought to we ought to get it done, and we ought to get it done right. And so I will look forward to the rest of the testimony from all of the people who are uh, before us, and hope we can do that. I thank both of you. I would yield to the gentleman. The um, you know, Miss Slaughter, the um, just respond to uh, your comment. I mean, uh, I'm proud of the product that came out of the Intel Committee. It's I'm not saying it's not my fault. The Intel Committee had responsibility for the sections of the bill that that we reported. Uh, we did a good job on that. That is a, that is a product that uh, that we can be proud of and that we can move forward. I think it is uh, it is a very interesting process to hear that the that the House position on legislation that we should cede the House legislative process to saying we are going to take as our base product a bill that is in process in the U.S. Senate that over the last two and a half days I think has had something like 40 amendments uh, put on it and saying, well, we should just cede all of our knowledge, all of our background, all of the, the work that we've done over here and just say, somewhere in the Senate process we will pick a point of time and we'll say that's our base bill. That is, that is a... Uh, you know, that is an interesting way to see the, the prerogative uh, of the House. And, uh, you know, the uh, <laughs> one that I don't think either one of us are very, are very fond of. Well, I, I think it's a shame that we've come to this position, but we've all followed the Senate bill. I'm so proud of Senator Collins uh, and, and her knowledge of this issue and what she's standing up for. She's doing a great job over there. Uh, but I'm sorry to say, too, but I, I see some of the... Uh, 
the things that are happening here in this bill, and I don't see the great value in this one when that one greatly outweighs it and I'd really like falls the my time if I can, Chairman. Yeah. which the House said it would do. And I thank the gentleman for his comment. I, I think that this debate is very important and very good for us, but I think doing it right to where we all have a good sense of what we're doing uh, when we put it together is more important than doing it right is more important than just doing the bill. Mr. Sessions, and I will be an advocate for that, and I would yield to would the Would you gentleman. yield to me, too? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would just say to uh, uh, my chairman that uh, we didn't have to be here this way. We had every opportunity in the House to set up a bipartisan process on the front end uh, to empower a committee. I gather that our committee was designated the committee with lead jurisdiction over the intelligence portions of the bill. I'm proud of that. Uh, but if this had been set up differently and if there had been a uh, different kind of process set by the leadership, not set by you, Mr. Hookstra, <laughs> set by the leadership, uh, we would be in a different place today. I wanted to be here adding value to House-drawn legislation. I think I know a lot about this subject. I agree that Senator Collins and Senator Lieberman know a lot about it, too. But I think a lot of us know a lot about this. And we've spent years working on it. And we've been frozen out of this process by the House leadership. And the minority leadership has been frozen out of this process. And there's been Zippo conversation around here on House committee reform. Uh, there's been conversation in the Senate. They've made some good suggestions. We are nowhere because the House leadership chose to handle this in a partisan way, and I uh, hope that it won't choose going forward to continue to handle it in a, in a partisan way. This committee could weigh in and do what Mr. Sessions is suggesting, which I agree with, which is do it right. And do it right now would be my urging, uh, not because of, of me, but because the American people are at high risk. And we owe them better intelligence capabilities. We owe the president better intelligence capabilities. It's a point I made to uh, the chief of staff, uh, Andrew Card, the other day. Uh, the president should get any president better intelligence information. That will happen once we reorganize to change a 1947 business model, which is what we have now, Cold War centered, into a modern, uh, horizontally integrated, nimble and flexible model to meet the threats of the 21st century. That's what the good legislation is about. And sadly, the product we're dealing with here um, uh, is deficient, weak, partisan, has poison pills, and didn't need to be. Uh, Chairman, I yield back my time. Mr. McGovern. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I'm going to... Uh, kind of echo what uh, Ms. Harmon said, and, and I'm going to say something I, think, I don't think I've ever said in my life, and that is I, I agree with Mr. Sessions uh, on, on one point, and that is that we need to, to do this right. Um, and, this is, and we're not doing it right. Um, you know, a 600-page bill that just kind of comes before all of us um, and written by the leadership doesn't reflect all the good work that you've done in your committee and in the other committees. You know, it's patched together. I don't know what the logic or the rationale behind taking some things and not taking other things. Um, it's filled with lots of uh, extraneous uh, provisions. Mr. Linda mentioned that, well, there's some extraneous provisions in the, in the Senate bill, but there are 50 in the House bill, and they're big, and they're controversial. New authority allowing the President to completely undo the intelligence reforms mandated by Congress. Um, exceptions to the UN Convention Against Torture. Um, expands definition of agent of a foreign power for purposes of surveillance and search. I mean, there are all kinds of things in here that are that are that are, that are big uh, and controversial, and yet they're somehow they're all chucked into this thing. Uh, we need to do this right. Um, it's been over three years since September 11th. Um, the com the, the, we, we voted in a bipartisan way, although some people didn't want the 9/11 Commission, but we we voted for it. That was the right thing to do. And they came up with an excellent report. They presented it in a bipartisan way. They set an example for all of us to follow, and we're not following it. Um, some of us today have been visited by family uh, members of those of, of, peop of those who lost loved ones on September uh, 11th, pass uh, with, with letters saying that HR 10 falls far short of what the commission concluded is necessary for reforming our intelligence community and includes extraneous provisions. These are the families who lost loved ones on September 11th, and they're out lobbying against what, we're trying to, what you're trying to do here. Um, we, need to, we need to get this right. 
Um, and, th and these processes of, you know, small meetings with a, with a few select group um, somewhere in the Capitol and saying, take it or leave it, that's the way, that's the way it's going to go, is just wrong. Something is not better than nothing if that something is bad. We get one opportunity to do this right, and we need to do it right now. And this is the, this is the wrong way to do it. This process is lousy. Uh, and, um, and, and again, I, I know the hard work that you have done on the Intelligence Committee. I know the hard work that Mr. Lantos and Mrs. Mr. Hyde have done uh, on the International Relations Committee. But some of your best work is not here. Um, and so something's wrong. Um, and so I would hope that some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, who probably have a better communication link with their leadership than any of us do, would go back and tell them, you know, do it right. And this is not the process we should be following. Um, and everybody sees through it. I mean, the families of the 9-11 um, uh, victims are on the Hill today lobbying against this. The commissioners, if you read the newspapers today, are sp speaking with great concern over what our, this House bill tries to do. Um, so, so there's no reason why we can't get it right. But this process that is now, is now being laid out, uh, I guess because somebody thinks we need to you know, have something for the election. But I wish we do have something for the election, but I wish we had the right thing for the election so we could all go home and say we did something good and positive. Um, and this is not it. So I thank you for your testimony, and I hope we can figure out a better way to do this. Mr. Putnam? Thank you both. Appreciate your time. Mr. Hunter, welcome. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm glad that I'm able to, uh, uh, could, to come talk to you about this bill uh, following the remarks of uh, Ms. Harmon and, and, uh, and others uh, concerning the bill. On the Armed Services Committee, we took our time. Uh, we did this thing right. And we marked up the product, the base, that, uh, that Mr. Hoekstra and his committee marked up. And they put together, and we put together, an excellent bill. And let me just say to the gentlelady who says, well, the, the, uh, the product over in the Senate where they're taking amendments left and right, I think any member of this committee would be hard pressed to describe two of those 40 amendments that they've accepted carte blanche so far, uh, that somehow that is the uh, uh, paragon of order and, uh, and uh, precision is a, an absolute mistake. This bill that we're marking up uh, is an excellent bill. And let me tell you what it does. Uh, it balances the needs of our war fighters. That is men and women whose lives are on the line in Afghanistan and Iraq with the need for this national intelligence director uh, to have the power uh, to make the budgetary decisions that will give a coherence to the intelligence apparatus. Now, we took a long time to put our, our bill together, and, uh, and we, we marked this thing up for about six, seven hours. We had great discussion. Nobody was cut off from, from their analysis or discussion on this bill. And we did a very thorough job, and here's what we did. Uh, we balanced the, the budget uh, handling of the intelligence budget, which is primarily given to the National Intelligence Director. Uh, with the need of the warfighter, that is the Department of Defense personnel, people who wear the uniform of the United States, to be involved in what I would call the funding stream as this money moves down to the primary agencies that collect intelligence for warfighters and for the CIA. That's NSA, the National Signals Agency, which does signals, Geospatial, which does the pictures, and NRO, which does the satellites. Now, those are the agencies which operate today primarily for our warfighters in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other parts of the world. As this committee sits here, uh, there is a meeting going on with people in a room, uh, which uh, on a daily basis, uh, and maybe they've concluded for the day, but they're doing this on a regular basis, in which people from the Department of Defense, people who are concerned about those troops on the ground and their needs, and people from the CIA and other agencies sit at a table and they try to decide where we're going to send these limited resources that gather intelligence uh, on over the next 24, 48, 72 hour period. 
And you may have somebody at the table that says, I want to look at this particular situation in Africa. And yet you may have a, uh, uh, somebody representing uh, the armed forces that says, wait a minute, we've got a flare up in the Sunni Triangle. We need to look at this area here in Tikrit, or maybe up at Mosul, or maybe over in Kabul. So you have a discussion by members from both the CIA and the Department of Defense, and together they make a decision as to where our assets should look today and what intelligence they should derive. That's a partnership. Now, what we do in this bill is maintain that partnership, and I think we do it very effectively. And incidentally, uh, when we ask members of the commission, when they appeared before us, how do you like the way the Department of Defense people the war fighters are hooked up to the intelligence apparatus. They said, essentially, and I'm paraphrasing, we have no argument with the way they're working it. It's very effective. Now, uh, when we had the, uh, the commission leadership appear before us, uh, Lee Hamilton is a great member of our body and a, a very deliberative uh, person, uh, laid out the, uh, the substance of this bill. And when he talked about the need for the war fighter to use the tactical intelligence, that means the low-flying platforms, one of our members uh, stopped him. Uh, it was, I think it was Mr. Saxton, who's head of special operations. He said, wait a minute. Our warfighters aren't just hooked up to little UAVs flying above the ground. Our warfighters, right down to a special operations team on the ground, are hooked up to satellites in real time. And so they're hooked up to the strategic assets, to the big assets. And another member made the same point. And at that point, uh, Mr. Hamilton said, in light of what we've learned from the committee, Perhaps we need to refine our proposals. He used the term, refine our proposals. Now, the interesting thing about that was, at that point when he said, maybe we need to refine our proposals, there, there weren't many Democrat members there, because they'd already gone outside to hold a press conference, carte blanche endorsing every proposal that the panel had made on this hastily arranged uh, proposal uh, that the Democrat leader, Ms. Pelosi, had put together. Now, that proposal wasn't put together with months of uh, deliberation or thought. And yet, uh, here you had the committee itself, or the commission itself, acknowledging that they didn't have a full picture of how the warfighters are hooked up to the national systems. But while they're making that acknowledgement, we've already had a number of members who have gone off and committed themselves on a particular bill. Now, the families are very important. And let me just uh, uh, tell everyone here, I know a member of the family who also is a U.S. Marine, and his position is you don't serve the families of the victims well if you disserve the families of men and women who wear the uniform of the United States who right now have a lifeline, a life or death line between those national assets and their operations on the ground in a war that's going on right now today as we speak in Afghanistan and Iraq. So we maintain this balance. It's a very important balance to maintain. And let me tell you, I think Mr. Hoekstra and his committee did an excellent job. And the fact that in a very complicated area like this, you've got a couple of people who say, uh, we don't agree with this, or we think we're moving ahead too quickly. Uh, that's, uh, we all have different uh, judgment on these, in these areas. We all have different points of view. Uh, but I think if you ask any of those gentlemen which bill they're going to vote for, ours or the one in the Senate, I can tell you, uh, Mr. Cunningham's problem isn't that we're not going to go with the Collins bill. He thinks the Collins bill, the one in the Senate, is terrible. And the reason he thinks it's terrible is because he was a combat pilot, an ace in Vietnam. And he thinks that the Collins bill does cut that lifeline between the warfighter and those intelligence platforms that they depend on uh, so critically. So. My point is that we didn't take 40 amendments as they were thrown at us on the Senate floor. That's what the Senate's doing, apparently. We did this thing very deliberately. We let everybody have plenty of time to argue their positions, to look through it. We had a long markup, and I think we came up with an excellent product. Now, uh, let me just go to one other point, and that point goes to the leadership uh, of these intelligence agencies, NSA, NRO, Geospatial, uh, which, uh, which serve both partners. They serve the CIA and they serve the Department of Defense. And the director of each of those agencies is very important. Now, in the old days, or presently what we have, is a situation where the Secretary of Defense basically makes those nominations to the President. He submits those, the name of who he wants to have, say, as head of the NSA to the President. The DCI, who now will be the National Intelligence Director, has the ability to consult and, and, in theory, to concur on that nomination 
But in reality today, the SEC DEF can go over his head and make that nomination even against his wishes. Now, what the Collins bill does over in the Senate is it just flips that relationship around. It says now the DCI, or the National Intelligence Director, and it, as, as the top intelligence uh, official, they can make the, the nomination for the head of NSA. And if the Secretary of Defense says, I think that's a terrible choice, they can go over his head and go to the President with this recommendation. What we went for was what I call true concurrence, and that maintains this partnership. It says that both parties, both the National Intelligence Director uh, and the Secretary of Defense, have to concur on who the head of this very important agency should be. And if they, if they don't concur on the, who the head of this very important agency should be, uh, they've got a right to express their position, their opinion, communicate that to the President, because after all, he's going to make this case uh, in the end. Now, for all those people, uh, Collins' bill also opens up our top line to the world, as I understand it. So what, what did those people attacking the United States of America, what possible relationship does that have with our failure to show our intelligence numbers, which give them some information on what we're doing to the bad guys around the world to open that up so that they can see it? How would that have prevented 9-11? And I would just say, uh, for all those members who have said, we all know what the intelligence number is, so why are we hiding it? and then they throw out a number, all the numbers I've seen so far are wrong. So at least we fool those people as to what the number is. And if we fool them, maybe we can fool some terrorists at the same time. So I think the idea of exposing the intelligence number to the world and saying somehow the reason that we had a 9-11 was in part because we didn't expose our intelligence number uh, is simply not a valid concept. So Mr. Chairman, I think that the, this bill is an excellent bill. And you know it's interesting. Uh, we've got a lot of talent, Democrat and Republican, in this House. And we're able to move serious, important issues, uh, even in the fourth quarter of this football game that we call the American election. Uh, I've, got co I've got confidence in both Democrats and Republicans uh, in being able to move a serious issue. And we moved this bill uh, 59 to 0 out of the Armed Services Committee. And, I, and frankly, uh, I hope, I pray, uh, that it, in the end, ends up uh, being manifested in statute. Because I think that what is being done on the Senate side cuts that important lifeline uh, between the war fighters uh, and their assets. And that is a lifeline that is doing two things, keeping them alive and allowing them to pursue terrorists around the world. So I s strongly support this bill. And let me say, I strongly compliment uh, Mr. Hoekstra uh, and his committee, because I think they moved an excellent product. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Strong Mr. letter to follow. No Thank you very much. Mr. Frost. Now, Mr. Hunter, you'll, of course, you would have the opportunity to make these points eloquently on the floor, as you have to this committee. Uh, the, the, the question that I have really is a procedural question. Do you have any objection to the House having the opportunity to vote on the Collins bill as a substitute. You would be able to argue against it. Perhaps you would prevail on the floor, but would you object to this committee uh, for the making the Collins bill in order? And Ms. Collins, of course, is a Republican. She's a member of your party. Would you object to this House, this committee, making her bill in order as a substitute on the floor of this House? Um, depends what you've got uh, as an alternative to, or to offer up. Uh, uh, my, you know, my own perspective on I've just given you my perspective no, on the have... Collins bill. And we voted on the Collins bill in the committee. No, my, and my it, question and is, it was defeated. My question is, would no. you object to that being offered as I, an alternative on the floor? You could argue against it, and, and I, perhaps you would prevail. You know, uh, in the interest of good, uh, of I guess what you would call it, administrative good, good, good government, I would say yes, Mr. Frost. But let me tell you what one of my concerns Ye is. Yes, you would object, or yes, uh, no, it would th be okay. that I would that I would uh, not, not have an objection. So it'd be to okay it. for us to but, make that in order. But but let me just offer one thing I'm so concerned about: yeah. uh, the idea that some people, for political reasons, have have uh, uh, pushed the, these families to the fore, who know that they lost a loved one, for example, in 9/11, a very tragic thing and use them to somehow uh, push forward the idea that we should do something which has nothing to do with how those terrorists came to the United States and attacked America. Uh, and in, in, doing, uh, in doing this, uh, made it more difficult for troops in the field who also have families in the United States, some of which, incidentally, are the same families who lost people in 9-11. 
The idea that they would be used politically to make that happen is just a tragedy. As I said, I've, I've got a, a friend who's a Marine who lost his brother in 9-11. And his position is, does that mean that, that we're going to go off and, uh, and disserve the members of the U.S. military who need that lifeline? And, and let me just say this further. I've talked with a lot of folks in, in Iraq, been there three times, Afghanistan, as, as most members of the Armed Services Committee have. I've met almost no one, in fact, I've met no one in uniform from a private uh, through, uh, through the division commanders who agrees with the Collins bill and, and feels that it's going to help the way the military fights wars. Now, the people who, who deal with the terrorists at bayonet point is the military. We, we do lots of good uh, analysis and discussion here in the Capitol. Uh, we've got uh, lots of Americans who work uh, in the defense industry and do good things in the United States in this effort, and all Americans pull for us to win in this battle. But the people who cross bayonets with the bad guys are the people that wear the uniform of the United States. They carry out the real anti-terrorist policy. None of them agree with what you've heralded as being this great bill the Collins bill. And, and I think it's going to be a real tragedy if you have some member who goes up and puts his card in that machine and punches a yes on the Collins bill uh, because he feels that if he didn't, if he doesn't, he's going to have a bad editorial back home or he's going to have a rally because people will be told that somehow he has undone the 9-11 commission. I think that would be a tragedy. Mr. Hunter, uh, as I think you know, uh, my wife is in the military. Her boss was yeah. killed on 9-11. Point of impact to the plane at the Pentagon was her boss's office, and two members of her staff were at that meeting, were meeting with her boss and were killed. So I take this matter very seriously. Okay, I appreciate like, it. Like you, I have been to, to Iraq, and I've met with our troops. And I think that this House needs to work its will. And uh, con uh, conflicting views need to be expressed on the floor of the House. Then we'll vote, and we'll reach a conclusion. I would ask you what I asked the preceding witnesses. If, in fact, the House passes one version of the bill and the Senate passes a different version of the bill. Uh, well, there's got to be differences because these are massive bills. I understand. But assuming there are differences, um, do you believe that there is the opportunity for us to go to conference and resolve those differences prior to the election? Do you think that can happen? Yes. Yes. And you, and you uh, yeah, believe once we again, should do that? Once again, I think that uh, I think that we have the ability, even in these these very uh, these times that are necessarily political, uh, this last month or so before the election, I think we have the ability to to uh, in a very serious way address uh, critical national problems. This is one of them, and I think we can do it. You know? uh, Mr. Hunter, I would hope that uh, if this scenario plays out, so that, that the House and the Senate have different versions, that uh, we don't go home until we pass something, and that. Uh, we come back if we need to next week or the following week when a conference report mm -hmm. comes out and that we pass it. And I hope that you as a leader in this House will uh, insist that that be the case. Well, uh, let me just say, uh, uh, Mr. Frost, one thing that I've learned uh, uh, on the Armed Services uh, Committee is we're, we're doing our conference right now, as you know, yes. on the Defense Authorization, Authorization Bill. Bill. Uh, we're able to do that. The principals are able to work that thing. Uh, my son just came back from Iraq, and I uh, and I uh, flew out last uh, last Thursday to to uh, greet him. And I took with me the provisions of the conference, and I was able to do with faxes and telephone calls continue to work the communications on that conference. So I think if the principals of the conference um, are able to continue to work the conference, I don't think for symbolic purposes we need to have everybody simply waiting. Uh, and and their offices come back so they can say that they're then. there. But they obviously have to come back to make that vote. But I don't know if you have to keep them there while the principals of the conference are doing the conference work. Because mm -hmm. when you have a conference, as you know, uh, it involves uh, less than the full body of the House. So well, I would hope, again, that you would, uh, as a leader uh, on your side, that you would insist that the conferees meet and that you would, if, assuming we go to conference, sure. and that you would insist that there be something produced by that conference, if, it, if humanly possible, for us to come back and vote on prior to the election. Well, I think I, it's I that important to, a priority for the country. I, I, th I, thank, uh, I thank you for your uh, recommendation. I would just say to the gentleman, I feel so strongly uh, about the, the, uh, uh, the strength of this bill and the weakness of the Collins bill, the one that's, uh, that's in the Senate, with respect to what it's going to do to our people in Iraq and Afghanistan, 
to the people who are in danger right now. Uh, that if, if, it's a, if it's a choice uh, between cutting that lifeline uh, that we have right now, and incidentally, the, when the 9-11 Commission talked about this, I said, what do you think about the way we're operating now in Iraq and Afghanistan? And Mr. Hamilton and I believe Governor Kane said, well, we think they're doing a good job now. So my point is we have a good lockup right now. We have real-time communication. We have great intel flowing right down to companies, whether you're in Tikrit or Mosul or, or Afghanistan or wherever. If it came down to a choice between cutting that lifeline just so we could put a press release out and say we finished the bill or do it right, I'd rather not have the bill. So when you ask me, well, are you for whatever happens, no, my answer is no. I didn't say whatever. I said... Uh, and I'd hope you'd be with me on that, too, Mr. Brock. Insisting that the uh, conferees reach agreement, that they well, uh, work on this and they do make every effort to reach agreement so that we can vote on something. I, I, well, I agree with that, except uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And mm -hmm. if I think that the agreement deserves... Uh, America uh, and our fighting people. I would not expect uh, you to don't, support. Don't, don't expect me to happily trot it to the floor so that process can work. No, I would not expect you to support anything that you didn't believe in. Uh, okay. I think that to people of goodwill on both sides of the aisle ought to be able to resolve these issues and should insist that the, every effort be made to resolve them. Okay. Thank you. Well, but, well, I agree with that uh, as long as it's resolved in favor of the people who wear the uniform of the United States. Well, my, uh, my wife just came back from uh, visit to Iraq also, and uh, I am very concerned about the people um, who wear the uniform of the country. I had the opportunity to go to Baghdad, to Crit, and Fallujah, and I went to Fallujah oh. right before all the problems happened there, and uh, we need to do everything we can to make sure that our troops are protected. Uh, and you know, that's one thing that bothered me too. Uh, the commission made a great walkthrough of how these people came to the United States, how they, how they worked uh, into the positions uh, that pre-staged the attack and then went through the attack. They went through very effectively how, uh, you know, you had the, you had the guy that uh, went to the flight school and said he only had needed how to learn how to take off the plane, not land it. So they walked through that. They said one plus one equals, and then they reached over into Iraq and Afghanistan where our guys weren't making mistakes, and basically into the operational military and said one plus one equals, and reached over and said 10. And when we asked them uh, uh, whether or not they disagreed with the, with the way the group is operating, it's gonna be affected most fundamentally, that's the US military. No, they're, they're doing okay. They're doing a good job. The other impression that I got was that they didn't talk to many of those people before they made these recommendations. They talked a lot about this fumbling of the ball between the CIA and FBI. But what happened after Gulf One, as a gentleman probably knows, is that General Schwarzkopf came back from the Gulf and he was really mad at the intelligence community. He said, you guys did not help me. The CIA did not help me. National assets didn't help me. We at that point went to work in the 90s to hook up this lifeline between the national assets right up to the satellites and our soldiers on the ground, and we did a pretty good job of it. That's working well now. So the question for this body, and this is why the House has done the right thing, and Denny Hastert has done the right thing, and Peter Hoekstra has done the right thing, is they have listened to the people that wear the uniform and said, if you've got this lifeline hooked up and it's doing a good job, why are we even taking a chance with the Collins bill that you're going to cut it? I think that's a mistake. I know other people want to ask you questions, and so uh, I'll stop okay. at this point. But I, I commend the gentleman for his hard work, and I hope that he will uh, continue to work hard to uh, try and reach, reach a bipartisan agreement on this okay. subject. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Duncan, thank you for being here today. I find it interesting that we heard that the Intelligence Select Committee on Intelligence 17 to 2 vote. Yours was 59 to nothing agreement within the committees about a direction with which to go. That's what you're presenting today. You've been very articulate to say that. You've understood and made us to understand very clearly the, what those differences are. Is this a bad bill because people disagree because we ought to go look at the Senate version or what's causing this? No, this is a very good bill. And, and I think that there's, uh, I think there was once again, uh, uh, even as the commissioners who were stating that they might need to refine their proposals in light of what they were learning in terms of this hookup between our national assets and our and our war fighters uh, you had folks off uh, doing press conferences carte blanche endorsing 
these proposals that now uh, perhaps needed refinement. And so I think you had a, uh, I think we had a, a, at one point, a political rush to judgment. And I think the House bill has done exactly the right thing, and that is to talk to the people that wear the uniform whose lives are on the line and whose military effectiveness is going to be very much affected by the way we put this apparatus together and said, what do you think? And one thing I learned was there wasn't a lot of communication between the commission, which is an excellent commission, did a great job talking about the FBI and CIA and how they dropped the ball, but they didn't get a chance to talk to the war fighters and, uh, and talk to them about this link up that Schwarzkopf basically mandated uh, back in the early 1990s when he came back and really chastised the national community for not being well hooked up. So uh, uh, I think we have a good product. The Speaker of the House has done a great job here. And he's gotten all these disparate committees. I mean, we can argue with the Intel Committee on some issues for years, but he said you've got common ground and the only direction the Speaker of the House gave us was do what's right for our country. He didn't tell us to go any particular way or do anything that was going to be particularly uh, uh, good politically. In fact, it could be argued that the shorthand, the shorthand argument was was the one that uh, Ms. Pelosi took, which was just early on to just endorse everything that the commission said, even while the commission was saying, "Gee, maybe we need to change it a little bit." Uh, this may be tough politically, but but uh, I will tell you that that. Down deep, every one of those families in the 9-11 uh, tragedy also is concerned about the families of folks that have people over in Iraq and Afghanistan. And some of them are the same families. And so those are the people that need to be listened to because they're the people that fight the war. And they're the people that have to have immediate intelligence coming down from those platforms to tell them where to go and what to do. These platforms you were in reference to a minute ago about General Schwarzkopf, where he came back after the Persian Gulf War and talked about a frailty that existed. How is the relationship today between the CIA and DOD, or has DOD just established their own platforms? No, it's, it's a good relationship, and what happens is you've got a limited amount of platforms. Everybody has to use them, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, and it's a great question by the gentleman uh, uh, from Texas. The space-based radar is going to cost us, this country, 35 billion bucks. We can't have a 35 billion dollar platform for the Department of Defense and a 35 billion dollar platform for the CIA. We've got to have one. And they have to share it. So what happens in these sharing sessions is you will have meetings. And you will have, once again, people in a room. You'll have some from DOD, some from CIA. See, they'll each have requirements that they need to reach things that they need to look at on a worldwide basis. The CIA, for example, may say, we want to look at this part of Africa. There's some kind of an, uh, of an unrest going on right now. Something, we've got to see what's happening. There's, there's been a firefight down there. Uh, you may have somebody from the Department of Defense saying, wait a minute, we've got a, we've got a big fight in Sadr City, and we've got to make sure we keep our assets looking at that, or some part of Afghanistan. So you'll have competing requirements for the same platforms, for limited platforms. They work it out. The CIA and the DOD and the other agencies will talk this thing over, and each day they walk out of there with a set of priorities. Now, I've asked uh, people on both sides, well, how's it working? And they've said in these wars, in these theaters, it's working well. Now, maybe that's because we've got a war and everybody is pulling in a common direction. Uh, but it shows that, we've, that this lockup of intel and this use of intel that Schwarzkopf mandated in 91 uh, that we then uh, undertook to fix is working well. And so the idea you're going to cut, take a chance on cutting that lifeline uh, doesn't make a lot of sense to folks that wear the uniform. And you know, uh, we had our hearing, the last classified hearing in which we invited the entire House to come to it. Uh, about a week ago for uh, Secretary Rumsfeld and uh, General Myers and General Abizade, who is the war fighting commander for CENTCOM, for Central Command. We asked them if they had any comments on the intel reform. And they said, please be careful. We are very concerned. And they've seen, of course, they saw the Collins bill going forward. They were very concerned with having their seat at the table pulled away. Now, what happens if we build this space-based radar uh, and it doesn't have the aspects that DOD needs, maybe the aspects to be able to look at uh, a, an ICBM that's getting ready to uh, launch, for example? 
There are certain aspects you have to build into that program to do that. What if it doesn't have that? Well, then you've got two choices. You either don't have that capability and you've got to buy new equipment to do it in some other way, or you just live with a degraded capability. So the, the point is they've got to be partners. And that means DOD needs a seat at the table. And what we put in is a very good balancing of this seat at the table while preserving for the National Intelligence Director the overall strategy making and budget making prerogatives. He is the leader. Yet you still maintain a seat at the table for the guys that wear the uniform. So it's your testimony that the 9-11 Commission focused on what the problems were at the time 9-11 happened and they did see the weaknesses and they saw the problems of not only gathering of intelligence but making sure we respond appropriately and their recommendations were made on a snapshot that was perhaps three years old and that you're suggesting that the intelligence select committee on intelligence made a recommendation now three years later as a result of hard work a lot of working together to fix the problems that happened voted 17 to 2 and your committee those by and large same recommendations of taking the things that have evolved that are working best right now for the men and women who are fighting that war which is the most important thing that will protect this country and you voted 59 to nothing and you've brought forth both those recommendations and yet we're competing against a recommendation that looked at an old set of facts the the, the gentleman is a, a set of facts it was incomplete because the 9-11 commission didn't go out and interview hundreds of military people because that wasn't the focus. The focus was the fumbling of the football uh, in the United States between the CIA and FBI. And yet the impact of their decisions uh, is, is most profound with respect to people right now that are wearing the uniform. So if in attempting to fix one problem, we lift up a big toe and shoot it off, uh, we haven't done a service to the country. And you know, uh, I think, once again, uh, Lee Hamilton's a very fine uh, former member of Congress and did a great job on this commission, said, in light of what we've learned, I'm paraphrasing him, we think perhaps we need to refine our proposals. We the commission. And at the same time, you already had congressmen who had signed on carte blanche to endorse everything. They said over and over again, we expect you to work your will on this bill. This isn't etched in stone. And that's what we've done. I think we've done it responsibly. and. And we've given enormous power to this new National Intelligence Director, which is a good thing. And, we've, and we have flattened out those stovepipes so that uh, the agencies can talk to each other. And of course, the idea that, one, that a clearance for one agency has to be totally redone to if somebody, if a personnel go, uh, go to another agency, all those things which are bureaucratic uh, problems that are fixed in this bill needed to be fixed. So this is a big bill that encompasses a lot of areas and I think that the, uh, that the commission uh, would like and will like uh, the product that we've worked on here. The last question, perhaps you just were uh, engaging in that, were there recommendations from the 9-11 Commission that would be in the book that they published that you did agree with and that we oh, yeah. are now making changes for? And do you mind covering one or two of oh, those? Oh, yes. But I mean, uh, obviously making the National Intelligence, uh, the National Intelligence Director, the National Counterterrorism Center, uh, and having uh, the intelligence director not only be the put the budget together, but giving him a dominant, uh, the dominant position on the budget, developing that budget. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, on down the line that uh, uh, that are recommended. Uh, literally dozens of recommendations, right down to the idea that we Henry Hyde may have gone through some of these things in their in their section uh, where we're trying to learn. As he said, we're the we're the nation that can, that's got Walmart and all of these other great sales. Uh, arms and yet we have trouble selling America to places like the Middle East. So there, are, those are areas which are which are more uh, tangentially related to the 9/11 disaster, but nonetheless part of the solution. Many many recommendations made uh, by the commission, but most importantly, the development of the National Intelligence Director and his priority with respect to spreading intelligence. And the most importantly, distributing intelligence, because what you're really talking about is a distribution of intelligence across agencies, right? Distribution of information. And so the rules for distributing that information are key. You have, that's why you have classification regimen that say uh, you can only talk about stuff to this level, you can't talk about stuff to this level uh, if you're over in a certain agency. He's got to make those, put those rules together, and they're going to be pretty complex because 
you don't want to compromise uh, your sources and methods, right? And so you always have to make those balancing judgments as you're deciding who's going to get to know what. So he's going to be uh, dominant in that area, and he's going to he's going to lay down the laws for intelligence distribution, which is really the key to this whole thing. I thank the gentleman for his engagement, and thank you for your service. Ms. Lugger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hunter, I've got an awful lot of respect for you. We served together for a number of years. I know that probably your knowledge of the subject is unparalleled, and oh, you've always been a straight shooter, and you vote your conscience on so many things. But I'm really troubled by this bill. Um, I uh, First, let me say about the, the families of 9-11. Um, I don't think they're being used. And I have enormous respect that through their pain that they really found the courage to try to do something to make sure this doesn't happen to other families. I think that's what they're trying to say out there, and obviously they've taken a very personal interest in what we do here because we're the only avenue they've got to make a difference. Um, the 9-11 Commission, I think, made it pretty clear that there were intelligence failures, serious mm. ones, uh, which led probably to the problems at 9-11. In addition, uh, I'm sure you read the article in the front page of the New York Times on Sunday where uh, the aluminum tube controversy over whether aluminum tubes that were being bought by Iraq were suitable to be used in centrifuges for enrichment of I uranium. Didn't, I didn't read it, but I'm familiar with it. I the, want you to read that if you, if you would because it was very well researched, extremely well done. And what it said all the way throughout was that the intelligence people at the Energy Department we're trying to get through to the CIA and others that those tubes could not possibly be used in a centrifuge, and a lot of the information that they were working on about those tubes was false. Can I comment on that? You can. Well, let, me, let me comment on it. Uh, Ms. Slaughter, you received an invitation from me and every other member of the House received an information from me to come to intelligence briefings before we made the vote on using force in Iraq. Yes. And, and let me tell you what happened at that, at that briefing. You had agencies, uh, DIA and CIA, mm -hmm. who were there, and they told you, if you were at the briefing, that there was a dispute and a, and a difference of opinion between the agencies as to whether those tubes were uh, to be used for centrifuges or to be used for rocket bodies. Mm -hmm. And they, so, the, so the agency laid out their case, right? <laughs> but they also laid out and mentioned the other point of view that existed in the U.S. government, I thought they did a pretty good, a very balanced job of that because you had members, at that point you had the controversy in the paper over what the tubes were. That was one time when you actually, you know, one thing we've asked for is to have differences of opinion mm -hmm. so we know we're, it's not groupthink. You actually did have differences of opinion on that issue and it was briefed to every member of the House who was invited. And a lot of them came. I think we had well, over a majority of the House members at these briefings. I've been to a bunch of those, and it seemed to me almost every single one we had, even no matter how top secret it was, they wouldn't tell us anything. Well, they told us and that, though, that about I those... I would go back to my office and watch the very same people on C-SPAN they tell did, me everything they knew. But they did tell so you about those. The they point, did. They did uh, tell you about those aluminum tubes, well, and they gave both. They gave both sides on that one. Well, then it certainly looks as though the White House made a colossal mistake then on that. And I know the vice president did then go out and say he had irrefutable proof, uh, which was not the case at all. Uh, that what they were doing. Uh, but again, this shows that the intelligence in this country uh, is not up to what we deserve, and certainly not for people you're talking about in uniform. They deserve much better. Just yesterday, Ambassador Brenner said we went into that war not only on false information, but not enough troops. Now, to have him to be admitting this, I thought was really quite extraordinary. So, again, I know that we are very concerned about the Department of Defense and their intelligence, but they sure failed there somehow or other. What I'm trying to say to you is that this bill is critically important. And everybody in this country, the, the thing that people are most worried about is their safety, their personal safety. And I don't think we're coming close to giving them any confidence in this. And I think that's a tragedy because we're going to miss an opportunity here. Well, uh, uh, that, I would just, uh, I just say this. And I, or let me just clear this up. I am not holding this great brief for the Senate bill is that they, we should take that. At this point, I think that bill is much stronger and much better than any product we have here. Now, I heard you say to Mr. Frost that you will do everything you can in conference to rewrite the thing. Uh, and I hope that's the case. No, but. no, I, that's no. I I want to rewrite. If the Senate bill, you want to rewrite like their bill. A, no, I think that the bill that we produced is, is very thoughtful, very deliberate. It was not done in haste. 
uh, we had a full exchange of views on the important, on the critical issues in our committee, and in the end, we passed that thing 59 to 0, and I've got confidence that this body, Democrats and Republicans, even in this political year, and we're getting pretty close to the end of the fourth quarter here, uh, can do something that's in the national interest. I think we can do that. Oh, something will be done. I think what we're concerned about is whether or not it's the best thing that okay. can be done. And in terms of, in terms of the number of troops uh, in the Iraq operation, uh, we took those, the, the strong points of Saddam Hussein with remarkable speed and efficiency and with remarkable low number of casualties. Now, we were, uh, I remember being on the talk shows uh, during that, and it was interesting that you had a lot of the talking heads. They would be talking about how we were going to be bogged down, and even while they were talking about that, the talk show would be interrupted with a news flash that uh, the American forces had taken yet another strong point. It reminded me, you know, uh, General Patton's secretary works for me, or just retired this last month or two, and at one point, uh, General Patton was told by Omar Bradley's headquarters that he couldn't take a particular uh, strong point, and he radioed back, I've already taken it, do you want me to give it back? Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the successes in taking Iraq quickly uh, were unparalleled in many ways. We took it quickly, and but we've so, given and a lot so, back. And so, what's the gentlelady's point? I say we have taken it quickly, but we've given a lot back. Well, I, I don't agree with that. I think oh, that I think that I, I, I think the everything occupation. Everything that I understand from journalists on up and down, they can't leave their hotels. Vast parts of Iraq we can't even go into. It's basically well, off limits to us. Well, I'm they don't not know looking. How they're going to have an election in January? They don't know how they're going to give out ballots. I'm not looking at the journalists for military expertise. I would say that that the road not taken is the, the road not Conway? taken is always a very smooth road. I can't remember in the, the eyes that, in the uh, eyes of uh, of the people that didn't take it. Do you remember but the occupation? One, though, the, the one, you remember the general that was told to attack Fallujah that was told to come out, and he said, "You can't do that to me." Who just retired? I think his name was Conway, I believe. But we're we're hearing well, if if you're telling me that everything's doing well no, no, over just, there, just uh, just tell the general lady. Too far. I'm just I'm telling the lady, the general uh, lady, because she's she's paraphr she's not uh, she's not re representing what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, all occupations are tough, they're difficult, and they're costly. Occupations by there haven't been smooth, easy occupations. There are very few and far between, and. If we can neutralize Iraq, mm -hmm. Afghanistan, and Libya as future springboards for terrorism, mm -hmm. that will accrue to the benefit of future generations. But there's not going to be a surrender on the battleship Missouri by the terrorists. And that means that uh, the American people are going to need to have patience. And sometimes patience is something we don't have a lot of. Well, I think this war is going pretty badly, but we could have a difference of opinion well, on that. I uh, thank the gentleman. But, uh, but we all hope that, it, that, it, uh, that this uh, handoff uh, continues to work, and we all hope that the, uh, that the elections that are coming up work. And the key here, I'd say to my, my friend and all my friends here, is that uh, the key here, the U.S. exit strategy, is really the stand-up of the Iraqi military. We've got to put that weight on their shoulders. Nobody can guarantee freedom forever for anybody, not even the United States. And so they're going to have to accept that weight. We're standing up those troops right now. General Portraeus is training them. They're starting to move into some pretty uh, substantial military operations. If they can bear that weight and they can protect their own government, uh, then we're going to have a running chance at maintaining uh, freedom in Iraq. And that would be an important win for the United States if we do it. But since they didn't have anything to do with 9-11, there's, there's that question to be asked too. Thank you. Mr. Putnam. One question, Mr. Chairman. I welcome the distinguished chairman of Armed Services. And uh, Mr. Chairman, whenever we've put together any of these big bills, uh, TSA, Department of Homeland Security, there's a transaction cost. The, the confusion that comes from uh, the troops on the ground, the people in the, in the bureaucracy understanding what their new role and responsibility is, what is the transaction cost of this bill as it relates to morale, tasking, chain of command and, and, and those types of issues that are going to affect the day-to-day -day activities of intelligence collection? Here's, uh, here's the ball game, I think, uh, Mr. Putnam. <coughs> when that uh, special forces team leader needs to have real-time information on a target uh, in, uh, in that war theater and he gets the information on a continuing basis, uh, and just like after the day after this bill passes and the month after this bill passes and the year after this bill passes, just as he did before, 
then there won't be a critical transactional cost. If uh, we pass the Collins bill and we end up losing some of that sharpness and that responsiveness uh, and that efficiency, because you've got a guy now, uh, you've got uh, some, a bureaucracy 7,000 miles away which has interjected itself uh, into the operation of moving intelligence from platforms to the people using it, uh, then, then we will have we will have taken a transactional cost with the mo in, in terms of the most important currency this country has, which is its people. People wear the uniform. So that's why the House bill is a good bill, and that's why we should try to maintain it. Mr. McGovern. Thank you. Um, I, I don't really have any questions, but I, I just do have a, have a comment because I, I, and I think it's important to, uh, to state. Um, I think the 9-11 Commission did a great job. And I'm I do, you, too. Yeah. And, they, um, and we all learned a lot, quite frankly, stuff that, quite frankly, we should have been learning on our own without them prior to that. But they helped kind of bring all the issues together. They told us of the failure of imagination. They told us the failure of management, that we weren't putting the, pu the pieces of the puzzle together. And as a result, you know, we, we were caught unprepared uh, mm -hmm. on 9-11. Um, they told us the status quo is unacceptable. Whatever you want to say about where we should go, the status quo is unacceptable. And we might have to ruffle some feathers because it's hard to change. It is hard to change the way, it's hard to change old habits. But I just want to say. I agree that, with that, uh, Mr. McGovern. I, I, I just want to say, I mean, um, that the problems that some of us have with the bill that's before us, um, some of its process. Um, you know, I, I heard you praise Dennis Hastert for putting the troops first and doing all the right things. But you know what? Um, I think the process is lousy. Um, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. This should have been done in a bipartisan, truly bipartisan way in putting this bill together. You know, after 9-11, there, there was an example that was set in this House where Democrats and Republicans got together and talked about what we were going to do next, talked about the immediate steps that needed to be taken, because there were some things in the aftermath of that tragedy that were more important than partisanship and politics, and that was getting it right. And we seem to have kind of lost sight of all of that. You just heard the, uh, the distinguished chairman of the Intelligence Committee and the ranking member talk about all the great bipartisan work they did in their Intelligence Committee, only to say that all the good things aren't in this bill. So yeah, they worked in a bipartisan way, but their, the best of their product is not in this bill. No, I, th no, I think the best of it is in the bill. I think the well, head, they, they, well, they disagree with you. The mm -hmm. National Intelligence Director being formed is important. The National Counterterrorism Center and the balance between the military and the uh, CIA and the other agencies is, I think, is a central well, part. I, mean, I know that. that's what you think, but the the issue is that the chairman and the ranking I understand and the ranking me and me member of the Intelligence Committee, you know, had, had some concerns mm -hmm. about the fact that what they thought was some of the best recommendations out of their committee okay. are not here. Uh, furthermore, but, but from our perspective on armed services, no. uh, I think we did an excellent job, and I like see I like the intelligence bill. I think that the uh, that Mr. Hoekstra uh, did a tremendous job, and with his and his uh, and his committee, I liked what they what they uh, put together. Well, well, furthermore, if we had done this in a truly bipartisan way, there would not be all these extraneous and controversial additions, which the commissioners of of the 9/11 Commission are now saying maybe po poison pills. Your members of your own party are being uh, quoted in the newspaper as saying that I have concerns that some on my side of the aisle want there to be poison pills. Um, you know, there's a right way to do this and a wrong way to do it. And, you know, you can be brag about the part of, uh, of this bill that you think uh, you like, but I'm going to tell you, overall, getting, uh, for, for the average member of this, of this House, getting a 600-page bill um, dropped on them only a matter of a few hours ago um, and trying to reconcile the differences with your bill and the, uh, and, and the recommendations in, this, in the Senate bill of the 9-11 Commission uh, and to do this right um, I think is, uh, you know, I think is not, not, the good, not, the, not, the, not the best of process. The final thing. Well, but what would you do, family. Mr. McGovern, if you've, got, well, if you've got some people saying you've got to finish this before you go home so you have, you, a know very, you have a very I'm short a, period of time. Then you've you got what, other people saying you we you've done. got to take your own in, sweet in, time. Instead of spending the last few weeks debating court-stripping bills and constitutional amendments, this might have been a more uh, but urgent we've been, priority. But we've been working on this. But, uh, uh, my and, committee has been working one, on it. And one final thing, and that is um, you made a comment about the families that yeah. are going around here. Um, 
talking to members. Let me tell you, the families of these victims know more about what is going on than probably most members of Congress. They've been to every hearing. They have read every single article. They've been to everything. You know, and what they are doing is, is doing what they can do to make sure this never, ever happens again so that no other family and, and what has I'm to go saying through is, what they're going through. And what I'm saying is, is some of the families, one of the families that I know, who lost members in 9-11 say that we're, it, it's not a service to the families that lost members in 9-11 if you disserve the families who have people wearing the uniform of the United States in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, no, I think and, that's and no, true. Well, and, 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 I, and incidentally, I think the family members who that. listen to our markup, I would think that if you lay out if you had, you know, people that have probably the most credibility in this country of any profession are probably people wearing the uniform. If you had all the captains and sergeants and majors and enlisted guys who are serving in Iraq and Afghanistan and let them talk to the 9-11 families for five or six hours about how they use well, intelligence, right. I think the families of the, uh, the uh, would agree with them. So, to be honest, so I, think, I don't I think, think we're on a I separate think, path well, here. Yeah, I, I get the impression that you were... Um, making a distinction. I just will say one final thing, too, and that is if we if we want to serve our men and women who are serving with such distinction overseas, we owe it to them to get better intelligence. We owe it to them um, to, I agree. Not, to not justify a war and go to war like we did in Iraq and find out afterwards that all the all the justification that was presented to all of us here in Congress was wrong. Well, well, here's what I would say to that, uh, Mr. McGovern. I just, I just picked up uh, the Military Times, which did a, uh, uh, did a poll. It's, it's their big project for the last three or four months, is to poll thousands of members of the military and say, in light of everything that's happened, this is a ton of, of Iraq uh, veterans and people on active duty and people in the guard. Uh, do you feel that you were misled, or are you, are you mad at the president? The, the numbers were that 71 percent of them support President Bush, and as I recall, and I'm giving this number off the top of my head, 28 percent of them support Senator Kerry. So the idea that they feel that they've been disserved oh. has not been borne out by that poll, and it's an extremely extensive uh, poll. It was well, on it. Well, it took like four or five pages, and, and the Military Times uh, went through it in great detail. So three quarters of our military people that wear the uniform don't feel that they were disturbed. Let me, let, or let me tell you, I talked to a lot of men and women who have come back, um, who quite frankly feel the opposite. Who, well, who, who, who these can't people have come back. Can't understand why we, the politicians, got it so wrong. And well, you know, and they have a good point. Mr. McGovern, I, I disagree with you. the reason why we're doing this is so I, I disagree we'll get with it you. Right I, in the future, I disagree with you, and I will be happy to share that poll with you. I was surprised at the number personally. Uh, but I'm going to bring out uh, copies of it here, and I'll give you a copy. And, and it is somewhat surprising that, that the, even the people that went over there and obviously undertook a lot of hardship, that 71 percent of them say they support the guy that sent them, but look, we, we, uh, we not got the it, guy we, that we, said we, he wouldn't have we, sent look, them. You know, we got it wrong. We've we got to get it right in the future, and that's what this is all about. So it's not about covering somebody's political behind. Well, it's well, about getting it right. No, but and your implication was, was uh, that people yeah. feel that they've well, that they've been disturbed. I think a lot, of, pe a lot, of, a lot of people feel a lot, a lot of people are asking the question, why? Why were you so wrong? And, and I think that's a legitimate the, and question. And the answer is that the uh, that at least from these from the from the perspective of our uniform personnel, is that they think that getting rid of Saddam Hussein was of great value to the United States. You see, they feel that their service is of value, you know what? that they in weren't the future, wasted. It, it, might, it, it, may, it may have served the president better to get up and say, I don't like Saddam Hussein, I want to get rid of him. That would have been well, honest, and that, would have, uh, and, 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 and that would have been more truthful. I wouldn't have supported him well, just on that, but the bottom line is that's different from what he said and what, and what this Congress said and why they justify going to war. Well, very again, again uh, I just, just remind the gentleman, I held three hearings on this in which I invited every one of you, and you also, to come in and listen yourself, with no president there to editorialize, on what the facts were from the intelligence agencies and question them. Question them on the aluminum tubes, which some members did. Question them on other things. And you did that before the vote, and that's the reason I had the well. hearings before the vote. Well, so you could make a uh, an educated uh, uh, vote on this and on I this did, vote. And you I sports. voted no. Okay, I appreciate the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Gentlemen, from Texas. Mr. Hunter, through, and then Mr. Hunter, through, thank you okay. very much. Okay, I want to thank the committee and uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, if I could insert uh, in the record the statement of the Honorable Henry Waxman. Uh, Without objection. 
Mr. Cox. Hand that to her. Welcome. If you have prepared comments, they'll be part of the record, and we'd welcome a summary. Well, thank you, Chairman Linder, Ranking Member Frost, and other members of this committee uh, who serve on the Homeland Security uh, Committee. Mr. Turner, you may join. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris. Good timing. I appreciate this opportunity uh, to testify on the 9-11 Commission Recommendations Act. I'm co-sponsoring this legislation as chairman of the Select Committee on Homeland Security because I believe it represents a significant step forward in our ongoing battle to protect our nation from terrorist attack. Almost every committee of the House has worked professionally to craft what is truly a comprehensive response to the 9-11 Commission report. The Homeland Security Committee, for its part, has been working on these issues exclusively for two years. <coughs> We've included in this bill legislation approved by our committee on a bipartisan basis, and I would add uh, on a unanimous uh, bipartisan basis. Uh, there are four pieces of the 9-11 legislation uh, that I uh, commend to your attention at this point uh, that are the product of the Homeland Security Committee. Uh, the first, uh, was uh, reported by our committee as H.R. 3266. Uh, its popular title is the Faster and Smarter Funding for First Responders Act. It satisfies each and every one of the 9-11 Commission's recommendations on the subject of the delivery of federal homeland security assistance to state and local governments. Of all of the proposals to reform federal terrorism preparedness, H.R. 10 best exemplifies the spirit and intent of the recommendations posited by the 9-11 Commission in this area. Specifically, in its report, the 9-11 Commission recommends that homeland security assistance should be based strictly on an assessment of risks and vulnerabilities. H.R. 10 requires DHS to allocate and prioritize homeland security assistance funds to states or regions based upon the degree to which they would lessen the threat to, the vulnerability of, and consequences for persons and critical infrastructure. According to the 9-11 Commission, any assessment of risk should consider such factors as population, population density, vulnerability, and the presence of critical infrastructure within each state. The 9-11 bill does precisely that by requiring DHS in its risk assessment to consider numerous factors including types of threat, for example, nuclear, biological, radiological, and so forth, uh, types of critical infrastructure sectors such as agriculture, food, energy, transportation, water, and so on, and population including transient and tourist population, geography and size, and other specific vulnerabilities and consequences. According to the 9-11 Commission, a panel of security experts should be convened to develop written benchmarks for evaluating community needs. The 9-11 bill requires the Secretary of DHS to establish specific, flexible, measurable, and comprehensive essential capabilities for state and local government terrorism preparedness. The 9-11 bill directs the Secretary to establish a 25-member advisory body composed of a geographic and substantive cross-section of first responder disciplines from the state and local level for the purpose of assisting in the development of these essential capabilities. The 9-11 Commission recommends that, quote, the federal government should require each state receiving federal emergency preparedness funds to provide an analysis based on the same criteria to justify the distribution of funds in that state. The 9-11 bill requires states to develop a comprehensive homeland security plan directed towards achievement of these essential capabilities and terrorism benchmarks to prioritize their additional needs according to threat, vulnerability, and consequence factors and to allocate DHS grant funding within their states accordingly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this committee uh, comprising 50 people on which you serve, on which uh, several members of this committee serve, uh, as you know, conducted uh, over 50 hearings uh, around the country focused on why first responder funding wasn't getting to the front lines in time. As we meet here in October 2004, we know that over two-thirds 
of the funding that this Congress made available and the Department of Homeland Security granted last year still isn't spent. In fact, only 29 percent of that money has been spent from last year. Uh, the same is true for the current year and for the year preceding. Two years ago, there are enormous amounts of money, the preponderant portion of it, that haven't gotten through the administrative pipeline. This legislation that's included in the 9-11 bill is called the Faster and Smarter Funding for First Responders Act because a big piece of the problem is getting the money there in a timely way. Uh, this bottleneck uh, we discovered in our hearings is due to uh, several factors. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we don't have clear terrorism preparedness goals established at the time that we allocate the funds. Second, the planning for spending the funds is at the back end rather than the front end of the process. And third, there are not firm requirements in law for the distribution of the money. The version of H.R. 3266 that's incorporated into H.R. 10 represents the work and agreement of five committees of jurisdiction on how to solve this problem, uh, and it includes uh, satisfaction on every single one of these three criteria. This final product is truly a bipartisan and consensus product, one that Mr. Turner uh, and the Democrats on this committee, as well as I and the Republicans on this committee, worked very, very hard on for a number of years. Uh, given the careful balancing of interests represented in the text before you, I would strongly urge this committee to protect Subtitle A of Title V from any further amendments as we proceed to the House floor. Another area highlighted by the 9-11 Commission is the need to strengthen interoperable communications for our first responders. This is an area that the Select Committee has carefully worked on for some time now, and working with the Energy and Commerce Committee, we proposed several legislative suggestions to help speed progress, which are contained in Section 5131 of H.R. 10. With respect to mutual aid agreements among first responders, the Commission emphasized, the 9-11 Commission emphasized, the need for Congress to address the long-standing liability and indemnification impediments that have prevented greater progress. It's been difficult for first responders to cross state lines uh, to provide mutual aid in times of terrorist emergency response uh, because of the liability concerns, and we've identified these further through the top-off exercises in Chicago and in Seattle. I'm pleased that, that the Select Committee was able to collaborate with the Judiciary Committee in crafting Sections 5101 through 5105, which will ensure that first responders who cross jurisdictional lines in support of their neighbors during emergencies will only face liability under the laws of their own states, their home jurisdiction. The Select Committee also drafted several sections of the 9-11 bill dealing with the targeting of terrorist travel. Directly addressing the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission, sections 3101 through 3104 of H.R. 10, direct the Secretary of Homeland Security to establish a program within DHS that's focused exclusively on terrorist travel and to revise training programs for DHS personnel and topics such as methods for identifying fraudulent and genuine travel documents and effectively using relevant information contained in databases and other systems maintained or accessible by department personnel. Uh, finally, Mr. Chairman, uh, the 9-11 Commission placed enormous importance on information sharing, and that information sharing has to be secure, and it has to be conducted over secure networks. Section 50. 28 of H.R. 10 embodies legislation drafted by our Homeland Security Committee to create within the Department of Homeland Security an Assistant Secretary for Cybersecurity and to give that office uh, increased responsibilities and duties to ensure that we will have secure communications, not just within the federal government, but also with state and local government and with the private sector. An assistant secretary also will provide a single visible point of contact for the private sector within the Department of Homeland Security, which is why this proposal has received the endorsement of 10 major information technology and business organizations. Uh, with respect to this provision, I want particularly to thank our subcommittee on cybersecurity, Chairman Max Thornberry, and the ranking member, Zoe Lofgren, who led the committee's efforts in this area and drafted this important piece of legislation. In conclusion, let me thank this committee for the opportunity to testify today about the Select Committee's contributions to H.R. 10. Uh, after uh, Mr. Turner testifies, I would be glad to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. H.R. 10, uh, as Chairman Cox stated, does contain one of the significant, I think, contributions that uh, the Homeland Security Committee, uh, 
uh, has made uh, this Congress, and that is the proposal to improve the funding to our first responders and to accomplish it in a way that's meaningful and, and focused on where the real threats and vulnerabilities exist. And I want to thank uh, Chairman Cox for uh, the leadership he has provided and the bipartisan way in which that uh, legislation was developed. And I am pleased that it is in H.R. 10. Uh, beyond that, however, I must say that I think H.R. Uh, 10 represents a, a missed opportunity uh, for uh, the House of Representatives to be able to lay out a comprehensive package that will result in concrete steps to help us in winning the war on terror. I think it uh, does not uh, compare favorably to the legislation uh, coming out of the Senate, which in uh, many respects is more comprehensive uh, than the legislation that we have before us here in the House. Um, as you know, um, the 9-11 Commission uh, had 41 recommendations. Um, and of course, they laid out for us a strategy to win the war on terror. It's one that I do not believe anyone, frankly, disagrees with. Um, in order to defeat radical Islamic uh, terrorists, over the long haul, the 9-11 Commission says we must do three things at the same time. We must aggressively attack terrorist cells wherever they exist around the globe by whatever means is necessary. Secondly, we must protect our homeland uh, much better than we're doing today. And thirdly, we must create conditions around the world that will help in preventing the rise of future terrorists. Any legislation that purports to implement the findings of the 9-11 Commission must contain meaningful provisions to advance all three strategies. Additionally, the 9-11 Commissioners have strongly urged that all 41 recommendations are indeed critical. Uh, much of the attention, of course, has been directed to date uh, to the National Intelligence Director and the National Counterterrorism Center, uh, representing only two of the 41 recommendations of the Commission. And I think the Commissioners have made it clear that we should not be acting in a piecemeal fashion, but we should look at the entire package and attempt to, to the best of our ability to implement all 41 recommendations. Overall, Mr. Chairman, the, the bill before us, H.R. 10, does not, in my judgment, contain the initiatives that are necessary to defeat terrorists, secure the homeland, or prevent the rise of future terrorists. It does not take action on all of the 9-11 Commission recommendations. And let me cite just a few examples. The 9-11 Commissioners placed great emphasis on attacking terrorists and their organizations. Their recommendations included measures that would strengthen our ties to Afghanistan and make it a stable and secure country. While H.R. 10 includes a section dedicated to Afghanistan, it does not authorize any new funds for security and development programs that are so urgently needed to ensure that the country can fight the terrorist as well as it needs to. The 9-11 Commission also underscored the importance of securing nuclear materials overseas. H.R. 10 fails to include any substantive efforts to do this. While the bill includes several sections on the topic, it fails to move beyond identifying the problems that we already know exist, and it fails to implement a robust strategy to get the job done. It was interesting as the bill moved through the various committees that the one committee that uh, has dealt with nuclear nonproliferation before uh, that I serve on, the Armed Services Committee, was not even granted jurisdiction to take a look at that section. And the International Relations Committee, who also would share jurisdiction there, from what I understand, uh, declined to mark up those sections of the bill relating to nuclear nonproliferation. As a result, we have lip service paid to the subject in H.R. 10 with no meaningful or substantive uh, action to get the job done. The 9-11 Commission also urged improvement in the screening checkpoints to detect explosives. A very critical issue we all understand full well, particularly in light of the uh, two uh, Russian airliners that were brought down recently. H.R. 10 merely urges the Transportation Security Administration to, quote, give priority to explosive detection for passengers and carry-on baggage. The bill fails 
to require that all high-risk passengers be screened for explosives or to authorize the sums that may be needed to get that job done. So though it touches on the subject, again, it pays lip service to a critical uh, vulnerability that we still face in this country. The 9-11 Commission stressed the importance of giving our first responders the radio spectrum they need to communicate. But H.R. 10 does not address this principal recommendation in any substantive way. We need to ensure our first responders have what they need uh, to talk with each other doing, during an emergency. And finally, Mr. Chairman, the 9-11 Commission placed importance on efforts that would prevent the rise of future terrorists. H.R. 10 fails to authorize funding and to initiate any new efforts such as is recommended by the 9-11 Commission, expansion of broadcasting, educational and economic development programs to help ensure that new terrorists do not take the place of those that exist already today. Mr. Chairman, any bill that this House enacts to implement the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission should ensure that all 41 recommendations are addressed and that meaningful steps are adopted to implement these steps and to win the war against our terrorist enemies. H.R. 10, unfortunately, does not measure up to that test. Instead, we have legislation uh, that fails to faithfully deal with the very important uh, 41 recommendations of the 9-11 Commission. And for that reason, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would hope that this committee would try to strengthen that bill before it's moved to the floor and, uh, as a beginning point, to take a look at many of the provisions in the Senate bill that do a much better job uh, to the credibility and to the recommendations uh, laid before us by the bipartisan 9-11 uh, Commission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Turner, I uh, don't know that the Senate is through doing their work, and perhaps you, you're aware that they are not. Did they address the issues that you just talked about of those deficiencies that were not contained within the bill? Uh, it, Mr. Sessions, my understanding that they have dealt with those issues that I mentioned and, and several more that I didn't. Okay, so in other words, you believe that some of them have been addressed and we don't know the final package. I, I think that the uh, original bills that, were in, bills that were introduced did a much uh, better job of addressing those issues and the 9-11 Commission recommendations than we have done to date. Yes, sir. Uh, as the uh, ranking member on this very important committee uh, that I also sit on, can you tell me what your recommendations would be related to one of the areas that you talked about, about how we avoid uh, a strike. I, I, we'll have to go back to your words, but one of the statements that you made was how we avoid a strike, giving information, uh, perhaps the third recommendation that you read off just a minute ago. Can how you, we prevent the rise of future terrorists? Yes, sir. Can you please enumerate with us how you believe the best that should be done and what this legislation should be? There, there are many suggestions that have been made um, uh, not only in bills that uh, I have co-sponsored and members have introduced, but the 9-11 Commission made recommendations. You can go back uh, as far as the uh, uh, Hart-Rudman Commission, uh, the Council of Foreign Relations. There's a whole host of very good ideas about what we should be doing proactively to prevent the rise of future terrorists. One of them is to, uh, uh, that I have suggested is that we engage to a greater degree in assisting with economic development in the Arab Muslim world. Uh, obviously, uh, we're dealing with uh, terrorists that uh, uh, in many cases uh, are uh, young people who uh, are attracted by the uh, messages of Osama bin Laden, uh, young people who are in many cases unemployed. Uh, ultimately, the victory over uh, terrorism, I think, will be won much as we uh, did uh, as we won the Cold War because uh, the, the ideals of the, the terrorists are, are based on false premises. And if we can reach out and, can, and try to make efforts for economic development in the Muslim and Arab world, I think we'll have a chance to turn some of those young minds in a better direction. We need greater emphasis also on uh, educational partnerships and cultural exchanges. Um, you know, Secretary Rumsfeld, back uh, last October, a year ago, uh, wrote that memo that we all read that uh, was leaked to the Washington Post, where he asked that uh, question that sticks in my mind. He says, are we ever able to kill or capture 
as many young as many terrorists as are being produced by those religious schools in the Arab and Muslim world. Um, and in visiting with some of the ambassadors from the region, uh, it's very clear to me that uh, they need uh, a lot of change in the way their school systems are run. Uh, they need to place emphasis upon traditional secular education. Uh, and in many cases, the, the educational systems are being run by radicals uh, who are teaching hate against our country. So investing in educational partnerships. And most of all, I think uh, we need to be willing to continue the efforts that we make and have made in the past to have uh, educational and student exchange programs, uh, which are very much on the decline today. Um, as a result of some of our own measures to increase security, uh, which have kept some of these uh, foreign students away from our country. So those are the kinds of things that I think in the longer term are going to result in uh, changing uh, the region in a way that, uh, in the words of Secretary Rumsfeld, we won't uh, have to wonder whether we're seeing more and more terrorists produced than we can ever capture or kill. I recall um, perhaps a little bit more than a year ago where the State Department was engaged in Ramallah in attempting to do exactly what you're talking about in the uh, suburbans that were being driven through Ramallah were, were blown up, uh, killing a good number of, uh, of uh, security guards and others as they were attempting to go talk to the Palestinian authorities about bringing their students over for this secular uh, opportunity. Uh, can you tell me which countries you believe this should uh, go forth in and, and where you think we ought to start? Uh, you know, frankly, um, there's a number of them, and I don't know they would do a lot of good to try to give priority of one over another. Uh, I think in terms of where we are today, obviously the first country we need to deal with is the one that uh, I think all of us agree we should have and did invade, uh, and that is Afghanistan, to take out the Taliban that was sheltering uh, al-Qaeda. And I think that it's pretty clear to most of us that the job in Afghanistan is not yet finished. And I think it would go a long way toward uh, accomplishing our goals in the region if we could uh, stabilize Afghanistan and begin to build and, and carry out those kind of educational and economic uh, development initiatives there so that that country, uh, which I think has the potential to uh, be a success story, uh, can, can come uh, to stability and, and a, a better way of life for the people of Afghanistan. Obviously, uh, we have a similar difficulty, perhaps more difficult, in uh, bringing stability to Iraq. Uh, irrespective of what your views on and whether or not we should have gone there and the justifications for doing it, I think most of us understand that we are there and we've got to figure out how to be successful there. And these kinds of initiatives uh, certainly need to be put in place um, when stability uh, will allow it uh, in Iraq for that uh, transformation to be successful. Uh, I could go on, but I think the, the truth of the matter is this is a step uh, we must take. It's an investment we must make if we're really serious about changing hearts and minds and ensuring that our grandchildren uh, won't be facing the same threats that we are, we are all facing today. So it seems like that we could even be in agreement here that starting at least with a model of Afghanistan and learning how to do this, uh, for instance, I remember th uh, several years ago on March 22nd, which happens to be my birthday, uh, Afghani uh, uh, children for the first time, girls went to school. So that was a first step. And a lot of the things that are now being underway in Afghanistan. So it sounds like that you think that that's the proper way through some model to where we learn what we're going to do because there's probably not just one way to get it done. Do you agree with that? Oh, I'm sure you're right. There, there are multiple ideas out there, some of which uh, may prove to be more successful than others. And frankly, I don't know that there is a great deal of disagreement about the significance of these kind of efforts. Where I see a difference is in the degree of commitment uh, and this is not a partisan comment because I think you can find differences of opinion on both sides of yes. the aisle. Uh, but I think that, uh, that we've got to have the kind of leadership that will commit us to those kind of efforts because ultimately those are the efforts that I think will, will secure us a victory in the okay. war on terror. Sir, I just have one last question and I appreciate your time uh, this afternoon. You had talked about a money commitment to do these things which you believe would be necessary. How much money 
if you were the chairman of the committee, uh, instead of Mr. Cox, would you be recommending for the United States to spend? You had talked about that as a deficiency. How much money would you have added in uh, to this bill? Well, let me speak to uh, homeland security, because that's the subject matter that Chairman Cox and I have uh, been involved in for the past two years. If you look at our investments in making America more secure, we are spending about $20 billion more this year on Homeland Security, not just the Department of Homeland Security, but add in the FBI's efforts and all this. About $20 billion that we're spending more this year than we did in the year prior to 9-11. Uh, so that's out of an 800 and what is this year, an 850 or so billion dollar uh, discretionary spending budget. Um, if you look at the tax cut, if you just try to put this in context, that the top 1% of uh, Americans by income earnings uh, received over the uh, uh, last, uh, this last year, uh, they got about $89 billion in tax relief. Um, it seems to me that uh, if we really had our priorities right, uh, instead of granting $89 billion in tax relief to the top 1% of income earners, uh, we would be asking those uh, wealthy Americans to uh, defer their tax relief in the interest of a making America more secure. And as you can see from the numbers, we could more than double all of the increase in spending uh, that we have had for Homeland Security. We could more than double it uh, had we not uh, seen the top 1% of earners in this country receive uh, just last year $89 billion in tax relief. So, and I don't know what the number of, of the tax relief would be if you looked at it in terms of the entire three years of the tax relief has been in effect for that uh, income category. So it's a matter of choices, it's a matter of priorities, and uh, I frankly, uh, am of the opinion, as I think many are, that uh, the likelihood of another terrorist attack against our country is, uh, is high. And um, I just uh, have confidence that uh, if and when that uh, event occurs, and none of us hope it occurs, but if it occurs, I have no doubt that this Congress would respond and do many of the things that we're advocating be done to secure the homeland. Um, I say, why wait? And for those who say, well, we cannot afford it, uh, uh, I think the President made the comment the other night uh, when Senator Kerry suggested that uh, we spend more on Homeland Security. He said, well, we can't afford it. He talked about a tax gap. Uh, the truth of the matter is we can afford it. Uh, it's just a matter of whether it's the priority. And I hope uh, that, that this House would give Homeland Security uh, investments a higher priority. I think it's in the best interest of the security of the American people that we do so. Yes, and, and I chairman. would like to ask the chairman a question also. I, I would welcome that. Push your button. Turn your mic on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the ranking member and I agree on a great deal, as you might expect, after focusing on Homeland Security issues together for two years. But one of the things on which we don't agree is the wisdom or lack of it of promoting economic growth through higher marginal tax rates. Uh, the truth is, since President Bush's tax relief went into effect in 2003, uh, tax revenues to the federal government are up. We're taking more money in now than we were before. That leaves us with the question of how much money we want to spend, which is a question that you put uh, Mr. Sessions, but uh, uh, I wouldn't think that uh, the answer could be so facilized to say if we just raise taxes on uh, working Americans that that number would magically appear. We still have to decide of our budget how much we want to allocate, uh, and there's no question that we are spending a lot more now uh, than we have in the past. On the first responders, which is the subject of the presentation that I just made, uh, we are spending more uh, than uh, we did in September 2011 by a factor of over a thousand percent. That would uh, be one of my questions. The gentleman, uh, Mr. Turner, I believe said that we are spending $20 million more than we were prior to September 11th. Is that true? $20 billion. 
I'm sorry, 20, we're spending $20 billion dollars more. In this, in this last fiscal year that just ended, we spent $20 billion more than we spent on Homeland Security in the year prior to 9-11. Roughly speaking, we spent about $60 billion uh, in additional investments on Homeland Security over the last three years above what we were spending uh, before. Uh, and and uh, the comparison I was trying to make is that having invested $60 billion additional on Homeland Security in three years while giving tax relief in the amount of three times that, the top 1% of American wage uh, earner, American earners, uh, in my judgment, was a misplaced priority in light of the threats that we face uh, from al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the question I've got is, in testimony earlier, you spoke about 29% of the money had not been spent, I believe is what you had said. So of the money that we were allocated, Mr. Turner is suggesting we put a whole bunch more money into the pot, and yet 29 percent is not being spent right now. Uh, could you amplify on that? I know you went and had some thoughts and ideas about how we go and make that easier, including risk assessments, and that's part of the faster funding mechanism that you talked about. Uh, if you see the ability to more effectively and efficiently spend the money for what it was intended to, would you see where it then would be proper to increase the funding? Well, I mean, this is a subject that uh, Mr. Turner and I, and I believe every single member of, uh, of the Homeland Security Committee is in agreement upon. Uh, we're not getting the money that Congress did authorize, did appropriate, that the Department of Homeland Security did grant, uh, and that governors are anxious to put out to their first responders to the front lines, the men and women who need it. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, go over this ground one more time, because if you heard me say that 29 percent of this money hasn't been spent, which would be bad enough, uh, you misheard me. What I was saying is that only 29 percent has been spent. 71 percent has not been spent. This is of the fiscal 2003 money. Uh, it is an extraordinary shame, a tragic waste, uh, that these decisions that Congress has already made to put money out to first responders, men and women who need this, uh, aren't uh, uh, bearing fruit. And so this legislation that we're bringing before you uh, that's included in H.R. 10 will fix this. It's the reason that uh, every major first responder group in the country, more than two dozen groups, uh, has strongly endorsed this legislation. They helped us, uh, as you know, uh, Mr. Sessions, put it together, uh, and uh, it, it will do a world of good when it's enacted into law. Yeah, I, pre I appreciate you clarifying that. Seventy-one percent of the money that's been allocated has not actually been spent. And so we could have added in hundreds of billions of dollars, and in fact, it would be into a pipe that wasn't big enough uh, to properly spend. I thank the gentleman and the ranking member for their time this afternoon. I yield back. Mr. McGovern. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate you being here. You've been here long. I just, I got a, just a few questions, and you give me brief answers is, is fine. Um, uh, I mean, I've said over and over. I mean, we just need to get this right. We need to do it right. You know, something is not better than nothing if that something is not the right thing to do. If we're, if we, you know, we, I mean, we owe this to the families. We owe this to the people who are expecting us to protect this country better. And one of the, my frustrations is, is that we're, this is like a mishmash of stuff that was put together in the Speaker's office that has maybe some good things, but not, and in other cases, not such good things. Let me, you know, the 9-11 Commission report provided kind of a roadmap. That's the way I looked at it. Uh, you know, the things that we need to address, uh, you know, known security deficiencies. For example, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of hours of terrorism-related audio tapes have not been translated because there are not enough translators to do the job. Does this, does this, does H.R. 10 take care of that? Um, you know, o only 5 percent of the 6 million containers entering U.S. seaports annually or physically inspected. Does, does this bill take care of that? Uh, fire departments have only enough radios to equip half the firefighters on a shift. Does this take care of it? Um, extensive portions of our northern and southern borders have no physical security, are not regularly patrolled, and lack any electronic monitoring or aerial surveillance. Uh, there is no routine screening of the 2.8 million tons of cargo 
that flies on passenger planes annually. Um, you mentioned before, I've, I think it was Mr. Turner, the issue of, of nuclear proliferation, which should be a big issue because both John Kerry and George Bush actually said it was the most important issue we're faced uh, with. Uh, does this, does H.R. 10 do anything meaningful other than, um, you know, uh, require a study uh, on the obstacles to counter proliferation efforts? I mean, I mean, are, are we are we tackling the problems head on that this that the uh, sub, that the uh, September 11th Commission uh, uh, put forward, or is this just kind of getting lost in the shuffle here? And I'm just curious for your response. Um. Mr. McGovern, I'll, I'll respond uh, to that. I, I think that all of the items that you enumerated have this bill, H.R. 10, fails to implement efforts to remedy those problems you described. Uh, one do, do, what item are we, what, what, are we, what are we doing then? Well, um, <laughs> Let me, let, me, let me say here, and in all fairness, uh, Mr. Cox spent a large part of his testimony uh, about the section of the bill that he and I both worked right. on no, to I improve the funding it. for first right. responders, the methodology. Uh, and one of the things you mentioned was, you know, equipment to firefighters. Right. Now, what we've done in, in this section of the bill is try to figure out first what it is firefighters need, because we're passing out money today. Uh, not really knowing what it is we're trying to build around this country in terms of capabilities to respond in the event of a terrorist incident. So we have a, a procedure in this legislation to set up a task force to try to define what capabilities a community, a state, a region needs based on the real threats and the vulnerabilities that they have, which obviously will vary from place to place. Once we've determined that, then under our legislation, we will fund to that those needs. So we will be funding that which we've previously determined needs to be uh, put in place as a capability to respond to a terrorist incident. Uh, what we uh, do not see in this bill, however, is significant commitments either in authorization uh, or in initiatives to deal with the other th items that you mentioned. And as I suggested earlier, uh, when you recognize that we are spending uh, in this most recent fiscal year, $20 billion more than we spent in the year immediately prior to 9-11 for Homeland Security. Uh, that clear, that's a lot of money, but in comparison to our $850 billion discretionary budget, and in particular in comparison to the, to the tax relief that the top 1% of American families received uh, in the tax cuts that have been put in place over the last three years, uh, those tax cuts total $89 billion three times what we are spending in increased investments in Homeland Security. And I would suggest to you that's a, a, a wrong choice. Uh, it's a choice that is not in the interest of the American people when we hear every day from our government that we can expect another al-Qaeda attack uh, on the scale of 9-11 uh, any day. And I would suggest to you that if that attack occurs, and I hope it never does, but if it does, we will all be wondering uh, why we were saying we couldn't afford, as the President suggested the other night in the debate, why we couldn't afford to make the investments needed to try to make America safe. If I might uh, add to that, uh, as you know, uh, the Department of Homeland Security didn't exist uh, just a little over a year ago. Uh, it went from a standing start uh, in less than 12 months to become the third largest cabinet department. Uh, the Homeland Security Appropriations Bill, which is not the H.R. 10 that this hearing is about, but the money bill right. uh, to fund the Department of Homeland Security and its many programs, uh, represents a 10 percent year-over-year increase uh, in that department. So things like translators, things like uh, the Container Security Initiative, a program already well underway, uh, things like uh, border security where we have U.S. visit and a biometric entry-exit program or the non-Luger program. All of these things are dependent upon uh, ever-increasing appropriations. It is my strong view that the war on terror 
unlike World War II, is not going to be brought to a quick conclusion by building Liberty ships faster or by embarking on a Manhattan Project, but rather that we're going to have to spend increasing amounts every year for the indefinite future and that our homeland security investments, therefore, must be sustainable. A 10 percent year-over-year increase in what is already the third largest cabinet department, uh, it strikes me, uh, is ample. And when one considers uh, programs such as first responders, as uh, Mr. Turner correctly points out, uh, where the uh, percentage increase uh, since 9-11 is over a thousand percent, I think there's no question that we are uh, getting the resources uh, that these programs need as quickly as can be sustained. But what's just as important as all of this extra money that we are applying to this problem is that we do it wisely. Uh, so. When it comes to first responders, the name Faster and Smarter Funding for First Responders is uh, uh, equally important in both respects. It has to be faster, has to be more, uh, but it also has to be smarter. Uh, and that's the essence of the 9-11 Commission recommendation, and that's the uh, essence of what we're doing in the legislation to follow that 9-11 Commission recommendation. Yeah, I, I guess, um, and again, I, this is not a, I, I admire the work that both of you have done in, um, on, the, on, the, on the committee. and. Um, and the, the, the thing here is we're talking about a broader bill. And my frustration is that this broader bill could be a much better bill to address more effectively some of the things that I've just mentioned, some of the things that you care about. And I think maybe because of the way the process has unfolded here, um, we, we're ending up with what we're ending up here, here with, but it just seems to be such a shame. Well, let me I speak mean, up in favor of uh, the process. Uh, uh, not just in the House, but I think the process as it will come together ultimately. As you know, the Senate uh, skipped the committee process. They went straight to the floor. Uh, what we have done in the House of Representatives, uh, I think because we are better organized and we're able within the timetable to do this, uh, is send this legislation uh, to every single committee uh, that has uh, uh, all or uh, partial jurisdiction over it. Uh, the committees have produced this product, which is which you're now reconciling. Well, we, we, uh, and when we go to the floor, if it's true that there are things that the Senate well, bill has addressed that we have not addressed, we'll have then the well, opportunity to take well, that up in a conference yeah, well, with, with the Senate. We, which well, is with the all due respect, though, the, we haven't followed the, the, with the respect to other committees. Bills. Committees have met. They've, they've made their suggestion. Someone in the in the leadership office decided to pick and choose what they were going to keep in here, uh, and what they were, what was not going to be in here. So, I mean, you know. Uh, but that's I, the same I, process we followed well, with well, this, you know, the but you know, I, 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 I suggest that, that what we Homeland should Security. follow, what we should have followed, is an example similar to what happened after the September 11th tragedy occurred, where we get together in a bipartisan way and worked in a way to come up with a bill that hopefully everybody in this chamber could support. I don't want, you know, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, um, I mean, I, I don't think we, what the goal should not be for your leadership is to have a bill that passes, you know, with all Republican votes and no Democratic votes. You should want a bill that, almost, that both Republicans and Democrats can vote for and feel proud to vote for and actually can feel that will make a difference. And my problem with this and the process, we just saw the bill just last night. 600-page bill just got dropped on us um, last night. I mean, to, to suggest that everybody has had the time to you know, uh, to do due diligence on well, this bill. Well, but with respect, the, the constituent parts of this bill have moved through congressional oh. committees. With the portion that we're responsible, that we're testifying for, that we're testifying about right now, the Faster and Smarter Funding for First Responders Act, uh, that bill has been referred well, to so many committees well, that 200 members of the House have already had the opportunity look, in committee. Look, H.R. 10 was originally 300 pages. It. It's now something like 600 pages. I mean, something happened um, in but Speaker Hassett's office. It's nothing more office than uh, to, the it doubled. Um, amalgam of Maybe what's they been twice. by the committees of the House. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying, that, you know, this is too important to do business as usual because business as usual around here stinks, um, and it's not very fair, and people don't get an opportunity uh, to weigh in on a lot of these issues, and a lot of things kind of fall through the cracks. So I, I just, you know, I just simply say that I regret that, that as it stands right now, this is not the bill that I think everybody had hoped for. Um, and I don't think it reflects well on this process. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, members. Mr. Micah, welcome. If you have a prepared statement, we'll be happy to make it part of the record without objection. And welcome, we welcome a summary.
As you uh, consider the work of various committees, uh, let me just make a couple of observations. And uh, the good Lord accidentally put me in as chairman of aviation uh, in February of 2001. So I've had to deal with a lot of the uh, practical problems and situations and uh, security systems that we've tried to build uh, since uh, terrorists use uh, two, two, well, four aircraft uh, uh, as weapons of uh, mass destruction against uh, the United States. Um, we have a small piece, the Transportation Committee, and uh, we've included most of the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission. It's interesting in listening to this how the 9-11 Commission uh, is uh, all know it. Uh, I think they did a nice job of doing a narrative and putting some recommendations together, but uh, I just asked my staff about how much time they spent with them. They spent about three and a half hours with the staff. They spent about 45, I spent about 45 minutes with the commission, and we've worked on these issues day and night uh, since actually before uh, September 11th. Uh, and unfortunately, the wor their work has been politicized. Uh, we, we had the Gore Commission, which I don't even know if it was mentioned in the report, uh, the Gilmore uh, Commission, and uh, 10 people on the 9-11 Commission, which had, I believe, an extension in, in their work. And they've come up with some, uh, some things that, that we actually recommended to them, and you'll see uh, in our uh, bill here. Uh, we do know uh, from everything we've been involved in that al-Qaeda has been, uh, from intelligence reports, uh, obsessed with aviation, and they're, they're still probing our aviation security system. Uh, we spent a lot of time putting uh, Transportation Security Administration together, and I was involved in that, saw the mistakes that were made uh, in haste, uh, some of them well intended, and we're still trying to straighten out uh, the huge bureaucracy and federalize the screening system that we created. Uh, and, uh, a lot's been said just before I got here on, on how much money we're spending. I can match the amount of money that anybody's uh, said we're, we're spending. We spent probably $10 billion just on passenger screening since September 11th. And it's not how much money you spend, it's how you spend it. A lot of that, unfortunately, was, was wasted and is being wasted today, shaking down uh, little old ladies, uh, veterans, uh, decorated veterans, and people who pose uh, no threat to us. So, we have spent a lot of money and missed uh, uh, the bullet. In, in our provisions, we put some things in here that deal with some of the measures that were just talked about. I guess Mr. Turner is the ranking member on Homeland Security. Uh, Mr. Turner said, what did, uh, we've done nothing uh, to develop uh, explosive technology. I think he talked about the situation with, uh, with Chechnya. And uh, that was a very alarming thing. It was blown off the pages by some 300 children and students and others that were killed by terrorists in Russia. But that did usher in a, a whole new era uh, relating to uh, the explosive prob uh, problems uh, that we face uh, with terrorists. And that's carrying explosives uh, on board uh, an aircraft. Uh, in the billions that we've spent, we spent almost uh, nothing uh, to protect ourselves against that. This bill does have a provision in that it requires TSA to develop and deploy financing plans to promote the use of explosive detection technology to screen passengers and their carry-on luggage and provides $30 million annually for that. Now, um, why don't we have something in place, uh, and I don't think it's in the report, uh, first of all, in the TSA bill, which I helped draft, we had $50 million, million dollars to develop new technology, to develop new technology. We don't have technology that will detect uh, explosives carried on board. When you walk through a metal detector at the airport, you're walking through 1950s technology. It doesn't detect it. And we've said this uh, before. Knowing that in, uh, in uh, November, 
when we passed the legislation, we put $50 million in there. Uh, the bulk of that money was diverted by a Democrat senator, Patty Murray, from Washington for her home state projects. That's why the project was never, uh, was never launched that year. The next year, we put $75 million to develop explosive technologies. The Congress and some of our friends on the other side of the aisle delayed implementation of a budget for five months into the physical year and then politicized that. Uh, TSA took 63 of the $75 million and used it on salaries. So we have uh, no, uh, uh, we have no technology in place to, to detect explosives. And uh, what is today, the 5th of October? We're into a new physical year, physical year, folks. And so the same games that were played last year are going to delay the development, uh, research and development pro, uh, projects. So the blame is also on Congress for not having that in place. And Mr. Kerry, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, and, and he takes his word from Mr. Markey, who's tried several amendments and brought up the bogus figure of 5% being, uh, of cargo being uh, uh, screened. Uh, we have in this bill, uh, Mr. Turner should know it, it uh, creates a pilot program for airlines to participate in the testing of blast resistant cargo baggage containers. Why don't we have technology that will de uh, deploy that will detect that? The same reason, because the money was taken or uh, misappropriated appropriated by Congress, so we don't have the equipment available on October 5th, uh, 2004. We do have other programs. We put the best that we could put in place, and to change uh, at, uh, tr horses in the middle of this stream with the programs we have now with some of the cockamamie proposals would set us back even further. So I, I strongly urge the adoption of these uh, uh, provisions that we have in this bill. I'm not going to detail all of them, but I couldn't help but come here and address some of the things that, uh, that I've seen uh, that uh, have been done, uh, that we have included in this bill. And again, the 9-11 Commission is, uh, is a nice commission, but they basically delayed uh, for over a year, and they had an extension, I believe, uh, the implementation of some of these things that should have been done before in Congress uh, should have addressed. So those are a couple of comments uh, added to our provisions in which it also screw up the train again, Mr. Chairman. It, our, this bill went before the Judiciary Committee and we are multi-jurisdictional here and they added a bunch of amendments and changes to Section 10 we, and uh, moved some of that over to uh, approval by, and consultation by the Attorney General. We recommend that all of those, uh, those uh, Referrals, uh, again, be deleted or additions uh, in language be deleted. We don't need further delays in the process and uh, uh, further steps in the bureaucracy. So with that, I uh, urge you to uh, pass uh, our provisions. They're long overdue and uh, yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hastings? No question. Mr. McGovern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just, for, just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I mean, you referred to the 9-11 Commission as all-knowing. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm bothered by that characterization. Um, we, we, we created that commission um, because we failed. Government failed. Um, and, we tr and the whole point of that commission was to try to figure out how we failed and how we can do better. So it's not an issue of, you know, a bunch of people know it all. Um, you know, we created that commission, a bipartisan commission. They spent a lot of time. They came up with some recommendations. Um, and I think for the most part that they're, they're sound recommendations. Um, secondly, just so I understand this, the, one of the commission recommendations was that the commission recommended that each individual selected for special screening should be screened for explosives and that every passenger aircraft carrying cargo have at least one hardened container to carry any suspect cargo. And it is my understanding, I think you um, verified this, that in H.R. 10, the Republican leadership bill does not require that individuals selected for special screening be screened for explosive, and it does not require that passenger aircraft carrying cargo <coughs> have at least one hardened container for suspect cargo. Um, what, 
Well, first of all, I mean, and you know, and first I know of all, we gave them uh, the rec recommendations. Uh, and first of all, you need a, a technology that will detect explosives. Uh, right now, as I said, we have 1950s metal detection technology in place. Okay? Right, but, but, but you, you, people are saying, I mean, the way I go through airlines is, you know, I go through and if a beeper goes off, sometimes, you know, I got to take that my shoes off. That won't no, no, detect it won't, it won't detect explosives. Right. But, you know, on certain times, they can take me in another room. Um, I mean, when I come into the Capitol here, we get dogs sniffing mm -hmm. my trunk. I don't know what they're sniffing for, but I assume it's explosives. Um, you know, I, you can't tell me that uh, there is absolutely no technology available now uh, that can help us, you know, uh, better screen people who we th think maybe are suspects to, you know, to find, uh, to find explosives. First, and, uh, what, may I respond? Yeah, sure. Well, again, I described the scenario. We knew this after September 11th. Uh, back in the, during the Gore Commission, and the Gore Commission uh, uh, was actually working on a false uh, premise. It was TWA 800 that they thought was a terrorist act. It turned out to be an explosive uh, from the, the gas tank. But they recommend the development of uh, uh, baggage uh, screening equipment, some of which we use at the airport, some which uh, it was not that effective, and some that sat in warehouses on September 11th. But the money that should have been used to develop the technology so that you wouldn't be delayed and we would know for certain whether you were carrying explosives or anyone else, uh, we put funds in there in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2001, Mrs. Murray from uh, Washington diverted some of those funds, TSA, because Congress never passed an appropriation until five months into the fiscal year, used 63 of $75 million. That's why we don't have well, developed today. And today is the four, a fifth, and we still don't have a budget. And you know what they're going to do? You know what they're going to do, Mr. McGovern? They're going to call me and say, Mr. Micah, we have to put our projects on hold because Congress hasn't acted yeah. well, you're the uh, chairman. to pass. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, you're the, you're, I'm the chairman, no, you're the chairman, but they need M-O-N-E-Y, right. well, which I, is I under well, the okay. Constitution but, I mean, I'm just trying to is, given by, is given by the Congress. I'm I'm just, I'm just trying to understand the problem. I mean, you know, you're the, you're the, you're the chairman. Your party controls the House. Your party controls the Senate. Your party controls the White House. I mean, I, I'm trying to understand where's, you know, I mean, I know we could blame, you know, a senator from another state who happens to be a Democrat. But if this was a priority, you know, if this truly was a priority, your, you know, of your leadership, wouldn't it be in this bill? Your party insisted on an all federal screening force, TSA, as it's currently constituted. So they spent three years, billions of dollars. I have the classified results, which I'll be glad to share with staff or anyone here. And I, and I, I, I challenge every one of you to read it of the results. And the inspector general just gave us his latest report, which was in the paper. That system fails to detect weapons. That system fails to de de detect uh, uh, dangerous materials. And the wow. worst failure off the charts is detecting explosives. Well, and you can, instead of 46,000 people, which you insisted on, it, instead of the 19,000 we had out there, we, we spent the money on, on people who don't do it. Well, you need technology. Well, and then well, you I, I, all I, uh, either diverted well, the money or delayed the process. And well, today you, we don't well, have this. You we don't all, have you all. I, I wish, the I Democrat wish I, side, the well, minority I, I, side. I, I, as I remind you again, you control. This isn't a partisan no, issue. No. I'm just stating facts. Right. No, you control the House, you control the Senate, and you control the White House. My question to you is, you know, let's move away from the blame game. There was a recommendation uh, in the Commission on aviation security. It is not contained in H.R. 10. And I guess I, my question is, why not? Well, first if, of if, all, if it now all of a sudden is a priority, why is it, con okay. it not contained first in H.R. 10? First of all, 10? the 9-11 report was a report in time and space. I wouldn't wait for 9-11 report. The reason you go through uh, right now uh, at airport and they take your jacket off and they actually frisk people is because of the letter that we sent because that needed to be do, uh, done now, not to wait until the technology is developed and put in place because we know terrorists have used it. They used it in che Chechnya. They strapped explosives to two women and they simultaneously took down an aircraft. And we know that that's the kind of thing that they're planning. But we don't have the technology that will detect those kinds of explosives. So again, rather than waiting, we took other measures. 
And TSA doesn't know to this day, the people in Atlantic City who test and develop this equipment and approve it, uh, do not know today where their next dollar is coming for, whether they should even continue with the program, because here's today the, f the, the 5th of October, and we still haven't passed a budget. And you know on the other side, it takes 60 votes to get well, anything done. I mean, I, I, again, I, I, think it's, I think the commission had a good recommendation, and I regret that it's not contained in H.R. 10. I have no other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cooper? If you have any prepared statement, we'll be happy to make it part of the record. Thank you, And Mr. welcome Chairman. to the summary. I have no prepared statement. I appreciate the chance to state my views before the committee. Um, the 9-11 families are watching. Most of America is watching because this could well be the most important bill of this Congress. And I'm very worried that the House of Representatives is not about to do the right thing. I think it's very important that this House be allowed to vote on the substitute offered by Shays and Maloney, the so-called Collins-Lieberman bill from the Senate. As I understand it, today the Senate voted 85 to 10 for cloture. So it looks as if the bipartisan consensus on the Senate side is holding. <coughs> And that's very different from what we're finding on the House side. Let me elaborate. I serve on the House Armed Services Committee. While it is true that the bill reported out by a vote of 59 to 0, a bill to the full House, the vote on the Collins-Lieberman substitute was actually much closer. It was 26 to 33. I'm worried that the um, bipartisanship that's prevailed on the Senate side is just not working here on the House side at all. I think it's very interesting to know that for all of our chairman's testimony earlier, Mr. Hunter, he was essentially attacking the White House position because the White House, in a statement of administrative policy, said that they support the Collins-Lieberman bill. They put that in writing. They did have some caveats, but the White House is on record supporting that bill. I think it's very important to note, too, that the White House has issued certain executive orders that do a better job of implementing the 9-11 Commission recommendations than H.R. 10. So I would ask why the Republican chairman of the House Armed Services Committee seems to be so at odds with the White House statements on this, this subject. Mr. Turner, uh, the ranking member of the Homeland Security Com uh, Committee, mentioned earlier that we were not allowed to discuss the vitally important topic of weapons of mass destruction in the House Armed Services hearing. Imagine that, not allowed to discuss weapons of mass destruction in our markup on this vital issue. A member raised the issue of germaneness, which is a technical parliamentary point. The substantive fact is this vital issue was not able to be discussed as we brought this bill up for markup. As you well know, Mr. Chairman, this bill was conceived without any Democratic input at all. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad bill, but it does mean it's going to be very hard to reconcile with what it looks like is going to emerge from the Senate. We need to pass good legislation. We need to pass a bill that, in my opinion, mirrors most of the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission. We need to work on a bipartisan basis so that we can be effective for the American people. The Chairman of the Armed Services Committee mentioned many times in his testimony the danger of severing the link between the warfighter and our intelligence assets. No one wants that to happen. And here in an open session, we can't talk about a lot of the details, but no one wants that to happen, including the White House. That's why the White House has endorsed in writing the bill that Mr. Hunter condemns. So we have to ask ourselves the question, Mr. Chairman, what's happening? Is the White House incompetent or are they insincere? Well, I would submit to you, Mr. Chairman, the White House is not incompetent. They must have known what they were endorsing, and their words must carry some weight. They're not kidding about this. They're not saying they're for it in one room and then trying to kill it in another. So I would urge this committee, especially the Republican majority, to give the White House statement considerable weight. Again, it is very important that this House be able to vote on the Collins-Lieberman substitute. 
on the Shays Maloney substitute so that this House has a vote at least up or down on a fair basis on what the nation has been reading in this bestseller 9-11 Commission report instead of a bill that really emerged from nowhere this weekend, as Mr. McGovern described earlier, a 600-page bill was dropped in his lap last night, which hardly any member of this Congress has read. Granted, it may be scotch taped together from lots of pieces from lots of different committees, but no committee is really taking responsibility for this. I think we all acknowledge, Mr. Chairman, that President Bush is our Commander-in-Chief. I'm a Democrat, but he's our Commander-in-Chief. And there's someone else vying that for that position, at least regarding this legislation, and that's Secretary Rumsfeld. The Speaker's uh, spokesman, Mr. Fieri, was quoted a week or two ago saying basically that they wanted no reform of the Pentagon. Well, it's my impression that Secretary Rumsfeld wants very little, if any, reform of the Pentagon. Now, he's entitled to argue his viewpoint, but I would hope that this committee and its Republican majority would uphold the wishes of the Commander-in-Chief and support at least a vote up or down on the 9-11 Commission, the Collins-Lieberman Bill, the Shays-Maloney Bill. It's very important that we have that vote. <laughs> Finally, Mr. Chairman, I think it's very important that we realize the gravity of this legislation. H.R. 10 has really had no hearings before the House Armed Services Committee. Now, we did have hearings in August to hear from the 9-11 Commission. And most of the nation has been able to read the 9-11 Commission report. But H.R. 10 sprang largely out of nowhere sometime last week. Very few members know what's in it. That's not to say it's a bad bill. But I think it's very premature to rush to judgment and pass a bill of this type without the support of the 9-11 families, the 9-11 Commission, and those who've tried to work together on a bipartisan and open and fair basis to craft good legislation for our nation. This is a very important moment in the history of the co this Congress. I would hate to see us repeat the mistake that I think we made with the Medicare drug legislation, to rush through something in the dark of night that very few people had read on a very close and contentious vote. Uh, the, our committee, at least, when we considered this, and we on had only a couple of hours to do this, did not have time to do a good job marking up this legislation. As I mentioned earlier, we were not even allowed to consider the issue of weapons of mass destruction. That is a clear oversight. So far as I know, no committee in the House of Representatives even considered the issue of weapons of mass destruction. And if we're ignoring issues like that, Lord knows what else we're ignoring. So this is a very important issue. Please, Mr. Chairman, let this committee grant us a full, fair, up or down vote on the bipartisan 9-11 Commission recommendations. Thank you. Would you comment on uh, Chairman Hunter's remarks with respect to uh, severing the connection between the intelligence platforms and the servicemen on the ground? Well, Mr. Chairman, I do not believe the White House would have endorsed any such severance of a link. The White House has endorsed in writing the Collins-Lieberman bill with some caveats, but the White House did not say that that's severing the link between the warfighter and the intelligence assets. I think that's largely a uh, false issue that's being raised by certain members of the Armed Services Committee. I'm not doubting their sincerity, but we do not have the hearing evidence the factual evidence before the committee to show that that's in fact the case, that we can't achieve that close link that we want real-time intelligence to the warfighter using a bipartisan 9-11 commission approach. Mr. McGovern. I want to thank the gentleman for, for his testimony, and, um, and, and, I, and I, I think um, his request <coughs> is reasonable, given the fact that um, uh, the uh, Collins-Lieberman, uh, Shays-Maloney approach seems to be a genuinely bipartisan approach uh, that the members of this House, uh, both Democrats and Republicans, should have an opportunity to be able to vote up or down, straight up or down on it. Um, and, um, and, I, and, and I think it would be a shame if, for some reason, that the leadership that wrote H.R. 10, you know, in a, behind a closed locked door, put this thing together you know, would also decide, uh, you know, behind a closed locked door that somehow we were not able to have that vote up or down. Look, at what I want to see happen here um, is a situation where at the end of the day, whatever passes this House, you know, passes by a huge margin, that it's virtually unanimous. I mean, that's the goal. That's the go goal of a good bill, um, you know, to get a virtual unanimous vote. Um, and what has happened here 
I mean, and it's not only because it's been kind of pieced together without the input of Democrats. I mean, as we've been reading and as we've been trying to find out, all these extraneous provisions that are coming out of nowhere are starting to appear, and some of them have, have very significant impacts. <laughs> Chairman Hyde was up here speaking um, out very str uh, strongly against the, the outsourcing of torture provision that is in this bill. Doesn't believe it belongs there. Um, you know, I agree with him on that, but yet it is in the base bill. Um, and so it seems to me that we would be better off, um, you know, uh, if, we're, if they're not going to go back to the, to the room and rewrite this and do it right, then they should at least give us the opportunity to vote straight up or down on uh, the Shays Maloney, uh, Collins, Lieberman bill, and that's what I hope they do. So I thank the gentleman for his testimony. I couldn't agree with you more. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Cooper. You. Ms. Maloney? Thank Welcome. you. Uh, Happy to have Mr. you here. Mr. Chairman, and I, I had hoped that my uh, colleague Christopher Shays would be able to join me. He is chairing a committee on national security in the Government Reform and Oversight Committee. But I am joined today with uh, families of the 9 11. Oh, Chris is here. Oh, Mr. Chairman. No, go ahead. No, I want you to You're the chairman. Okay. <laughs> well, on 9-11, I lost uh, many friends and, and neighbors, and uh, many of the families are here today. They are conducting a vigil in front of the White House and on Independence Avenue, and they are supporting a clean, up or down vote on the 9-11 Commission bill. The Shays Malone. Okay. I, after 9-11, I, I have never seen this body, this House, uh, more united and determined and, and bipartisan. And we need that same spirit to finish the job and to, to, to pass the 9-11 Commission recommendations that will make our country safer. Recognizing the expert uh, work of the 9-11 Commission, both sides of the aisle in the Senate have endorsed a clean, bipartisan bill that would bring uh, overdue reform to our fragmented intelligence network. The White House, the Commander-in-Chief of our country, the President of the United States, has endorsed the Collins-Lieberman-Shays-Maloney bill. The 9-11 Family Steering Committee has endorsed it. The 9-11 Commission has endorsed it. And I hope that at the very least that this important legislation that has been endorsed by the Commander-in-Chief, the President, the Senate, should be allowed a clean vote on the floor of the People's House. With the fate of perhaps the most important intelligence bill in our history hanging in the balance, I can honestly say that all eyes <coughs> in the nation are on the House of Representatives. But unfortunately, the House leadership is moving ahead with a controversial uh, bill that is filled with unrelated, extraneous uh, legislation, which is strikingly different from the Commission's recommendations on key points. Instead of moving forward with legislation that has been endorsed by so many, they have put before us a bill that is uh, really quite different and filled with unrelated items. And moving forward with this type of plan threatens to, to scuttle really the entire prospect of reform, uh, and it has been met with uh, criticism from the 9-11 Commission members themselves. So one of the Commission's most important recommendations, and there are many, but I just want to mention this one because I think that at the very core of it was the National Intelligence Director. But under the H.R. 10, it's, it's significantly weakened. Chairman Kane, yes, last week on Thursday, stressed that if Congress didn't give the National Intelligence Director, budget authority, then, quote, you should not create this position at all. And H.R. 10 gives no such authority. 
Additionally, pieces of the controversial Patriot Act II are, are <coughs> pop out throughout H.R. 10. And the heated debate on these points could hold up the entire reform package. <coughs> and, and despite the Commission's urging that Homeland Security funding not be distributed as pork, the House leadership's reform proposal maintains a minimum for each state regardless of threat. Intelligence uh, reform is at a crossroads. The House leadership can uh, choose to agree with the 9-11 Commission members, the 9-11 Family Steering Committee, the White House and the President of the United States, both sides of the Senate, Republicans and Democrats, or they can choose a divisive, lone wolf approach that uh, promises to bog down reform and weaken our nation. I, I just want to say that I feel uh, very, very strongly about this. Uh, my, my city was attacked, and uh, every time that I, there's another uh, terrorist alert, it's always New York is, is, is the terrorist threat number one. And I do not ever want to be in the position of having to explain to my constituents why we did not move forward with these important reforms that the commission members in a bipartisan way, the, the senators in a bipartisan way, have said will make our, our city, our state, our countries uh, safer. And so I urge the, the um, members of the Rules Committee to place in order the Collins-Lieberman, uh, Shays-Maloney bill for a clean up or down vote that would uh, put into law all 41 of the Commission's recommendations. This bill was written with the Commissioners, with the support and input of the bipartisan members of the 9-11 Commission, and at the very least, the <coughs> people's body should allow a clean up or down vote. Let it stand on its merits, let the members go and vote their conscience. This should be a bipartisan effort. I, I, I would also like to request permission to place in the record uh, various editorials that have come out in support of the 9-11 Commission. Without objection. Thank you. Mr. Shays. Thank you, Chairman Linder and uh, Mr. McGovern. Uh, the bill that you have before you, I think, reflects many of the recommendations of, uh, by the 9-11 Commission, but in too many ways it is an inadequate reflection, a blurred and obstructed image tainted by matters extraneous to our true mission here. Ours is a solemn obligation, a debt of honor owed to the dead, the survivors, and the ten noble citizens who put aside personal lives and partisanship to point the way to a safer future. We owe them nothing less than a respectful, accurate translation of their recommendations into law. The process that produced this bill strayed from the mission, treating an extraordinary historic extraordinary historic mandate too much like legislative business as usual. Uh, provisions lacking deference or even reference to the Commission's recommendations, however otherwise meritorious they may be, weigh down the entire enterprise and undermine the effort to render a faithful testament to the Commission's work. Inclusion of so many provisions beyond the Commission's call in any final House bill I think will distort the House position relative to the Senate vastly and needlessly increasing the risk of conference committee will produce a flawed product or stall altogether. Regrettably, our efforts to amend H.R. 10 to more closely reflect the Commission's recommendations were ruled out of order in committee. Ironically, the same narrow turf-conscious House rules that the Commission unequivocally <coughs> said must change prevent our consideration of the Commission's broader rec reorganization proposals in committee. Today, therefore, we ask the Rules Committee to make an order uh, during consideration of H.R. 10 on the House floor, an amendment in the nature of a substitute based on language advanced by Senators Collins, McCain, and Lieberman, supported by the Commission, by members of both parties in both chambers, and by the President. Specifically, our amendment would strike all of H.R. 10 and insert in lieu thereof the text of Collins-Lieberman Bill, S.R. 2845, H.R. 5150, dealing with intelligence reform, and the text of Titles 2 through Title 9 of the broader McCain-Lieberman bills, S. 2774 and H.R. 5040, implementing the remaining recommendations of the 9-11 Commission. Mr. Chairman, the work of the 9-11 Commission is a model of bipartisanship 
The commission has endorsed the work of the senators as the closest reflection of their 20 months of work. It seems to us their effort deserves to be considered by the Congress in an up or down vote. It seems to us those whose jurisdic jurisdictions would be affected should not be afraid of the results of such vote if, in, in fact, the merits are on their side. To do any less is a real disservice not only to the Commission but to the American people. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, we're asking that we have a right for a vote, not in a motion to recommit in a 10-minute dialogue. Um, I can live with the consequences of a vote on the House floor. But what would be very hard to, to live with is to think that the Rules Committee would not even put in order an opportunity to, de to debate the Commission proposals. And frankly, I've heard some legitimate arguments uh, that I think deserve to be debated about, about the proposal. It will help educate Republicans and Democrats on the House floor, and it will truly help educate um, our, our country and in the process help explain whatever the outcome is, uh, why uh, a conference report may be different or may not be different. When I first got elected in 1974 as a new member of the Republican Party, I believe with all my heart and soul that we would have lots more debate. We would be willing to see uh, uh, the arguments on both sides and, and frankly live with the consequences of that. And I, and I really fear that over time we've seen that erode a bit. This is a chance, I think, to do it right. Mr. Putnam. I'm sorry, I didn't know Mr. Putnam was there. Mr. Chairman, may I congratulate our newest member. Uh, he was a, a magnificent uh, <coughs> vice chairman of my, of my committee, uh, National Service Committee. And it's nice to have him as a member. <coughs> well, I, I, want to th I want to thank you both for your testimony. I want to thank you for bringing this before the Rules Committee. Um, um, quite frankly, I think you're right um, on the approach. Uh, I think uh, H.R. 10 um, represents a failure of the process, quite frankly. I think this should have been a much better bill. Um, I've been saying all along the bill we want is a bill that almost everybody in this House will support. And I think that I think what you have is, is, is that kind of bill. You know, I can tell you this, we're going to we're going to have a vote on it in the, in the Rules Committee. Um, and I hope that um, the majority here will vote with you and allow you to have this up or down vote because I think if you do, you're going to win uh, on the House floor. If for some reason there's a decision made to not make this in order, um, uh, I think the only way around that is for people to vote against the rule. Um, I know it's a tough thing for uh, some for some Republicans to do sometimes, but I mean, I, I got to tell you, I think this is one of those issues. As, as you said, uh, Mr. Shays, that is that important. I mean, people are expecting us to get this right. I mean, they really are. Um, and, you know, this is not any your usual run-of-the-mill legislation that we're dealing with. I mean, this is, this is it. And uh, people have been reading the 9-11 report. They've been watching the hearings. They've been following the commission as they've gone from place to place. Um, and they're expecting us to, to, to rise to the occasion. Uh, and I hope that we will. So I want to thank you both for your, for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Could I just make one last comment? Of course. Comment? Um, the National Security Subcommittee that I chair had 19 hearings before September 11th. We've had well over 50 hearings on the issues related to the Commission's report. And, and I really believe that um, you don't need to fear uh, bringing this bill up for a vote. I don't know if it will pass or not. I think it should. But I do know that the American people will feel better that the process has allowed this bill to be debated. And I really hope that uh, that that's the conclusion of the Rules Committee. Thank you. Thank you. I hope so, too. Thank you. And I hope put it <coughs> Mr. Gingrey. If you have a prepared statement, we'll be happy to make it part of the record. Uh, without objection, we welcome a summary. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I thank the opportunity to speak to the Rules Committee and bring forward this amendment, Mr. McGovern, Mr. Putnam. Uh, the amendment would create uh, a new unified combatant commander for military intelligence with the goal of creating a bridge between the new NID, the National Intelligence Director, and the array of military intelligence entities through direct budgetary authority and a coordination to ensure all of our intelligence priorities are being properly resourced. 
there are currently eight separate intelligence entities under the umbrella of the Department of Defense. Uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency, National Security Agency, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, National Reconnaissance Office, and then the four service intelligence agencies. Our goal today should be threefold. To make sure that the NID, the National Intelligence Director, is, a, is as a effective as possible to ensure our military men and women get the best intelligence possible when they're, at, they're risking their lives to protect our freedoms and to better integrate our military and civilian intelligence officials into one team. Perhaps the most important is that pulling the major intelligence elements of the DOD under a single commander would give the new NID one point of contact when he or she needs something, not eight different uh, agencies. So this new unified command would be equally important for intelligence sharing within the DOD agencies, as well as effectively assisting the NID with his or her national intelligence responsibilities. Uh, the DOD is not only the largest user of intelligence, is also the largest collector as well. And this is a reality that won't appreciably change after we work through these very important reforms. Therefore, it makes sense, in my opinion, to have a single coordination point for all those various entities within the department. This would allow for better information sharing and coordination as well as to ensure that intelligence is not overlooked. In addition, the amendment would create a leader to represent the Department of Defense and the intelligence community under the direction of the NID, the National Intelligence Director. I believe that this unified commander would be in a much better position to articulate the needs of our military commanders to the National Intelligence Director than eight separate DOD intelligence elements. Mr. Chairman, again, I appreciate having the opportunity to speak on this amendment, and I thank the committee for your consideration. I think this is so trying to get to this concern uh, of, of, of the warfighter, uh, the, the soldier on the ground who needs to know what's around the next corner or over the next hill uh, and, 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 and getting this right. I mean, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the Hippocratic Oath that says, uh, in the first place, do no harm. And I think that, it, as you well know that statement, it's very important that we get it right. And I commend the committee, I commend uh, my committee uh, my chairman, Duncan Hunter, and the House Armed Services Committee on H.R. 10, I think we are trying to get it right, but I sincerely believe that this would give us a little bit better coordination between uh, the NID and the Department of Defense, and I, and I really appreciate the committee strongly considering making this, uh, uh, this amendment uh, available. Thank you. Mr. Putnam? Mr. McGovern? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Smith, aren't you representing the Judiciary Committee? Yes. Please join us. <clears throat> if you have a prepared statement, we'll be happy to make it part of the record and welcome a summary. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and colleagues, I don't know. I'm here on an amendment. Turn your mic on. Turn your mic on. <coughs> Mr. Chairman and colleagues. I'm here to speak on an amendment that I would like to offer to H.R. 10. <coughs> Excuse me, I have the, an official description of the amendment. But very briefly, <coughs> excuse me again, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> uh, uh, I think it'll be fine. Uh, very briefly, what the amendment does is to uh, absolve from liability those organizations such as Travelocity and other travel companies as well as the airlines uh, from uh, being liable, for example, for breach of privacy when they provide uh, passenger data to the federal government uh, because of various security uh, programs. Uh, this is not unprecedented. It seems to be common sense. And I've been asked to offer this amendment, which I believe at least uh, uh, to date is non-controversial. Uh, it may be possible, uh, Mr. Chairman, with your help, perhaps to put it in the manager's amendment. Uh, if it becomes controversial for reasons that I don't expect, we'll certainly alert you to that. But as of right now, it seems to be common sense that we want to have the cooperation of these travel organizations and have the cooperation of the airlines in providing uh, needed data on passengers to the federal government when there are sec security concerns. And this uh, would uh, be an incentive uh, for the act cooperation to occur. And um, I believe
believe the staff has been provided with some information, and I have some additional information as well. Without objection, will be part of the record. Okay. I don't know Ms. if Putnam? Mr. McGovern. No questions. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, without objection, I'd like to submit for the record Mr. Davis's comments. Mr. Bartlett. Welcome. Thank you very much. After 9-11, we've entered a whole new era. This amendment, which comes from H.R. 3583, will establish a study to provide an objective analysis of whether the current definition of the national capital region and the infrastructure within this area is adequate to meet the new threats and higher risk level to the region around our nation's capital. Congressman Cardin, Congresswoman Joanne Davis, and I have worked closely on this legislation. And we're very pleased by the wide bipartisan support of our colleagues in Maryland, Washington, and Virginia. In June of last year, the Metropolitan Council of Governments board urged Congress to consider the definition of the National Capital Region, to reconsider the definition of the National Capital Region as is proposed in this amendment. The amendment is simple. It calls upon the Secretary of Homeland Security to create a commission to report to Congress about whether the current definition of the National Capital Region is sufficient in the new era of Homeland Security or if it should be expanded. It will also study whether infrastructure in the region is adequate for the higher risk we now face and if not, where improvements may be made. This commission would specifically study the major federal highways out of America's capital, specifically Interstate 66, 95, and 270 in Maryland and Virginia. It would evaluate whether or not there is sufficient infrastructure along these interstates to handle mass excavation, mass casualties, and medical needs, decontamination, food and water, and so forth in the event of a terrorist incident in Washington, D.C. The Commission will also examine if the current definition of the specific areas designated as the National Capital Region is adequate or should be changed as a result of the new threats to regional homeland security since the terrorist attacks of 9-11. The National Capital Region is currently defined in federal law as encompassing the District of Columbia, Montgomery and Prince George's counties in Maryland, and Arlington, Fairfax, Loudoun, and Prince William counties in Virginia. We all know from our personal experience commuting to work here in the Congress that normal rush hour can last as long as four hours or more. In the event of a terrorist attack or other emergency in Washington, D.C., all of the members of Congress might be among the millions of people unable to get home to our families along these federal interstates or to distance ourselves from the effects of the attack. Appreciate very much your consideration of this Thank amendment. Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. Any comments? No question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee, would you turn off that other mic? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm bringing to the table a lot of materials because I think sometimes this warrants a lot of materials. Um, and I thank the, uh, uh, the committee for its time. I have been listening to uh, a good portion of the testimony, uh, and I come to make uh, a few points, uh, particularly on the 9-11, uh, the underlying bill, uh, and as well, um, the reason why I think we should be here. Uh, one of the glaring um, sort of um, concepts that have come forward is that I think with all good intentions, uh, the underlying bill lacks focus. Uh, and if I've heard anything from the 9-11 families, which I met with earlier today, it is the uh, definitive desire and the urgency uh, to have some commitment to the findings of 9-11 Commission. I think when we look at the 9-11 uh, legislation, the underlying legislation and the lack of focus, uh, it results in both a waste of time and a waste of money. And if we could take the commission report uh, as evidenced by the Collins, Lieberman, McLean bill and the Shays, Mahoney bill, obviously on the Senate side we have no jurisdiction over that, and create an opportunity for an up or down uh, vote, we then at least answer the first question of the 9-11 families and that is of urgency. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'd like to just offer into the record um, some words that were spoken uh, in the first uh, chapter of the 9-11 commission report 
entitled, We Have Some Planes, and just read this language uh, that speaks about the date 9-11 and the time 8-19. Uh, the cockpit is not answering. Somebody stabbed uh, in business class, and I think there's mace that we can't breathe. I don't know. I think we're getting hijacked. She then told of the stabbings of the two flight attendants. In essence, from the terrible, tragic day and the planes and the individuals who called, that was clearly uh, human intelligence, beginning to tell FAA and other law enforcement just what was happening. One of the failings of the legislation that is underlying, and the reason why I argue vigorously for the 9-11, uh, the Shays Maloney uh, bill, is the key factor that the 9-11 Commission speaks to, and that is the budgetary authority uh, for uh, the intelligence director. Uh, with no budgetary authority, the question is how can you fix the issue of human intelligence? How can you coordinate between the FBI, the CIA, and many other aspects of intelligence? And I heard my colleagues speak about the Army intelligence and the sensitivity of the Department of Defense. But the whole idea of the 9-11 Commission was to talk about uh, the bringing together of the intelligence families and the intelligence initiatives. That is not being done in the underlying bill. So in order to be true to our desires, true to the language that was here by someone who perished on 9-11, uh, the human intelligence that they provided by their cell phones. In order to be true to that, uh, I think that uh, we can do no less than have this bill, uh, the, nine, the Maloney bill, to have an up or down vote. Let me also speak to some elements of the underlying bill that create serious problems. And I need not repeat for the uh, Rules Committee because you've already heard that. Uh, the White House has vigorously opposed uh, the language that deals with torture and, in fact, in talking to one of the 9-11 families, they said, we don't want to hurt anyone. We simply want terrorism to stop. And as we know, we have already been targeted for a terrorist act, some tragic, devastating act to occur before November 2, 2004. Why have a divisive debate when we can have a unified debate in adopting uh, the legislation that brings about the greatest unity? And so one legislative initiative or one provision in that bill is, of course, the violation of the Convention Against Torture by talking about deporting individuals to countries that torture, rather than relying upon existing law that says that if you cannot deport them to the country that, you're, uh, that uh, is uh, with torturous activities, you can deport them elsewhere. Why would we eliminate uh, the right to a Civil Liberties Oversight Board? Um, again, an amendment that was put in by a bipartisan amendment by Mr. Sensenbrenner and uh, Mr. Watt. Now I understand that it has been eliminated, and I would argue for the reinstatement of that language. Uh, the driver's license issue is definitely controversial, and we have indication, and if I might submit this into the record, um, an article by the Washington Times that suggests that, uh, that um, in particular, a name, Rosemary Jinks, a lobbyist, who indicates in an article that the White House has argued against miscellaneous immigration provisions that are in this bill. I don't call immigration issues miscellaneous, but I do believe that we can have a secure driver's license uh, criteria, because driver's licenses are left to the state. But to federalize it raises a very controversial question, and it requires more thought and more consideration. The 9-11 bill, as authored by Shays and Maloney, is strictly confined to the issues concerned by the families and what we need to do immediately, fix the intelligence system along with uh, many other aspects. Uh, additionally, um, we had in the Judiciary Committee, where we had oversight, the whole question of criminal uh, background checks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, none of us have any concern in making sure that security officers are secure. But we do have concern about the violation of the Attorney General uh, violating the privacy rights or rights of others without the right kind of oversight of the criminal background checks of randomly of Americans across the nation. Uh, just as there is bipartisan opposition to the Patriot Act, there is bipartisan opposition to the invasion of one's privacy. None of those red herrings uh, will be um, part of the debate. Uh, if we eliminate uh, the underlying bill or allow, if you will, a substitute uh, to be put forward, and that is to debate uh, the Shays Mahoney, uh, Maloney bill and to, as well, uh, allow that to have an up or down vote. I sort of agree with um, my distinguished colleague from uh, Massachusetts that we would uh, might have a victory on that because there are many Republicans who understand the urgency of moving forward. Uh, the last point that I would simply like to make 
uh, and that is one that I hope we can have enough courage to step away. Uh, there was a resounding vote in the election of 2002 that gave great joy to uh, my good friends uh, on the other side of the aisle, uh, Mr. Chairman and Republicans, your leadership, uh, and that was the creation of the Homeland Security Department. I think the Democrats were right. And I think if we were able to argue our point in a more um, uh, discerning and detailed manner, uh, many would understand why we would take away basic civil service rights from employees of the Homeland Security Department that might be secretaries and others. Um, but that vote uh, caused uh, a number of losses on the Democratic column side, if we talk about, uh, if we're speaking about politics, including one very famous patriot, and that is Senator Max Cleland. Uh, I would argue that none of us benefited uh, from that debate because there was uh, great merit uh, in providing the civil service uh, protection. Let us not do that this time only because um, the issue this time draws more bipartisan support and it's very clear. We all want to fix the failing intelligence system. We all realize that human intelligence is vital. If human intelligence is vital, then the bill that should be allowed to be debated and voted has to be uh, the 9-11 Commission report as evidenced by the Shades uh, Maloney legislation. I'd ask, and let me just uh, say this, I have amendments. I'm asking for those amendments to be withdrawn. I'm putting my full support behind uh, the uh, Shades uh, Maloney uh, legislation. I did offer the Convention Against Torture Amendment uh, in judiciary, soundly defeated. I'm now delighted to be vindicated by the White House counsel, Mr. Gonzalez, along with the White House and the President on both the immigration issues and the Convention Against Torture. And if uh, all fails, I certainly hope that because of our values that we would at least uh, have an amendment, uh, which would not be mine, I understand one has been offered, uh, that uh, would uh, restore our dignity and not deport people to places where they'd be tortured. My last comment is I ask that you support the submission of the Shays Maloney for a substitute uh, as an amendment uh, in our process. And I uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Putnam. Uh, my amendment to H.R. Uh, 10 will revise and consolidate two federal criminal law statutes into one comprehensive statute that deters and punishes terrorist acts against railroad carriers and mass transportation providers. It is important to note that last Friday, Senator Sessions proposed and, and it's under consideration the same type of uh, railroad carriers and mass transportation legislation in the Senate. For over a year, and especially since the Madrid terrorist train bombings, I've been working diligently with the Departments of Justice and Transportation, the Federal Railroad Administration, the Judiciary Committee, the Transportation and Infrastructure Rail Subcommittee, the Association of American Railroads, the Freight Railroads, Amtrak, and others to improve the federal criminal statutes that are used to persecute or prosecute terrorists. Under current law, terrorist acts are prosecuted under a um, USC 1992, which was enacted in 1940, called the Wrecking Train Statute. And in many ways, it's uh, outdated, full of gaps and inconsistencies. <coughs> Additionally, the September 11th attacks on our homeland gave impetus to a creation of another statute, uh, USC 8, 1993, which covers terrorist acts against mass transportation systems. My amendment, which is taken from legislation that I introduced earlier, consolidates these two statutes. And just briefly, it reduces the federal criminal law's vulnerability to legal challenges and techni technicalities. It also prevents prosecutors from having to prosecute for lesser offenses because of discrepancies and gaps in the current law. The amendment will bring more consistency and uniformity to all modes of, rail trans of railroad carriers and mass transportation providers. My amendment will expand the jurisdictional reach of federal criminal law to cover more offenses and more property if the, con if the conduct affects interstate commerce or travel, communicating or transporting materials across state lines. My amendment will also make the death penalty an option under aggravating circumstances that involve terrorist acts that result in death. And additionally, my amendment will protect all law enforcement, railroad carriers, and mass transportation providers from criminal liability in the course of lawful or authorized activities. Uh, the Congress has taken dramatic steps to improve our security both here and abroad, but there's more work to be done, particularly in this area, and I respectfully and strongly urge that you make this amendment in order. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Platts. Welcome. You have a prepared statement. We'll be happy to make it part of the record and welcome a summary. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Putnam. Um, I'm uh, glad to be here on behalf of myself and Chairman Davis in offering a joint amendment. Uh, it deals with the financial management of the new National Intelligence uh, Director's Office. Um, my subcommittee, which I chair, Government Efficiency and Financial Management, spent the last two years focusing on the financial management policies of our various departments and agencies. And a common theme in all of our hearings was the better the financial management, the better the day-to-day -day operation of that department or agency, and thus the better they're able to fulfill the mission, whether it's defense of our nation, the exploration of space, the provision of health care, uh, Medicare, Social Security payments. Uh, what my amendment does, uh, along with Chairman Davis, uh, su his support is to create a deputy a NID for finance who would focus specifically on the financial management of the NID. Uh, it's certainly a less exciting uh, issue maybe, but a critically important. Um, what we've learned in the past is uh, most of our departments and agencies uh, after many years or decades of operation, learn from the private sector the importance of a strong financial manager, and they play catch up. And what I'm seeking to do is ensure that we don't have to play catch up, but up front have that strong team in place. Uh, quickly, I'll, I'll share a quote when uh, NSA, just a few years back, added a new financial manage management officer to their operation. Uh, the um, director of NSA, Lieutenant General Hayden's words were the establishment of a chief financial manager's uh, office was necessary because NSA was, quote, making decisions that were more based on intuition and instinct rather than hard fiscal data, um, seeking to ensure that we don't have to play catch up as NSA was, but up front have the NID uh, as it's going to oversee billions of dollars uh, do right by taxpayers and most importantly allow our intelligence community to uh, fulfill its day-to-day -day mission of uh, good intelligence gathering. So, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Menendez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today on behalf of the House Democratic leadership. And I'm here to discuss uh, the most serious and important topic that is facing our nation. How do we respond to the unanimous bipartisan recommendations of the 9-11 Commission in protecting this nation and helping to prevent future attacks from occurring? Uh, I believe as a Democrat, and even more importantly as an American, that on the matter of our homeland security and intelligence reform, uh, this is not about acting as Democrats or Republicans, that uh, this is about acting as Americans and patriots. I also believe that this patriotism should come through an open, transparent, and deliberative process in the greatest democratic institution in the world, the House of Representatives, on the single most critical issue that a government is called upon to perform, perform on behalf of its people, which is its national security. If done properly, this bill that we will consider later this week presents a golden opportunity for us to do that, which is necessary to secure the American people. The unanimous bipartisan 9-11 Commission's recommendations, which were approved unanimously, were for sweeping changes to our government, our intelligence community, and how oversight is provided by Congress. The Commission told the American people and those of us in Congress that the time to act is now and that failing to act now could have disastrous consequences. That's why the 9-11 commissioners and organizations that represent the 9-11 families, such as the Family Steering Committee for the 9-11 Commission, all support the McCain-Lieberman-Collins legislation that my substitute embodies, and that in essence is what I'm asking the committee to support, giving the House Democrats a substitute, which is the McCain-Lieberman-Collins legislation, having an open rule that permits for a full and fair and free debate uh, on the most significant issue that the Congress can decide and that the government can respond to in, in terms of securing the nation. This would provide a foundation that is not only supported by the 9-11 families and 9-11 commissioners, but by a significant bipartisan majority of the United States Senate. By using this as the foundation under which we conduct this debate, we would ensure a fair, open, and deliberative process. Unfortunately, the House Republican Bill, H.R. 10, leaves out many of those bipartisan recommendations of the 9-11 Commission, 
In fact, out of the 41 recommendations, it appears that only 11 are implemented, 16 are not implemented at all, and 14 others are done so incompletely. H.R. 10 also includes provisions that are unnecessary and unrelated to the bill's stated purpose, which is a reorganization of the intelligence community aimed at strengthening the nation against terrorist attack. In doing so, these provisions go well beyond the 9-11 Commission's recommendations. I believe that Democrats have to be allowed to offer an alternative plan in a meaningful way, not as a procedural motion to recommit, but as a substitute on which we can see who supports the 9-11 Commission's recommendations and who does not. We go halfway around the world to bring democracy to Iraq, yet will we stifle democracy right here in the People's House? What lessons would we send to all those who seek to spread the, bene we seek to spread the benefits of democracy to? That action, short of allowing us an open rule and this process for a substitute, I think would defile this bastion of democracy. It's too important of an issue to be playing politics with. So it's my hope that the Rules Committee will see the wisdom of allowing free and open debate in the House of Representatives on how we can best secure the American people. It is my hope that the Rules Committee will make my substitute in order and will allow an open rule to ensure that amendments can be offered and debated to work in a truly bipartisan way. We have spent a lot of time, Mr. Chairman, on naming post offices. It's time we spend all the time necessary to protect America. I'll close by simply saying to me, this is a personal issue. I lost 122 of my fellow citizens on September 11th. My district is right across from Midtown Manhattan. And I went to too many memorial services to undermine the efforts of what needs to be done in terms of reforming the nation's intelligence and the national security of this country. I'm not about to go to any of those families or to any other American and tell them that we went through a process that instead of strengthening America's security, potentially weakened it. A process that was political versus patriotic. A process that left us less secure than we should be. And I think that there is a real consequence to offering legislation that ultimately appears to try to do something but that about homeland security, but that leaves us far short of where the 9-11 Commission and the families who have suffered the greatest losses have come together and said, this is the way in which the nation is best served. Instead, the People's House needs to serve this nation well. On this one issue, we need to put partisanship aside. We need an open rule that allows full debate and amendment. And we need the bipartisan McCain-Lieberman columns combined legislation as the basis of which we conduct this debate and process. That's what I hope you'll do, Mr. Chairman, with the committee. That's what the Democratic leadership is asking you to do. And I think ultimately that's what would be in the best interest of our country as we debate this single most important issue that we will face as a Congress in terms of protecting the American people. Thank you, and I have Thank been, uh, you. happy to answer any questions. Mr. Hastings? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Flake, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I am offering an amendment to create an, an intelligence community language and education officer within the National Intelligence Director um, in H.R. 10. You may recall that uh, in the intelligence authorization for FY05, we actually created such an office for the CIA before uh, we considered this legislation. In this legislation, we have a sense of the Congress that such an office or an o a similar office be created, uh, but we didn't go so far as to create the office. Uh, I think that we should. Uh, we know that there is a huge backlog in terms of uh, material to be translated, transcripts. Uh, we know that we need more translators. I if uh, the intelligence community saw this as an issue years ago, or if they had seen fit to create such an office and look for every opportunity to have uh, more language specialists, we may, might not be in this predicament that we're in. Uh, the Inspector General released a report just recently. There are hundreds of thousands of hours of untranslated audio recordings from terror, terror and, exp and espionage uh, investigations. And uh, we simply need to deal with this on an ongoing basis to make sure that we have the language specialists that we need uh, to gather intelligence. And I think that that can be done best by having an office uh, for that purpose. Uh, that's what this language does. Thank you. Mr. Hastings? Mr. McGovern? I didn't, I'm sorry I'm late, but I got the end of your testimony, uh, and we were talking about this issue a little bit earlier, and I, I'm not 
uh, and, and I'm glad you brought your amendment before us because, to the best of my knowledge, H.R. 10 doesn't even deal with the issue you're talking about. It, it, there is in H.R. 10 a sense of the Congress that particular attention be paid right, to this which is, issue, which is, no which is not dealing with it, in my opinion, which is just kind of rhetoric. So That's I appreciate your being here. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Putnam, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Markey. Welcome. Chairman, I'm here to, uh... Mr. Chairman, I am here to request an open rule. Uh, this is the most important piece of legislation which will come before this Congress. Uh, this is a debate which has raged across the United States of America uh, since September 11th of 2001. Uh, in my own district, uh, 17 families in Framingham, Massachusetts, in my district, lost people on that day. Uh, people forget about the people who were on those two flights that were hijacked from Logan Airport. Uh, those families want the full commission report implemented as law. And they have asked me to come here to tell you, Mr. Chairman, that they want a vote on the House floor on the full recommendation uh, of the 911 commission. And that, those 17 families are just 17 of the 170 families in Massachusetts who lost people on that day. Now, I realize that this is just a system that's been shut down, that we're not going to have an open debate, that this committee is not going to allow for uh, a full debate on all of those commission reports. I think it's a historic mistake for this committee. I understand it's in keeping with the last 10 years of control by the Republicans of this um, committee, uh, that we will not have an open rule, that we will not have a full debate on this issue. But I will tell you this, this is why um, uh, the people in our country uh, are uh, getting upset with this process. Uh, they expect democracy to work, if in no other instances, at least when we're responding to what happened to our country on 9-11. To the people who got on those planes at Logan Airport, to those families in New York City and Washington, D.C., those who died in Pennsylvania, they have a right to this vote. It's their right to this vote that's going to be denied. And I just think it's wrong that they're not going to be given that opportunity. You can just smell it here. It's just wrong. Now, in addition, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to make a number of other amendments under an open rule. Number one would have been to ex to take out of this bill the provision which is going to allow the United States of America to send prisoners who, which we capture to other countries which do, in fact, allow torture. That is wrong, Mr. Chairman. That the provision in this bill which allows the United States of America to, allow, to send prisoners to other countries that engage in torture would result in us being viewed by the rest of the world, especially the Muslim world, of trying to preach temperance from a bar stool. We cannot be an example to the rest of the world if we allow torture to be outsourced. We won't do it, but we'll outsource it to other countries. It has to be ended, and this bill does not make that possible, and we have a right to have that full debate on the House floor. Secondly, I wanted to make an amendment under an open rule in order to ensure that we inspect all cargo that goes on passenger planes and on cargo planes in the United States. More than three years later, every American that flies on passenger planes, who takes off their shoes, has their computer inspected, has their bags inspected, is, are still flying on planes where the cargo on that plane is not inspected. And we know that at Lockerbie and these other instances, that that's how the plane went up in flames. And it is wrong to put American families this late uh, after 9-11 in those kinds of a situation. Thirdly, under an open rule, I had an intention of making amendments that would give full whistleblower protection to all federal government employees who warn their superiors and other appropriate authorities of significant problems that need credible uh, attention inside of our federal government. Where did that recommendation come from? It came from Colleen Rowley, the FBI whistleblower in Minnesota, who wrote the memo warning about the 20th hijacker, warning that something was happening in our country. In the, uh, in the uh, 
creation of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the new Department of Homeland uh, Security, uh, we actually exempted uh, these employees from full whistleblower protection. Of all the employees in the United States who need protection, three years after 9/11, it is the employees who are re who are uh, responsible for the protection of the security of the American people. I will not be able to make that amendment unless we have an open rule. And finally, in the Judiciary Committee, Mr. Nadler made my amendment, which. Uh, ensures full protection of nuclear power plants and chemical plants in the United States of America. That amendment was adopted in the Judiciary Committee last week. In this bill, the language has been taken out. As a, re as a result, there will be no requirement on the part of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to put in place a new rulemaking that guarantees the maximum amount of security around nuclear power plants against a terrorist attack. And we know from all Al-Qaeda documents that nuclear power plants are at the top of the terrorist target list. And three years later, this administration still refuses to have a permanent rulemaking. And the other part of that amendment, which was adopted in the Judiciary Committee, which has now been excluded, which was my amendment made by Mr. Nadler, was a, re a requirement that the federal government put in place a new set of standards for the protection of chemical plants in the United States against terrorist attack. There has still not been a standard unbelievably established in our country for the chemical industry uh, against uh, a terrorist attack. My amendment would finally have the Congress vote on that issue. And unless there is an open rule, we will not have that debate. The American people deserve an open rule. If there's no other bill this year or in the past 10 years that this committee grants an open rule to, to have the free uh, 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 and open debate uh, that, uh, that the people of the United States expect, this is the bill. So that is my request to you, Mr. Chairman, that we have the open rule, that we take as many days as it takes uh, so that the American people know how this Congress feels about these key provisions. And I thank you for the opportunity of appearing thank before you. you. Mr. Hastings. Mr. McGovern. I want to thank my colleague from Massachusetts for, for being here. And um, I should tell him that um, Chairman Hyde of the International Relations Committee here was here earlier today and talked about the outsourcing of torture issue just like you did. He says he doesn't like it, that it's part of the bill uh, and would like to see it gone. I mean, he, he's the chairman of the International Relations Committee. So, I mean, I think a lot of people, as they find out what some of these extraneous measures are that are being added here, um, are going to be horrified to learn uh, the implications of, of some of these things. Um, I mean, we, you know, this should be an open rule. You're absolutely right. I mean, this is the most important bill that we have dealt with. The American people expect us to get this right. I mean, we mess everything else up. They want us to get this thing right. This is about protecting them, about protecting our country. Um, and, um, and the way this whole bill has been put together, I mean, H.R. 10, I mean, listening to both chairman and ranking members from various committees come before here, uh, all day today. I mean, a lot of them said they, you know, we worked in a bipartisan way in our committee and we had some great ideas, but guess what? Someone in a locked room last night went together and, and took things out and, and pasted things together and, um, and took out some things that a lot of people in a bipartisan way thought was a good thing. I mean, ideally, you want a bill that will get almost a unanimous vote. I mean, that's what we want here. Um, and we, we could have done that. I mean, after September 11th, we kind of met together in a bipartisan way, and we tried to, you know, deal with the immediate issues in a bipartisan way. That was the right thing to do. Now, all of a sudden, that's all gone. There's no more bipartisanship uh, here. And I think it would be, it will be a shame um, if the Rules Committee doesn't allow, allow for an open rule, or at a minimum, an up or down vote on the uh, Sh Maloney Shays bill or the uh, Collins Lieberman bill. Um, but you know what? Um, What's really tragic about the Rules Committee is that um, it is routinely being used as a weapon to stifle debate um, at the request of the leadership. And on something like this, something this, that, this important, it's lousy. Um, and so I, um, you, you know, we're gonna we're gonna call for a roll call vote here on an open rule and, and all the other uh, amendments. But uh, um, I wouldn't hold my breath for an open rule because they want to pass this quick and they want to get out and issue their press release, and that's that. Um, and which is tragic, because this is too important. So I thank the gentleman for being here. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. I thank the gentleman. How absurd is it that the Democrats only receive a bill that is going to redefine security in the United States um, in, on the day, within 24 hours? 
uh, of, um, of the debate beginning on that bill. It is almost as though the Republicans have decided to disenfranchise half of the country, as though this was a Democrat or Republican right. issue, as you're saying, right. with regard to how our country should be protected against Al Qaeda. And this is exactly what we've been talking about. Our country is not safe. It is not safe against a terrorist attack. This bill excludes new standards for chemical plants in America against Al Qaeda attack. It excludes new standards for nuclear power plants in our country from Al Qaeda attack. And it says at the same time that after we capture someone, that we can send them to Syria to be tortured right. in violation of the Geneva Convention. The message that we're sending to the rest of the world is absolutely dangerous. And it, even as we're ignoring the places in our country where we know Al Qaeda says they want to attack, they hijack planes. We're still not going to have cargo on those passenger plane screens. Nuclear plants, chemical plants, not protected. We don't uh, give any whistleblower protection to people inside of the FBI or the CIA who in good conscience might step forward and say that they know that there's a flaw in our security. As a matter of fact, they get received no protection and they can be ostracized, punished forever. Now just think about how the history of this country would have been different if people inside the intelligence community felt honestly that they could have stepped forward and said, there is no uranium in Iraq. There are no nuclear weapons in Iraq. There is no chemical and biological weapon in, New York, in, in Iraq. There is no reason to send in 150,000 young American men and women. But the fear, the fear of retaliation is so great that the whistleblowers must sit in silence. And we cannot have silence where, where superiors inside the Bush administration encourage a code of omerta uh, amongst employees that winds up endangering the entire country. And so that's why this whole process is almost a metaphor for what's going on in our country where the Democrats are not going to, going to be allowed to make amendments to make the country more secure. And I'm here more than for any other reason because of all the funerals that I had to go to in my own district and on behalf of these families who have asked me to come here to ask for an open rule and to ask for a vote on the substitute so that we can have once and for all a reckoning of who does want all these amendments put in place. And I thank you I thank the gentleman. for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Pittman, thank you. Mr. Obi and Mr. Sable, please join us. Doc. Doc. Gentlemen, uh, your full uh, sta prepared statement without objection will appear in the record. I know Mr. Obi never has one, but nevertheless, we like to say those things so that we are on record. So, uh, and same with you, uh, Mr. Sable. So, uh, gentlemen. Thank you, Chair. Um, let me be very clear. I oppose the Senate bill. I think the Senate bill is a huge mistake. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. We have two intelligence problems in this country that need correcting. The first is that we couldn't stop 9-11. The second is that we couldn't stop a stupid war in Iraq. The problem is that what you do to fix the first problem is very different than what you do to fix the second problem. And no attention whatsoever is being given in any of these bills to how you fix the second problem. And I think if we don't deal with both problems, we are derelict in our responsibility to every single American citizen. Now, I'm, ha I'm happy to hear people testify that they want an open rule, and under that open rule, they would at least be able to get a vote on the Senate product, because I think they ought to be able to do so. Because the one and only thing that the Senate product has going for it, in my view, is that at least it was subject to a bipartisan operation which put together a bipartisan set of recommendations, even though I think they're wrong. But having said that, 
I think that the bill, which, which is serving as the core for what we will consider on the floor tomorrow, I think the bill brought to us by the Republican leadership is an abomination. I think it is a betrayal of every person who died in 9-11, uh, in, in and I think, it is a, I, I think it is a rape of the legislative process of the worst order. It has been put together on a political fashion, unilaterally, with no genuine dealing across the aisle, leadership to leadership, so that we could fashion a bill which is truly worthy of what this institution is supposed to uh, be all about. The <clears throat> Uh, this bill, uh, and so therefore what I'm asking you to do is to report no rule, because this is the height of the political season, and in my judgment, what will occur tomorrow on the floor will largely, unfortunately, be a political debate. It will not be a substantive debate because the very rule that is being contemplated by the Republican leadership of this House will preclude our having an intelligent substantive debate. And I think that uh, under the circumstances, the country would be far better off if we didn't have politicians posing for political holy pictures on this issue before the election. All that's going to happen if this committee reports out any rule is that you're going to go to the floor. The House is going to establish one position, which is very different from the Senate position. You won't get anything done before the election, but each House will be able to pretend that it's done something. And the result will be that when we come back after the election, uh, again, some deal will be made in a back room somewhere in conference. And the average member of the House in both parties will be cut out from the process they will not be able to offer their amendments. The amendment that uh, Mr. Flake was just talking about, for instance, perfectly reasonable that he should be able to, to, to offer that. Uh, I just think this Rules Committee will be doing an immense disservice to the country if under, its circumstance, under these circumstances it reports any rule. We need to think through what we do. What we do on this subject will last the country a long, long time. It's been over almost 50 years since we reorganized in a basic way, the basic way this country does intelligence. And I think if we're going to do it, uh, we ought to do it right. And the chances of this institution, the way this institution is run by this leadership, the way this rule is being contemplated by this Republican leadership, it demonstrates that there is virtually no chance that this issue is going to be handled in a way which is consistent with democratic and American values. And in addition to the mistakes uh, uh, of process, this bill has a laundry list of items that are extraneous to the core problems facing us in intelligence. It will get us involved in another ideological debate on the Patriot Act, and it will, it will uh, uh, do such gross abomination, uh, or provide such gross abominations, for instance, as, uh, as uh, allowing this country to be complicit in the torture of human beings, uh, all the while pretending that we have nothing to do with it. It's a moral disgrace. It's a substantive mistake. And I believe that neither bill should be, uh, should be brought to the floor unless you're willing to postpone the uh, congressional adjournment and spend the next two or three weeks with members being able to, work, to, to offer whatever they think in conscience will improve this terrible product. Thank you, uh, Mr. Obi. Mr. Sabo, and if you'd press on your uh, button there. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good to be with you again. I share the view that we make a terrible mistake by rushing for quick action on the intelligence change. I think we're dealing with one of the most fundamentally important issues for the future safety of this country. I serve as ranking Democrat on Homeland Security of Appropriations Committee. Uh, and uh, we spend lots of time uh, doing things that are important. But what we do is, uh, uh, in many ways, so much less important in terms of determining whether we are subject to attack in the future than what happens with the intelligence we get and our capacity to respond to that intelligence. Unless we're careful, we're going to make some very serious mistakes. 
I find the basic recommendations of the Commission uh, being one that adds bureaucracy on bu top of bureaucracy, makes significant changes in how we handle budgets. My observation that the Operations Department of Homeland Security is that we have spent an incredible amount of time shuffling boxes, trying to figure out where money is. Money is lost, uh, reshuffling how you do budgets. Uh, incredible amount of time simply going into administrative detail and headache rather than focusing on the problems. Can't afford to do that with intelligence. I think it leaves unclear who's in charge of people. Uh, I think uh, the basic structure as recommended by the Commission is going to create a, a system where personnel, major personnel, do not know who they're responsible to. And it makes a very fundamental change in our country. For years, we have separated the administration, the organization running foreign intelligence with domestic intelligence. I think there has been broad support for that separation across political ideological lines. Clearly, where we're headed with these bills changes that separation. I think we should take a moment or two to think about it before we rush to do it. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, I, I share the concerns about the additions to this bill as it, as, it, uh, as it proceeds and the things have been added in the House. Now, I just think that uh, a month before the election, politics is going to govern to the utmost what we do or don't do in terms of posturing on this bill. Okay. And I just think it's too important to rush through in a hurried fashion, a few weeks before an election. It is an incredibly important issue. We should take some time. We should think about it. And I would recommend to this committee consider the judgment of people like John Hamry and Bill Cohn and Mr. Carlucci and a whole series of other folks who, who, who have had extensive experience in national security in this country who, who have recommended to us to take our, take our time think a little bit about this, not push it off uh, forever, but take our time, think about it, and look at some of the basic core recommendations of it's the Commission to see if that's really where we want to go. And thank Mr. you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I just want to buttress one thing that the gentleman from Minnesota said. We're about to do the same thing here that we did with Homeland Security, and here's what we did on Homeland Security. We had a huge number of agencies that had something to do with Homeland Security. What we essentially did was to take a small portion of those agencies, about 22 of them, we put them together in an, in an agency called Homeland Security. We left the vast majority of agencies outside the tent, including the CIA and the FBI. We reshuffled those boxes, called it a Homeland Security agency, and created absolute chaos. Today, that agency is in shambles. Today, one-third of the key positions in the in Homeland Security Agency are still unfilled, and one-quarter of those that are filled are filled with political appointees. That's why the, that agency is in such a mess. It still doesn't even have a phone directory. People don't know who to contact if they, if they want to help solve a problem. And I don't want to do the same thing with our intelligence operations. Secondly, with respect to the Senate bill. I've had some harsh words to say about the leadership bill. With respect to the Senate bill, um, the problem we have, <clears throat> and I think you have both uh, people in both parties who want to do this, the problem we have is that people are saying, well, we've got to unify the voice of the intelligence community uh, and put everybody under one person. The problem with that is that I think that the major failure on 9-11 and the failure uh, in terms of keeping us out of uh, 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 what I consider to be a dumb war was the National Security Council. I think they had a massive failure of leadership in that agency. It is a huge mistake if we unify the intelligence community to such a degree that the president can't hear dissenting voices within the intelligence community. And that, in my view, is what uh, is likely to happen if we proceed uh, before the election. So I would urge, uh, as Mr. Sable says, I would urge that uh, uh, on
unless we're going to postpone uh, our getting out of here so we can give this subject the time that it deserves, I would urge us not to proceed until after the election because otherwise what you're going to get is a political result and a substantive nightmare. Well, thank you very much, and I, I appreciate uh, your testimony. Uh, both of you have uh, uh, been around this town for a while, and, and certainly what you say is, uh, is, is very important and, and, and should be looked at. I would just make this observation because this is an election year. Thank goodness we have election years. Every four years we elect a chief executive and every two years we re-elect this house and, and as you know, one third of the other body. The 9-11 commission was a product of both of both houses of the Congress and then uh, they made their recommendations. Uh, and, and, I, and I think the recommendations they made because the make of that, up of that committee was probably better than what some people had anticipated after we'd gone through the process. I think there, I think there probably could have been some uh, observations that it was getting pretty political when it first started, but I think maybe it got its sea legs and it came out with something that we should really look at very seriously. But as I mentioned, this is an election year, and I think what happened, unfortunately, is no sooner was the ink dry uh, than there were those that were saying, we need to adopt this in total right now. Uh, and, and, and part of the reaction, and, and let's face it, we're elected officials, we reacted to that. The, the, by the way, the report came out, as you know, the day that we were scheduled to recess for the August recess. That's, that was a schedule that was put in place way back when. That, that wasn't going to change because plans that people have made on both sides of, of the aisle. Uh, but unprecedented during August, the Speaker called back uh, the various committees that had jurisdiction uh, for hearings on this. Uh, I only make this uh, observation is because um, uh, it, it, uh, when those, I think, that were saying immediately adopt 9-11 before the ink was dry was engaging in some uh, political aspect during this, uh, during this political season. So we have commenced to, to this point. Uh, uh, obviously, there are differences of opinion. You're going to have differences of opinion on something as, uh, as large as this. But uh, I think uh, that, that uh, the testimony uh, that has been given today. A number of people said we, we need to act, and I think that's, uh, that's probably the bottom line out of all this. But I, I appreciate uh, uh, this, as, as one member, certainly hearing what, uh, what you had to say with your, uh, with your misgivings on this. I'd be more than happy to let either of you respond. Well, I guess I'd just say uh, if – I'll just repeat what I said to the President and the Vice President was at the White House. Uh, it's important that we do this right, and we ought to be able to do this in a nonpartisan way. I think both of these bills are absolutely wrong-headed in the way they go, and I think we will deeply regret it if we pass either of these bills. Um, and I think the best way to make certain that substance is, uh, uh, triumphs over politics is to consider it in any other period except the most political period of the year. So, so that's that's. All I can say, Mr. Chairman, it's uh, uh, if we proceed, the Senate's going to pass its bill, the House is going to pass its bill. Neither of these bills uh, is, in my view, uh, uh, faithful to what our core responsibilities are in meeting the real problems. The Senate bill only deals with one half of our problem, and the House bill has so many extraneous and controversial positions that I think it's, uh, it's going to drag us into all kinds of ancillary issues and uh, we ought to be focusing on the core issues that, uh, that caused 9-11 and caused us to uh, get bad information and act on bad information when we got into the Iraqi war. Mr. Stables. Mr. Chairman, I, I, all I can say is my reaction. I, I, as a member, uh, we got the commission report. I think the commission did lots of good work. I think their history is incredibly important. And like so many things, uh, we deem some wisdom to a collection called Commission, which is a collection of, in this case, 10 individuals who worked very hard and made my, uh, many recommendations. My initial reaction was that, boy, these folks are making some very fundamental change to how we've operated. And what struck me initially was the, the melding of foreign and domestic intelligence, uh, which uh, goes contrary to where we've been for, for decades in this country. I think. Uh, you know, in my amazement, I'm listening on Saturday flipping channels, and I hear Henry Kissinger, and I find uh, 
he's uh, has the same uh, concern, and I, I didn't expect myself to be uh, uh, <laughs> reacting to what I was going to hear from uh, uh, former Secretary Kissinger in that fashion. And I look and see it's the chain, same concern of folks like John Hamry and Mr. Carlucci and Mr. Cohen, uh, because it, 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 in many ways, uh, while we quarrel about some of the specific legislation, I think it's potentially, potentially real danger for how we handle law enforcement in this country for the future. And, we, uh, I, and what concerned me, I didn't even hear the issue raised by people. And I still do don't hear it raised by many people, just a handful of people. And, and I just think it's a very fundamental change that we should take some time to think about. And I don't think that's occurring. We're in this rush to do something because an election is close by. I just think we're going to do some things we're going to regret. Years from now, we're going to look back and say, boy, that was foolish what we did. Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, diaz No question. Thank you, Mr. Mr. McGovern. <coughs> I want to thank you both for being here. I mean, I think people can disagree about uh, what recommendations uh, to implement and what recommendations not to implement uh, in the 9-11 Commission report. But I think to me, to me today what is most disturbing is the process. Um, I mean, we are, we're dealing with a bill, H.R. 10, that was once 300 pages, then all of a sudden became 600 pages because some people in the Speaker's office put it all together. And, you know, we, we know there's all these extraneous things that have been added, but, you know, we'll keep on digging and you'll find more. And if this indeed is important, when everyone says this is important, this is the most important bill that we're, we're going to be confronted with, uh, you know, this session, then this is not the way you do it. I mean, this is just not the way you do it. Every member should have the opportunity and their staffs to go over it with a fine-tooth comb to make sure they know what's, what they're voting on. Um, you know, there should be more debate time. I mean, rather than crunching it into a day or even two days, I mean, let there be an open process. Let let the process work its work its way. I mean, this is if this is that important, um, and I agree with you. I mean, I, I think we're, we're doing this right now. Um, you know, we could have had that open process probably earlier. I mean, but we were too busy passing court stripping bills and constitutional amendments and you know other such junk. Quite frankly, that was on the House floor. But instead, here we are. Last week, we got to go. The deadline is we're going to get out of here Friday. And we're going to try to we're going to try to move this. This is unconscionable. This is the wrong way to do it. Um, you know, I, I think those who are advocating for an open process are doing so because I think they figure that at least that's, you know, they'll have an opportunity to express themselves. But guess what? They ain't going to get an open process. There's no way that this will be an open rule. Um, it's unclear what, what, the, what, what, if anything, they'll allow. Um, this is not the way to do it. This really isn't. And it's too important to get it wrong. We got one sh shot at this to get it right. And we should do it so we can be proud of it, not only the day we issue our press release, but a year from now, two years from now, and 10 years from now. So I thank you very much. I've noticed a lots of, uh, in what in my judgment, political uh, posturing going on on activity on the House floor. Uh, fortunately, most of it, uh, while it's posturing, uh, is over things which isn't going to become law. In this case, I'm afraid we're posturing over something which may become law. I'd also say I think the process by which this bill is going to be produced is subversive of everything we are supposed to stand for. <clears throat> we are telling the world we're going to bring democracy to Iraq. We are telling 435 people on the House floor, sorry, but your judgment, your wisdom, we're not interested. Uh, somehow some staffers in the Speaker's office no more than you do, and we're going to put together a package and you're going to vote on it 24 hours after uh, the paper has been produced. That's an incredibly uh, arrogant and destructive way to run this I mean, institution. We've, we've, we've had to today chairman and ranking members come up here and talk about bipartisan cooperation in their committees on certain parts of their bill, only to find that the bill that is now being produced does not have some of the good bipartisan <laughs> positive things in it that they thought would be there. Something's wrong. And I would say, while, I, while, I, while I, I am opposed to the bill, I think the Commission did a wonderful job in laying out what happened coming up to 9-11. I don't have as much confidence in their recommendations as I do their historical analysis. But at least 
it is a product which was subjected to a discipline which we have not seen in this house and i believe even though i even though i would vote against it i think that uh, that, that we ought to ha the house ought to have an ability to vote up or down on that package along with other key amendments that members want to offer i agree thank you gentlemen thank you very much uh, Chairman of the Ag Committee, Mr. Goodlatte. Uh, Mr. Chairman, your uh, full statement will, without objection will appear in the record and you're welcome to summarize. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have two amendments. Uh, the first one, uh, unless you have a preference, I'll take up is one that uh, deals with an amendment to HR 10 on pretrial detention of uh, terrorist suspects. The amendment would simply create a rebuttable presumption that no amount of bail or other conditions would assure the appearance in court of a defendant when he is charged with a terrorist offense and there is probable cause that the defendant committed certain terrorist acts. This presumption can be overcome by evidence that the defendant would appear. This presumption that a defendant will not show up in court already applies to those who are charged with major drug crimes and certain violent crimes. And if it's good enough for drug dealers and violent criminals, it is surely good enough for terrorists. It is simply too risky to trust terrorists who have been charged with terrorist offenses to return to court to be tried. We should not allow these criminals to roam free on our streets while they await trial. In addition, the amendment would help to prevent further terrorist acts by giving judges the discretion to impose up to lifetime supervision of terrorists who have been convicted of terrorist offenses. Currently, the law provides that only those who committed terrorist offenses which either resulted in or created a foreseeable risk of death could be supervised for a term of years up to life after being released. This amendment would make clear that post-trial supervision is available for all convicted terrorists, not just those terrorist acts that happen to result in death. This amendment only authorizes a court to oppose supervised release of a terrorist. It does not mandate any particular term of supervised release for any particular criminal. It leaves that decision up to the courts based on the facts and circumstances of each individual case. In addition, current law already gives courts the authority to modify or end the period of supervised release if the court determines that the criminal's conduct and the circumstances so warrant. This safeguard is not changed by this amendment. You want to hear both and then ask questions? Or you want to no, go, they're, go ahead. They're totally go ahead. unrelated. But right. uh, The other amendment uh, is an amendment to eliminate the visa lottery program. We've received a lot of support. Uh, from individuals who are concerned about uh, our national security. Uh, one of the 9-11 uh, families groups uh, has written to us in support of this amendment, and we would ask that that uh, letter be made a part of the record. Uh, the amendment would, would eliminate the controversial visa lottery program, which awards legal permanent resident status to foreign nationals based on pure luck. Each year, approximately 50,000 foreign nationals enter the country through the visa lottery program. Uh, as the 9-11 Commission report states, the challenge for national security in an age of terrorism is to prevent the very few people who may pose overwhelming risk from entering or remaining in the United States undetected. The report goes on to say that for terrorists, travel documents are as important as weapons. Terrorists use evasive methods such as altered and counterfeit passports and visas and immigration and identity fraud the visa lottery program creates a far greater threat than merely permitting terrorists to travel into the country. This program would grant terrorists legal permanent resident status. With this tool in hand, terrorists would be able to travel freely to meet and to plan terrorist activities within the borders of the United States. Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, any organization like that can, under this current program, submit the names of a hundred or more uh, individuals from uh, right out of the madrasas or whatever without any record of having uh, any kind of uh, involvement in terrorist activities. So we would not be able to check through any computer records or anything like that, uh, any indication of that. And uh, uh, we would um, uh, see people enter the country getting uh, not just a temporary visa, but green card, permanent resident status. Uh, this is a major Loophole, the State Department's Inspector General stated that the visa lottery program contains significant threats to national security 
from entry of hostile intelligence officers, criminals, and terrorists in the United States as permanent residents. A good example of this is the case of Hesham Mohammed uh, Hadayat, the Egyptian national who killed two and wounded three during, during a shooting spree at Los Angeles International Airport in July of 2002. He was allowed to apply for permanent resident status in 1997 because his wife's status as a visa lottery winner. Uh, in addition, this is a program that is uh, grossly unfair to citizens from many countries. For example, Mexico, the United Kingdom, the Philippines, India, uh, and about seven or eight other countries are not allowed to participate in this program. The visas are issued not based upon having any close family relationship, nor based upon having any specific job skill that's needed in the United States. You fill out about a half page uh, form, you do it online, uh, and uh, we admit 50,000 people uh, for no reason, and we actually discriminate against uh, countries that have some of our highest uh, levels of immigration into the United States who are on long waiting lists with family petitions, long waiting lists with employer petitions, and here people from other countries can simply put their name into a lottery, have it drawn out, and come into the United States. Uh, it poses not only a serious security risk, but it also is something that I think uh, discriminates against individuals from particular countries uh, and is simply unfair uh, to those people. But uh, perhaps most importantly, they have no tie to the United States that causes us to have a compelling interest to want to admit them to the country, such as through uh, family-related petitions or uh, employment-based petitions. Uh, I would urge uh, the committee to make this amendment in order. Uh, it is very much related to the concerns uh, that are addressed in the 9-11 Commission report uh, and has the support of, as I indicated earlier, at least one of the uh, groups of uh, uh, family members of the victims of September 11th. Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Diaz-Bellart. Mr. Frost. No questions. Mr. Goodlett, thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll call up uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, Michigan member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, and without objection, your full statement will appear in the record, and you're uh, welcome to summarize your statements. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, this one should be an easy one. I would urge uh, certainly its adoption. It has the support of uh, Chairman Davis. A letter is en route. Uh, we've created a, a bit of a problem for our agents who are uh, fighting the, the war on terrorism right here at home and all other criminal matters. You know, we often talk about reorganization and plans and those kind of things, and that's great. Uh, but any intelligence that we develop is through an expert, through technology, uh, or an individual talking to an individual. Uh, and those are our agents on the street who every day get up in the morning, strap it up, uh, and go out and try to find, uh, detect, and deter terrorism and other crimes around the country. Uh, as a young agent uh, assigned to the Chicago Division, uh, at the time uh, my, my wife was working, had we not been working, we would not have been able to uh, not only rent anywhere near the city, but purchase a home in the city of Chicago. Uh, and, and the prices there were, f at that time, considered fairly reasonable. Uh, a a GS-10 was not making a whole bunch of money. Matter of fact, I made less as a GS-10 than I did uh, as a lieutenant uh, in the first lieutenant promotable in the Army coming out. So it was a sacrifice for agents. Now you take a young family, uh, people who are coming into the Bureau, I think the median age now is 31 years old. So these are people who have uh, gone out and, and, and they've been teachers and they're doctors and they've got their advanced degrees, they're lawyers, uh, they are pretty bright people and we're trying to hire the best and the brightest for these positions because of what's at stake. You ask them to give up salary, which they willingly do, and nobody goes into this business for the, for the money. Uh, and then we do something kind of strange. We send them to these very high cost areas and don't compensate them for it. I'm going to just give you the list of these areas. Boston, uh, Chicago, Detroit, Hartford, Los Angeles, Anaheim, New York, Northern New Jersey, Philadelphia, Wilmington, Portland, Salem, Sacramento, San Diego, San Francisco, Oakland, uh, Seattle, Tacoma, Washington, Baltimore. Uh, and these agents are uh, really overwhelmed with the cost difference. I even tell you, you're excited when you're a new agent. You can't wait to do it. You've made the sacrifice. You've made it through the training. You've made it through the background investigation. You were selected out of a large number of people to do something that is just pretty impressive 
Uh, it's exciting. You don't mind taking the pay cut. You've got your spouse ginned up with you. And then that first bill comes when you move in Washington, D.C., or New York City, or San Diego, or San Francisco. And the reality comes crashing down on you. That's pretty tough. I want to read just a couple of these uh, to you. These are verbatims from agents who are struggling to make a difference. Some of these stood out to me. I've got tons of them, more than we should have. Uh, this was a GS-10 Step 2 assigned to San Francisco. I am seriously considering leaving the Bureau, uh, but I am waiting until uh, after I go off probation. I will try to get out of this division any way I can, specialty, hardship, uh, headquarters, any way possible. My morale is very low, strongly reflected by my inability to purchase or invest in property or my future savings in retirement. Uh, I pack my lunch every day. Eating out at a restaurant is non-existent. Uh, I have even considered purchasing a mobile home and driving it throughout the city. I figured if I stayed in it for about six to 12 months, uh, at least it would pay for itself uh, and I might be able to sell it. Uh, here's some for a GS-14 in Newark, New Jersey. So this is an agent that's been around for about uh, 16 years. Uh, my morale is great. I love the job. However, I am tired of the long days and long commutes to the office. Most embarrassing for me, after working 16 years in the FBI, uh, after I had to borrow $20,000 from close relatives just to be able to purchase a house in commuting distance uh, to the Newark division. Uh, there are agents in New York uh, who have about a four-hour commute plus mandatory 10-hour shifts, which means in the Bureau you're working longer than 10-hour shifts. So they're driving two hours in, two hours at night. They've got these 10-hour shifts just to be able to afford a place uh, and keep their family happy. I mean, we are putting an incredible uh, amount of, of weight on the backs of these agents who have a very difficult task. What my amendment does is quite simple, Mr. Chairman. I would, and again, it has the support of the full chairman. It's a bipartisan amendment. Uh, is that we improve the locality pay, at least temporarily. They're gonna, in the future, we think we are going to have a revamping of how we pay FBI agents and custom agents and all of those folks. Uh, but we need some help, some immediate help now. These folks are contemplating getting out. So we want the best and the brightest. We're going to have to pay a little bit. This is where they're not getting rich. We're just saying if you're going to send them to Washington, D.C., you got to pay for it. You know how expensive it is to try to even find an apartment around here, let alone try to find a house anywhere around here you can afford on these wages. New York City is no different. These are high threat areas. Uh, these agents are there because the crime rate uh, and the terrorist threat there uh, is significant. So we want the best and the brightest there. We've just got to be able to step up and give them a little bit of relief. And this bill provides, quite frankly, not enough, but a little bit of immediate relief for these agents. Why in, the, uh, in this particular place? Why would we bring it up now? Um, the uh, first of all, the 911 Commission report uh, did a couple of things. It, a, it identified the centrality of the FBI and other law enforcement agencies to the war on terrorism. Uh, and the need to provide adequate resources to FBI agents. That's in the 9-11 report. And I want to quote uh, for the record here, if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is from the 9-11 report. A specialized and integrated national security workforce should be established at the FBI, consisting of agents, analysts, linguists, and surveillance specialists who are recruited, trained, rewarded, and retained to ensure the development of an institutional culture <laughs> imbued with a deep expertise in intelligence and national security. This is the place to deal with this. We do have a crisis. We haven't talked about it. These agents are under tremendous financial burden. Uh, and we need to do everything we can to make sure that an agent gets up in the morning and doesn't think about, can I make it another day, or is my spouse going to let me do this job another week, or can I make my house payment, uh, but how do I catch everybody who's trying to harm the United States of America? If we can get agents thinking like that, we were going to win this thing beyond a shadow of a doubt. We're winning it now. We're doing it with folks with one arm tied behind their back. I would urge uh, the body's uh, uh, acceptance of this, again, it has the chairman, it's bipartisan, uh, and I think it's a small gesture to the very folks who are risking their lives every day in this fight on war on terror. Good. Mr. Rogers, thank you very much. Your background, obviously, as a former FBI agent, uh, carries, a, carries a considerable amount of weight. I appreciate your, uh, your uh, testimony. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good. Next, I'll call up a panel, a uh, bipartisan panel, uh, Mark Foley of uh, Florida and Mr. Ackerman from New York. Gentlemen, you're, uh, without objection, your prepared statements will appear in the record and uh, invite you to summarize. Thank you very Mr. much, Foley. Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Um, Mr. Ackerman and I are here together to support and ask for your uh, admission of this amendment into our bill, the Alien Atrocity Deportation Act, 
to H.R. 10. This week, Congress begins a monumental task of realigning and strengthening our homeland security. But we need to include this provision, which will allow us to really work on people that are here that should not be here. Uh, let me call to your attention, Mr. Chairman, an article that exists. And these stacks of material are articles about tortures and criminals that are in this country. The INS says it can't deport them. The Justice Department won't prosecute them. Tortures, death squad leaders, and human rights criminals who seek refuge in the United States have nothing to fear except their victims. This bill has broad bipartisan support, including Mr. Ackerman, my lead co-sponsor, Mr. Garrett of New Jersey, Mr. McNulty, Mr. Frost of this committee, Ms. Ross Layton, and Mr. McGovern of this committee, Mr. Berman, Mr. Bartlett, and other members of Congress. Members of the committee, please let me make myself perfectly clear. Tortures are terrorist. We talk about the Taliban. We talk about Al Qaeda. Those are recognizable names that are on everybody's radar screen today as a result of September 11th. These tortures may not have the same profile, but they have the same demonic backgrounds. They've committed crimes. Through some mechanisms, they've been allowed into this country. This bill basically sets up a mechanism, first, to prevent them from coming into this country. Secondly, once we know of their identity, and again, the files are replete with people that we know of that are here, it gives us a mechanism in which to deport. I yield to my colleague. Mr. Ackman, if you'd turn on the, uh, so we can get you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank you and the committee as well for giving me the opportunity to testify uh, before you about the Foley-Ackerman Amendment joined by so many others uh, in the Congress in a completely nonpartisan act to strengthen this legislation and do what we believe is best in the interest of, of our country. Uh, at this very moment, with our nation in a conflict in Iraq, which had a previous regime that committed every kind of grotesque criminal behavior that our nation deplores, the U.S. Code provides no assurance, no assurance at this time that Saddam's henchmen, Iraqi war criminals, perpetrators of torture or atrocities, couldn't somehow come to the United States to enjoy the very benefits that they have uh, so cruelly deprived of others. It is hard to believe, but it is true. Some of Saddam's most brutal thugs, if they were able to hide their pasts, and slip past the INS, they could conceivably apply for and receive either permanent residency or citizenship. Now, how do we know this? We know this because war criminals from other conflicts have been surreptitiously coming into the United States since World War II. Uh, the foley ackerman Amendment will close this very frightening loophole. In addition pr to providing the Justice Department with the authority to hunt down these thugs and criminals through the courts and to remove them from our country, the amendment would turn this critical task over to the Justice Department's Office of Special Investigations, or OSI. Since 1979, this elite OSI team of prosecutors and investigators has been methodically removing Nazi war criminals who have snuck into the United States based on its terrific past performance, its current readiness, and most critically, its desire to perform the mission, OSI is the appropriate agency to ensure that our shores remain free from the wor world's most vile criminals and violators of human rights. The very notion that anyone who has perpetrated genocide or committed atrocities or acts of torture would be able to slip into the United States in the first place is a very shocking occurrence. The unhappy fact is there is no current law on the books to find these criminals, to hunt them down, to bring them to court, to bring them to justice. Makes this prospect of them even getting into the United States even worse to contemplate. War criminals have, should have no self-haven and no refuge anywhere in the world least along the United States, and I thank the committee for its consideration. Uh, I thank you, gentlemen, for your, uh, for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Putman. Mr. Frost. 
Gentlemen, thank you very much, and thank you for your uh, for your visuals, uh, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll call uh, Mr. Porter of Nevada from the uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Mr. Porter. Without objection, your uh, full statement will appear in the record, and you're welcome to uh, summarize. Mr. Thank Porter. You, Pre press, press the button, would you, would you please? Thank, Thank you, you, Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity. I had an opportunity to read uh, the 9-11 report from cover to cover, and I think there's a, a gaping hole, and that has to do with uh, security, efficiency, and safety of, of visitors to those states, such as Nevada, that have uh, tourism as its number one economy. And as a matter of fact, every state in the union has tourism in their top one, two, or three as far as their economic benefits. Also, uh, an area that's missing is the liaison with the private sector. So what I'm proposing today is that uh, we create an undersecretary for the private sector and tourism, basically taking an existing position, an existing uh, special assistant to the secretary, and create an undersecretary that would have expertise in taking care of those challenges specific to the private sector so they too can provide input into the uh, safety of their customers but also in the tourism industry. An example of Nevada has a population of about 2.2 million people. But we have visitors to almost 40 million people a year visit our community. And many times when you look at the boilerplate for Homeland Security, things are, are not taken into account such as visitors volume, whether it be Disneyland, Orlando or other communities, New Orleans, or even for the Super Bowl. So our purpose uh, is, is to create an expert uh, that can help make it more efficient to make our customers, our visitors, uh, uh, far more safe than they are today by having that expertise. Uh, it also creates an uh, individual that will communicate with the Office of State and Local Government, uh, with the Undersecretary, and also provides for analytic staff to help pro provide for the proper information. Has been supported by the U.S. Chamber, the National Tourism Association, National uh, Business Travel Association, Western States Tourism Council, and of course the state of Nevada. And that's a brief summary of our intent to make our customers and visitors more safe and be more efficient in the process. Mr. Porter, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Mr. Putnam. Any Mr. Frost. No question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next, uh, we have uh, Mr. Bonilla. Texas. Once again, your, without objection, your full statement will appear in the record, and you're welcome to summarize. Thank you, Chairman. I've got an amendment to this bill that uh, addresses a need that uh, the Chairman of the Committee also acknowledges was uh, overlooked in putting this bill together. It calls for adding a lot of uh, Border Patrol agents, a lot of law enforcement along the border, uh, patrol officers, immigration enforcement agents. But what, what was overlooked was detention space. Uh, my bill calls for authorizing 25 additional, 2,500 additional uh, detention spaces under the Office of Detention and Removal for over the next two years. And this is the case historically, oftentimes when uh, law enforcement agents are increased along the border for uh, whatever, the, uh, what even before 9-11 in, in years past, sometimes we forget that uh, there's a, a, there are other components to uh, dealing with the uh, increased apprehensions that go along the border, judicial uh, funds and also uh, detention funds. So this, this addresses this, uh, th this shortfall, and, and again, we will uh, submit the uh, uh, full statement for the committee. Uh, there is a increased concern among our intelligence community of, uh, of people that are p potentially uh, threatening our country along the Mexican border. And uh, the Border Patrol traditionally calls the, uh, the, the, they're known as OTMs, other than Mexicans, because in years past, most of the illegals that were apprehended along the border were Mexicans, but there's an increased number now of OTMs coming across the border. And in many cases, Mr. Chairman, uh, in Texas alone, since the first of the year, almost 15,000 OTMs have been released into the streets of our communities. Uh, we have we documented this with uh, photographs over the summer. Uh, Homeland Security has told us that one of the problem was detention space. We're trying to address that here. Uh, there's a cultural understanding now among OTMs coming across the southern border that because of the lack of detention space, that many of them know that they can come in. They're processed differently than Mexican nationals. They're debriefed by, uh, in some cases, 
uh, intelligence officers along the border, and if they are not deemed to, to obviously be a threat to the country, they're released with papers uh, and told to appear before a court within 30 days. And uh, it's been documented that 85% of these OTMs do not show up for court. So this could be happening in, in it, it's also happening in other parts of the country. It could be happening in your neighborhood or in the neighborhood of anyone present in this room here today where the OTMs are released to show up in court, but, but they, they're free to roam the country. We don't know what they're up to. My amendment would address this shortfall of detention uh, space and, uh, and, and ensure that we keep these people locked up until they're deported to their appropriate countries. So it's a very simple amendment, and again, uh, I think it's a common sense amendment, and I would urge the committee to uh, uh, allow this. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, I, I don't know if you mentioned this, but your district in Texas has the largest, longest border uh, uh, to the south with Mexico, is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay. About uh, roughly 700 miles along the Rio Grande as it meanders from the town of Laredo up the river to the edge of El Paso. Okay, so you have you obviously have knowledge of that. Thank you very much. Mr. Putnam. Good. Mr. Frost, I don't see him. Mr. Bonilla, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kirk, Illinois. Your Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Without uh, objection, your full statement will appear in the record, and you're welcome to summarize. Uh, I'll do it very quickly. Uh, this uh, amendment came out of my work. I, I'm the member of Congress that spent the longest time in Afghanistan and Pakistan, in the place where we think Osama bin Laden lives, which is North Waziristan, in the uh, province right across the Afghan border in Kandahar. And when you get the briefing on how he is sustaining his operation, you quickly find one key fact, which is Osama bin Laden has become one of the world's largest heroin dealers. Uh, the financial network uh, that the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration has uh, laid out is the most accurate of how bin Laden can currently finances his operation. Ten years ago, the uh, Drug Enforcement Agency was removed from the U.S. intelligence community. That is a, uh, it is a status which the head of the DEA and the Attorney General both uh, disagree with. Uh, they would like DEA to be brought back into the intelligence community because we have seen uh, in Colombia, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, that drug profits directly support terrorism. Uh, just in one week in Afghanistan, I found that uh, Haji Bashir Norzai and his network provides bin Laden with a uh, heroin supply network yielding $28 million in profits per year. The 9-11 Commission report reported that the attack against the World Trade Center cost $500,000. Uh, this is an amendment which is uh, supported by uh, Chairman Hyde, uh, by the administration, and I've discussed it with the speaker, who, as you know, has a unique influence on this, and he supports this. Uh, uh, this amendment does not say DEA should be brought into the intelligence community. I wanted to take a soft position. It simply says that we should have a report on it. It leaves the way open for a conference committee to deal with this in a little bit of time, and I know that the administration working with bipartisan support is something we should do because DEA probably understands more about bin Laden's finances than anyone else. Good. Mr. Kirk, thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Putnam. Mr. Frost. No question. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much. Uh, next, a gentleman from Florida, Mr. Weldon. Without objection, your full statement will appear in the record, and uh, you're welcome to summarize. Mr. Weldon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will summarize. Uh, the amendment that I am proposing to H.R. 10 is fairly simple and straightforward. H.R. 10 is going to require 30 new requirements, programs, procedures, and authorities to be implemented by the Department of Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, Transportation, State Department, Social Security Administration. In other words, we may pass this bill, the President may sign it into law, and it's going to take a long time for all of these uh, things to be put into effect, simply stated. Uh, my concern is uh, we need to do something now, and uh, so I am proposing a moratorium on issuing visas from uh, countries designated as state supporters of terrorism and countries with long history of producing terrorists that have come into the United States. Uh, these countries uh, include countries like Saudi Arabia, Somalia, United Arab Emirates. Uh, in the amendment, I provide uh, language for the administration uh, to override this requirement and allow visas, for example, for uh, diplomats. Uh, but it's a 12-month moratorium, and it would give our agencies 
a window of opportunity to implement the reforms, better uh, enable our, our borders to be protected uh, in that time period before we can actually put this all into effect. And uh, that's the essence of my amendment. I appreciate your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Wellen, thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Putnam? Mr. Frost? No questions. Thank Mr. Wellen, you. thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Uh, Ta uh, Tancredo from Colorado appears to be uh, our last witness. So uh, if you have a full statement without objection, it will appear in the record. Thank Mr. you, Tancredo. Mr. Chairman. Um, I have an amendment that I believe is appropriate for our discussion and for inclusion into this particular bill because it is a provision that we have actually dealt with several times. As a matter of fact, every year that I've been in the Congress, we have uh, supported this particular amendment, which allows for the administration to use the uh, military to augment the, the services of the uh, other, other uh, organizations that we have for the purpose of border defense. In the bill itself, in H.R. 10, we talk about the, uh, it, it, it recognizes the fact that we need dramatically more people on the borders um, and, and, and allows for an increase in the Border Patrol from 2,000 uh, uh, 2, a year for uh, four years subsequent to the uh, passage, or I think from 2006 to 2010. Um, I certainly support that concept, but we have to do something before that. We have to allow for um, whatever kind of um, assets that we have available to us to be put in place to actually defend our borders. And uh, in this case, we say that uh, the, de the Secretary of Defense would be uh, authorized to allow for uh, augmentation. Really, that's all we're talking about, augmenting the uh, other services that are there, Border Patrol, uh, Customs, um, and, uh, the, uh, and uh, Forest Service, all of the organizations that have responsibilities for border security. This allows for uh, the use of the military to augment those services. It's a simple amendment that, frankly, as I say, we've passed many times, but I think certainly uh, deserves to be put into this particular provision. Okay, Mr. Tanker, well, thank you very much. Mr. Putnam. Mr. Frost. I do have a question about that. Um, how many military are you talking about? Well, we aren't. We do not specify in the bill, of course, I mean, in the amendment, the number. We just allow it. The uh, we authorize the Secretary of Defense to use what is what he deems to be necessary for that purpose to augment the services available to achieve the goal of securing the border. Are we talking about active duty? Or are we talking about reserve? Are we talking about guardsmen? Or do actually, we know? once again, the amendment does not specify any such. It, it is. Uh, I don't think it's really my position or our position in the Congress to make that kind of delineation. We'll leave it up to the Secretary of Defense and the administration to do that. The fact is that, you know, I have personally witnessed where we have been able to use military on the border. Not too long ago, I actually went to the border, to the northern border, where I observed um, a, an exercise. 100 Marines, 100 Marines, about 20 miles north of Bonners Ferry, Idaho, um, were on an ex a two-week exercise to determine to what extent they could actually hope to control about 100 miles of border. Now, 100 Marines, three drones, and two radar stations, and I guarantee you, for the two weeks that that was in place, nothing came through that we did not see. Now, they did not interdict, they did not, the military itself did not do anything but alert the Border Patrol to people who were coming across illegally. And this is the kind of thing that we anticipate, although we do not, of course, tell anybody how to use it. Uh, Mr. Tancredo, as, you, as I think you know, my, uh, my wife is on active duty in the United States Army. And um, our military is a little busy right now. Yes. Uh, we are occupied and uh, we're busy in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Who knows where we may be called upon to go next. We're, our military is stretched very thin. And I'm concerned about uh, using the military on the border when the demands on our military are so great. Uh, clearly, we should beef up border security and we ought to hire more people, but it may be that these people should be civilians and keep our military free to uh, engage in the very important things that they're doing uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. I appreciate that point of view. I, I can't imagine any more important task for our military than help defend our own borders. We are preparing them to defend borders all over the world. It is possible, frankly, uh, Congressman, that we would be able to use, t to do this while we train. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing that says that we can't train our troops that we're doing now all over the country, but train them on the border. 
use them on the border for that purpose. When I got done with that exercise I was telling you about, the commander of the, of the Marine Detachment told me that it was the best exercise they had ever, ever been in because, number one, it was real time. Number two, it was against people coming into our own country. And frankly, they said it was in the roughest terrain in the world. So it was perfect training. It was a good thing for them to do. Uh, he, this was the commander of the, mili of, of the Marine Detachment. The, so uh, I can't imagine that this wouldn't be an appropriate thing. And again, it's up to the discretion of the you, Secretary You mentioned uh, that this was a two-week exercise. It was. Were these reservists or were these no, active duty? No, uh, these were active duty. Uh, I just know how stressed and how stretched our military is. And uh, I think we need to uh, carefully consider this. And uh, we clearly need to provide the uh, financial resources so that our uh, uh, the people responsible for our border can hire more people. But it may well be that these additional hires are civilians. I understand your concern, and I appreciate the fact that you say you'll give it careful consideration. Mr. Tancredo, thank you very much for your uh, testimony. Uh, this will end the hearing portion of our meeting on, uh, on H.R. 10, and without objection, the record will be open for members to submit uh, written statements uh, if they choose to do so. The hearing portion is over. Chairman, what about the uh, supplemental? When are we going to take? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, we will recess uh, subject to the call of the chair, and it is uh, anticipated that uh, we'll come back right after the last vote to uh, to take up that, uh, that issue. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Committee stands in recess, subject to call the chair. Today on our companion network, C-SPAN 3, a hearing on accounting and management issues at Fannie Mae. Chairman and CEO Franklin Raines is among the witnesses. Live coverage at 10 a.m. Eastern. And later, a Senate...